Part One, Chapter One of In Desert and Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. In Desert and Wilderness by Henrik Sienkiewicz. Translated by Max Anthony Dresmel. Part One, Chapter One. Do you know, Nell? said Stas Tarkovsky to his friend, a little English girl, that yesterday the police came and arrested the wife of Smain, the overseer, and her three children, that Fatma, who several times called at the office to see your father and mine. And little Nell, resembling a beautiful picture, raised her greenish eyes to Stas, and asked with mingled surprise and fright, Did they take her to prison? No, but they will not let her go to the Sudan, and an official has arrived who will see that she does not move a step out of Port Said. Why? Stas, who was fourteen years old, and who loved his eight-year-old companion very much, but looked upon her as a mere child, said, with a rather conceited air, When you reach my age, you will know everything which happens, not only along the canal from Port Said to Suez, but in all Egypt. Have you ever heard of the Mahdi? I heard that he is ugly and naughty. The boy smiled compassionately. I do not know whether he is ugly. The Sudanese claim that he is handsome. But the word naughty about a man who has murdered so many people could only be used by a little girl eight years old in dresses, oh, reaching the knees. Papa told me so, and Papa knows best. He told you so because otherwise you would not understand. He would not express himself to me in that way. The Mahdi is worse than a whole shoal of crocodiles. Do you understand? That is a nice expression for me. Naughty. They talk that way to babes. But observing the little girl's clouded face, he became silent and afterwards said, Nell, you know I did not want to cause you any unpleasantness. The time will come when you will be fourteen. I certainly promise you that. Aha, uh -huh, she replied with a worried look. But if before that time the Mahdi should dash into Port Said and eat me? The Mahdi is not a cannibal, so he does not eat people. He only kills them. He will not dash into Port Said, but even if he did and wanted to murder you, he would first have to do with me. This declaration with the sniff with which Stas inhaled the air through his nose did not bode any good for the Mahdi, and considerably quieted Nell as to her own person. I know, she answered, you would not let him harm me. But why do they not allow Fatma to leave Port Said? Because Fatma is a cousin of the Mahdi. Her husband, Smain, made an offer to the Egyptian government at Cairo to go to the Sudan, where the Mahdi is staying, and secure the liberty of all Europeans who have fallen into his hands. Then Smain is a good man. Wait. Your papa and my papa, who knew Smain thoroughly, did not have any confidence in him, and warned Nubar Pasha not to trust him. But the government agreed to send Smain, and Smain remained over half a year with the Mahdi. The prisoners not only did not return, but news has come from Khartoum that the Mahdists are treating them more and more cruelly, and that Smain, having taken money from the government, has become a traitor. He joined the Mahdi's army, and has been appointed an emir. The people say that in that terrible battle in which General Hicks fell, Smain commanded the Mahdi's artillery, and that he probably taught the Mahdists how to handle the cannon, which before that time they as a savage people could not do. But now Smain is anxious to get his wife and children out of Egypt. So when Fatma, who evidently knew in advance what Smain was going to do, wanted secretly to leave Port Said, the government arrested her with the children. But what good are Fatma and her children to the government? The government will say to Mahdi, Give us the prisoners and we will surrender Fatma. For the time the conversation was interrupted, because the attention of Stas was attracted by birds flying from the direction of Ektum on Farag toward Lake Menzale. They flew quite low, and in the clear atmosphere could be plainly seen some pelicans with curved napes, slowly moving immense wings. Stas at once began to imitate their flight. So with head upraised he ran a score of paces along the dike, waving his outstretched arms. Look! suddenly exclaimed Nell. Flamingos are also flying. Stars stood still in a moment, as actually behind the pelicans, but somewhat higher, could be seen suspended in the sky two great red and purple flowers, as it were. Flamingos! Flamingos! Before night they returned to their haunts on the little islands, the boy said. Oh, if only I had a rifle! 
Why would you want to shoot at them? Girls don't understand such things, but let us go further. We may see more of them. Saying this, he took the girl's hand, and together they strolled towards the first wharf beyond Port Said. Dinah, a negress and at one time nurse of little Nell, closely followed them. They walked on the embankment, which separated the waters of Lake Menzaleh from the canal, through which at that time a big English steamer in charge of a pilot floated. The night was approaching. The sun still stood quite high, but was rolling in the direction of the lake. The salty waters of the latter began to glitter with gold and throb with the reflection of peacock feathers. On the Arabian bank, as far as the eye could reach, stretched a tawny, sandy desert, dull, portentous, lifeless. Between the glassy, as if half-dead, heaven and the immense wrinkled sands, there was not a trace of a living being. While on the canal life seethed, boats bustled about, the whistles of steamers resounded, and above Menzaleh flocks of mews and wild ducks scintillated in the sunlight, yonder on the Arabian bank, it appeared as if it were the region of death. Only in proportion as the sun descending became ruddier and ruddier, did the sands begin to assume that lily hue which the heath in Polish forests has in autumn. The children, walking towards the wharf, saw a few more flamingos which pleased their eyes. After this, Dinah announced that Nell must return home. In Egypt, after days which even in winter are often scorching, very cold nights follow and as Nell's health demanded great care, her father, Mr. Rawlinson, would not allow her to be near the water after sunset. They therefore returned to the city, on the outskirts of which, near the canal, stood Mr. Rawlinson's villa, and by the time the sun plunged into the sea they were in the house. Soon the engineer Tarkovsky, Stas's father, who was invited to dinner, arrived, and the whole company, together with a French lady, Nell's teacher, Madame Olivier, sat at the table. Mr. Rawlinson, one of the directors of the Suez Canal Company, and Ladislaw Tarkovsky, senior engineer of the same company, lived for many years upon terms of the closest intimacy. Both were widowers, but Pani Tarkovsky, by birth a French lady, died at the time Stas came into the world, while Nell's mother died of consumption in Helvan when the girl was three years old. Both widowers lived in neighbouring houses in Port Said, and owing to their duties met daily. A common misfortune drew them still closer to each other, and strengthened the ties of friendship previously formed. Mr. Rawlinson loved Stas as his own son, while Pan Tarkovsky would have jumped into fire and water for little Nell. After finishing their daily work, the most agreeable recreation for them was to talk about the children, their education and future. During such conversations it frequently happened that Mr. Rawlinson would praise the energy, ability and bravery of Stas and pan tarkovsky would grow enthusiastic over the sweetness and angelic countenance of nell and the one and the other spoke the truth stas was a trifle conceited and a trifle boastful but diligent in his lessons and the teachers in the english school in port said which he attended credited him with uncommon abilities as to courage and resourcefulness he inherited them from his father for Pan Tarkovsky possessed these qualities in an eminent degree, and in a large measure owed to them his present position. In the year 1863 he fought for eleven months without cessation. Afterwards, wounded, taken into captivity and condemned to Siberia, he escaped from the interior of Russia and made his way to foreign lands. Before he entered into the insurrection he was a qualified engineer. Nevertheless, he devoted a year to the study of hydraulics. Later he secured a position at the canal, and in the course of a few years, when his expert knowledge, energy, and industry became known, he assumed the important position of senior engineer. Stas was born, bred, and reached his fourteenth year in Port Said on the canal, in consequence of which the engineers called him the child of the desert. At a later period when he was attending school, he sometimes, during the vacation season and holidays, accompanied his father or Mr. Rawlinson on trips which their duty required them to make from Port Said to Suez to inspect the work on the embankment or the dredging of the channel of the canal. He knew everybody, the engineers and custom-house officials, as well as the labourers, Arabs and Negroes. He bustled about and insinuated himself everywhere, appearing where least expected. He made long excursions on the embankment, rowed in a boat over Menzaleh, venturing at times far and wide. He crossed over to the Arabian bank, and mounting the first horse he met, or in the absence of a horse, a camel, or even a donkey, he would imitate Faris on the desert. Translator's note. Faris, the hero of Adam Mikivich's oriental poem of the same name. 
In a word, as Pan Tarkovsky expressed it, he was always popping up somewhere, and every moment free from his studies he passed on the water. His father did not oppose this, as he knew that rowing, horseback riding, and continual life in the fresh air strengthened his health and developed resourcefulness within him. In fact, Stas was taller and stronger than most boys of his age. It was enough to glance at his eyes to surmise that in case of any adventure he would sin more from too much audacity than from timidity. In his fourteenth year he was one of the best swimmers in Port Said, which meant not a little, for the Arabs and Negroes swim like fishes. Shooting from carbines of a small calibre, and only with cartridges, for wild ducks and Egyptian geese, he acquired an unerring eye and steady hand. His dream was to hunt the big animals sometime in Central Africa. He therefore eagerly listened to the narratives of the Sudanese working on the canal, who in their native land had encountered big, thick-skinned and rapacious beasts. This also had its advantage, for at the same time he learned their languages. It was not enough to excavate the Suez Canal. It was necessary also to maintain it, as otherwise the sands of the deserts lying on both banks would fill it up in the course of a year. The grand work of de Lesseps demands continual labour and vigilance. So too at the present day powerful machines under the supervision of skilled engineers and thousands of labourers are at work dredging the channel. At the excavation of the canal, 25,000 men laboured. Today, owing to the completion of the work and improved new machinery, considerably less are required. Nevertheless, the number is great. Among them, the natives of the locality predominate. There is not, however, a lack of Nubians, Sudanese, Somalis, and various Negroes coming from the White and Blue Niles, that is, from the region which previous to the Mahdi's insurrection was occupied by the Egyptian government. Stas lived with all on intimate terms, and having, as is usual with Poles, an extraordinary aptitude for languages, he became, he himself not knowing how or when, acquainted with many of their dialects. Born in Egypt, he spoke Arabian like an Arab. From the natives of Zanzibar, many of whom worked as firemen on the steam dredges, he learned Kiswahili, a language widely prevalent all over Central Africa. He could even converse with the Negroes of the Dinka and Shiluk tribes, residing on the Nile below Fashoda. Besides this, he spoke fluently in English, French, and also Polish, for his father, an ardent patriot, was greatly concerned that his son should know the language of his forefathers. Stas, in reality, regarded this language as the most beautiful in the world, and taught it, not without some success, to little Nell. One thing only he could not accomplish, that she should pronounce his name Stas, and not Stes. Sometimes, on account of this, a misunderstanding arose between them, which continued until small tears began to glisten in the eyes of the girl, and then Stes would beg her pardon and become angry at himself. He had, however, an annoying habit of speaking slightingly of her eight years, and citing by way of contrast his own grave age and experience. He contended that a boy who is finishing his fourteenth year, if he is not fully matured, at least is not a mere child, but on the contrary, is capable of performing all kinds of heroic deeds, especially if he has Polish and French blood. He craved most ardently that some time an opportunity would occur for such deeds, particularly in defence of Nell. Both invented various dangers, and Stas was compelled to answer her questions as to what he would do if, for instance, a crocodile ten yards long, or a scorpion as big as a dog, should crawl through the window of her home. To both it never occurred for a moment that impending reality would surpass all their fantastic suppositions. End of Part 1, Chapter 1 Chapter 2 of In Desert and Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Eisenhower. In Desert and Wilderness by Henrik Schenkevich. Translated by Max Anthony Dresmel. Chapter 2 In the meantime, in the house, Good news awaited them during the dinner. Messrs. Rawlinson and Tarkovsky, as skilled engineers, had been invited a few weeks before to examine and appraise the work carried on in connection with the whole network of canals in the province of El Fayum, in the vicinity of the city of Medinet near Lake Karun, as well as along the Yusuf and Nile rivers. They were to stay there for about a month and secured furloughs from their company. 
as the Christmas holidays were approaching, both gentlemen, not desiring to be separated from the children, decided that Stas and Nell should also go to Medina. Hearing this news, the children almost leaped out of their skins from joy. They had already visited the cities lying along the canal, particularly Ismailia and Suez, and while outside the canal, Alexandria and Cairo, near which they viewed the Great Pyramids and the Sphinx. But these were short trips, while the expedition to Medinet el Fayyun required a whole day's travel by railway, southward along the Nile, and then westward from the El Wasta towards the Libyan desert. Stas knew Medinet from the narratives of younger engineers and tourists who went there to hunt for various kinds of waterfowls, as well as desert wolves and hyenas. He knew that it was a separate, great oasis lying off the west bank of the Nile, but not dependent upon its inundations and having its own water supply formed by Lake Karun through Bar Yusuf and a whole chain of small canals. Those who had seen this oasis said that although that region belonged to Egypt, nevertheless, being separated from it by a desert, it formed a distinct whole. Only the Yusuf River connects, one might say, with a thin blue thread, that locality with the valley of the Nile. The great abundance of water, fertility of soil, and luxuriant vegetation made an earthly paradise of it, while the extensive ruins of the city of Crocodilopolis drew thither hundreds of curious tourists. Stas, however, was attracted mainly by the shores of Lake Karun, with its swarms of birds and its wolf hunts on the desert hills of Gebel el Sidibent. But his vacation began a few days later, and as the inspection of the work on the canals was an urgent matter, and the gentlemen could not lose any time, it was arranged that they should leave without delay, while the children, with Madame Olivier, were to depart a week later. Nell and Stas had a desire to leave at once, but Stas did not dare to make the request. Instead, they began to ask questions about various matters relative to the journey, and with new outbursts of joy received the news that they would not live in uncomfortable hotels kept by Greeks, but in tents furnished by the Cook Tourists Agency. This is the customary arrangement of tourists who leave Cairo for a lengthy stay at Medina. Cook furnishes tents, servants, cooks, supplies of provisions, horses, donkeys, camels, and guides. So the tourist does not have to bother about anything. This, indeed, is quite an expensive mode of traveling, but Messrs. Tarkovsky and Rawlinson did not have to take that into account, as all expenses were borne by the Egyptian government which invited them, as experts, to inspect and appraise the work on the canals. Nell, who above everything in the world loved riding on a camel, obtained a promise from her father that she should have a separate humpbacked saddle horse, on which, together with Madame Olivier, or Dinah, and sometimes with Stas, she could participate in the excursions to the nearer localities of the desert into Karun. Pan Tarkovsky promised Stas that he would allow him some nights to go after wolves, and if he brought a good report from school, he would get a genuine English short rifle and the necessary equipment for a hunter. As Stas was confident that he would succeed, he at once began to regard himself as the owner of a short rifle, and promised himself to perform various astonishing and immortal feats with it. On such projects and conversation the dinner passed for the overjoyed children, but somewhat less eagerness for the contemplated journey was displayed by the Madame Olivier, who was loath to leave the comfortable villa in Port Said, and who was frightened at the thought of living for several weeks in a tent, and particularly at the plan of excursions on camelback. It happened that she had already tried this mode of riding several times, and these attempts ended unfortunately. Once the camel rose too soon, before she was well seated in the saddle, and as a result she rolled off his back onto the ground. Another time the dromedary, not belonging to the light-footed variety, jolted her so that two days elapsed before she recovered. In a word, although Nell, after two or three pleasure rides which Mr. Rawlinson permitted her to take, declared that there was nothing more delightful in the world, in the same measure only painful recollections remained for Madame Olivier. She said that this was good enough for Arabs or for a chit like Nell, who could not be jolted any more than a fly which should alight upon a camel's hump, but not for persons dignified and not too light and having at the same time a certain proneness to unbearable seasickness. But as to the Medinet el Fayyum, she had other fears. Now in Port Said, as well as in Alexandria, Cairo, and in the whole of Egypt, 
nothing was the subject of more discussion than the Mahdi's insurrection and the cruelties of the dervishes madame olivier not knowing exactly where medinet was situated became alarmed as to whether it was not too near the Mahdists, and finally began to question mr rawlinson about it but he only smiled and said the Mahdi at this moment is besieging khartoum in which general gordon is defending himself does madame know how far it is from medinet to khartoum i have no idea about as far as from here to sicily explained pan tarkovsky just about corroborated stas khartoum lies where the white and blue niles meet and form one river we are separated from it by the immense expanse of egypt and the whole of nubia afterwards he wanted to add that even if medinet should be closer to the regions overrun by the insurgents he of course would be there with his short rifle but recalling that for similar bragging he sometimes received a sharper proof from his father he became silent the older members of the party however began to talk of the mahdi and the insurrection for this was the most important matter affecting egypt the news from khartoum was bad the wild hordes already had been besieging the city for a month and a half and the Egyptian and English governments were acting slowly. The relief expedition had barely started, and it was generally feared that notwithstanding the fame, bravery, and ability of Gordon, this important city would fall into the hands of the barbarians. This was the opinion of Pan Tarkovsky, who suspected that England in her soul desired that the Mahdi should wrest it from Egypt in order to retake it later from him and make this vast region an English possession he did not however share this suspicion with mr rawlinson as he did not want to offend his patriotic feelings towards the close of the dinner stas began to ask why the egyptian government had annexed all the country lying south of nubia particularly kordofan darfur and the sudan as far as the lake albert nyanza and deprived the natives there of their liberty mr rawlinson explained that whatever was done by the egyptian government was done at the request of england which extended a protectorate over egypt and in reality ruled her as egypt herself desired the egyptian government did not deprive anybody of his liberty he said but restored it to hundreds of thousands and perhaps to millions of people and kordofan in darfur and in the sudan there were not during the past years any independent states only here and there some petty ruler laid claim to some lands and took possession of them by force in spite of the will of the residents they were mainly inhabited by independent Arab Negro tribes, that is, by people having the blood of both races. These tribes lived in a state of incessant warfare. They attacked each other and seized horses, camels, cattle, and above all, slaves. Besides, they perpetrated numerous atrocities, but the worst were the ivory and slave hunters. They formed a separate class, to which belonged nearly all the chiefs of the tribes and the richer traders they made armed expeditions into the interior of africa appropriating everywhere ivory tusks and carried away thousands of people men women and children in addition they destroyed villages and settlements devastated fields shed streams of blood and slaughtered without pity all who resisted in the southern portion of the sudan darfur and kordofan as well as the region beyond the upper nile as far as the lake they depopulated some localities entirely but the arabian bands made their incursions farther and farther so that central africa became a land of tears and blood now england which as you know pursues slave dealers all over the world consented that the egyptian government should annex kordofan darfur and the sudan this was the only method to compel these pillagers to abandon their abominable trade and the only way to hold them in restraint the unfortunate negroes breathed more freely the depredations ceased and the people began to live under tolerable laws but such a state of affairs did not please the traitors so when mohammed ahmad known today as the mahdi appeared among them and proclaimed a holy war on the pretext that the true faith of mohammed was perishing all rushed like one man to arms and so that terrible war has been kindled in which thus far the egyptians have met with such poor success the mahdi has defeated the forces of the government in every battle he has occupied Kordofan, Darfur, and the Sudan. His hordes at present are laying a siege to Khartoum and are advancing to the north as far as the frontiers of Nubia. Can they advance as far as Egypt? asked Stas. No, answered Mr. Rawlinson. The Mahdi announces, indeed, that he will conquer the whole world, but he is a wild man who has no conception of anything. He never will take Egypt as England would not permit it. 
if however the egyptian troops are completely routed then would appear the english armies which no one has ever overcome and why did england permit the mahdi to occupy so much territory how do you know that she has permitted it replied mr rawlinson england is never in a hurry because she is eternal further conversation was interrupted by a negro servant who announced that fatma smain had arrived and begged for an audience women in the east are occupied exclusively with household affairs and seldom leave the harems only the poorer ones go to the market or work in the fields as the wives of the fellahs the egyptian peasants do but these at such times veil their faces though in the sudan from which region fatma came this custom was not observed and though she had come to mr rawlinson's office previously nevertheless her rival particularly at such a late hour and at a private house evoked surprise we shall learn something new about smain said pan tarkovsky yes answered mr rawlinson giving at the same time a signal to the servant to usher fatma in accordingly after a while there entered a tall young sudanese woman with countenance entirely unveiled complexion very dark and eyes beautiful but wild and a trifle ominous entering she had once prostrated herself and when mr rawlinson ordered her to rise she raised herself but remained on her knees sidi she said may allah bless thee thy posterity thy home and thy flocks what do you want asked the engineer mercy help and succour in misfortune o oh sir i am imprisoned in port said and destruction hangs over me and my children you say that you are imprisoned and yet you could come here and in the night time at that i have been escorted by the police who day and night watch my house and i know that they have an order to cut off our heads soon speak like a rational woman answered mr rawlinson shrugging his shoulders you are not in the sudan but in egypt where no one is executed without a trial so you may be certain that not a hair will fall from your head or the heads of your children but she began to implore him to intercede for her yet once more with the government to procure permission for her to go to smain englishmen as great as you are sir she said can do everything the government in cairo thinks that smain is a traitor but that is false there visited me yesterday arabian merchants who arrived from suakin and before that they bought gums and ivory in the sudan and they informed me that smain is lying sick at el fasher and is calling for me and the children to bless them all this is your fabrication fatma interrupted mr rawlinson but she began to swear by allah that she spoke the truth and afterwards said that if smain got well he undoubtedly would ransom all the christian captives and if he should die she as a relative of the leader of the dervishes could obtain access to him easily and would secure whatever she wished let them only allow her to leave for her heart will leap out of her bosom from longing for her husband and what had she ill-fated woman offended the government or the khedive was it her fault or could she be held accountable because she was the relative of the dervish mohammed ahmad fatma did not dare in the presence of the english people to call her relative the mahdi as that meant the redeemer of the world she knew that the egyptian government regarded him as a rebel and an impostor but continually striking her forehead and invoking heaven to witness her innocence and unhappy plight she began to weep and at the same time wail mournfully as women in the east do after losing husbands or sons afterwards she again flung herself with face on the ground or rather on the carpet with which the inlaid floor was covered and waited in silence nell who towards the close of the dinner felt a little sleepy became thoroughly aroused and having an upright little heart seized her father's hands and kissing it again and again began to beg for fatma let papa help her do please papa fatma evidently understanding english exclaimed amidst her sobs not removing her face from the carpet may allah bless thee bird of paradise with the joys of amaya o star without a blemish however implacable stas in his soul was towards the mahdists he was moved by fatma's entreaties and grief besides nell interceded for her and he in the end always wanted that which nell wished so after a while he spoke out as if to himself but so that all could hear him if i were the government i would allow fatma to go but as you are not the government pan tarkovsky said to him you would do better not to interfere in that which does not concern you mr rawlinson also had a compassionate soul and was sensible of fatma's situation 
but certain statements which she made struck him as being downright falsehoods. Having almost daily relations with the custom house at Ismailia, he knew well that no new cargoes of gums or ivory were being transported lately through the canal. The trade in those wares had ceased almost entirely. Arabian traders, moreover, could not return from the city of al Fasher, which lay in the Sudan, as the Mahdists, as a rule, barred all traders from their territories, and those whom they captured were despoiled and kept in captivity. And it was almost a certainty that the statement about Smain's sickness was a falsehood. But as Nell's little eyes were still looking at her papa appealingly, he, not desiring to sadden the little girl, after a while said to Fatima, Fatima, I already have written at your request to the government, but without result. And now listen. Tomorrow, with this Mahindis, engineer, whom you see here, I leave for Medinet El Fayum. On the way we shall stop one day in Cairo, where the Khedive desires to confer with us about the canals leading from Bar Yusuf and give us a commission as to the same. During the conference I shall take care to present your case and try to secure for you his favor, but I can do nothing more, nor shall I promise more. Fatima rose, and extending both hands in sign of gratitude, exclaimed, And so I am safe. No, Fatima, answered Mr. Rawlinson, do not speak of safety, for I already told you that death threatens neither you nor your children. But that the Khedive will consent to your departure I do not guarantee. For Smain is not sick, but is a traitor, who, having taken money from the government, does not at all think of ransoming the captives from Muhammad Ahmad. Smain is innocent, sir, and he lies in El Fashur, reiterated Fatima. But even if he broke his faith with the government, I swear before you, my benefactor, that if I am allowed to depart, I will entreat Muhammad Ahmad until I secure the deliverance of your captives. Very well. I promise you once more that I will intercede for you with the Khedive. Fatima began to prostrate herself. Thank you, Sidi. You are not only powerful but just, and now I entreat that you permit me to serve you as a slave. In Egypt no one can be a slave, answered Mr. Rawlinson with a smile. I have enough servants and cannot avail myself of your services, for as I told you, we are all leaving for Medina and perhaps will remain there until Ramazan. I know, sir, for the overseer, Chadigi, told me about that. I, when I heard of it, came not only to implore you for help, but also to tell you that two men of my Dongolo tribe, Idris and Geber, are camel drivers in Medina and will prostrate themselves before you when you arrive, submitting to your commands themselves and their camels. Good, good, answered the director, but that is the affair of the cook agency, not mine. Fatma, having kissed the hands of the two engineers and the children, departed blessing Nell particularly. Both gentlemen remained silent for a while, after which Mr. Rawlinson said, Poor woman, but she lies as only in the East they know how to lie, and even in her declaration of gratitude there is a sound of some false note. Undoubtedly, answered Pan Tarkovsky, but to tell the truth, whether Smain betrayed or did not, the government has no right to detain her in Egypt, as she cannot be held responsible for her husband. The government does not allow any Sudanese to leave for Suakin or Nubia without a special permit, so the prohibition does not affect Fatma alone. Many of them are found in Egypt, for they come here for gain. Among them are some who belong to the Dongolese tribe. That is the one from which the Mahdi comes. There are, for instance, besides Fatma, Chadigi, and those two camel drivers in Medina. The Mahdists call the Egyptians Turks and are carrying on a war with them, but among the local Arabs can be found a considerable number of adherents to the Mahdi, who would willingly join him. We must number among them all the fanatics, all the partisans of Arabi Pasha, and among them the poorer classes. They hold it ill of the government that it yielded entirely to English influence, and claim that the religion suffers by it. God knows how many have already escaped across the desert, avoiding the customary sea route to Suakin. So the government, having learned that Fatima also wanted to run away, ordered her to be put under surveillance. For her and her children only, as relatives of the Mahdi himself, can an exchange of the captives be effected. Do the lower classes in Egypt really favor the Mahdi? The Mahdi has followers even in the army, which perhaps for that reason fights so poorly. But how can the Sudanese fly across the desert? Why, that is a thousand miles. Nevertheless, by that route slaves were brought into Egypt. I should judge that Fatima's children could not endure such a journey. That is why she wants to shorten it and ride by the way of the sea to Suakin. 
In any case, she is a poor woman. With this, the conversation concluded. Twelve hours later, the poor woman, having carefully closeted herself in her house with the son of the overseer Chadigi, whispered to him with knitted brows and a grim glance of her beautiful eyes, Kamis, son of Chadigi, here is the money. Go even today to Medinet and give to Idris this writing, which the devout dervish Balali, at my request, wrote to him. The children of the Mahindas are good, but if I do not obtain a permit, then there is no other alternative. I know you will not betray me. Remember that you and your father, too, come from the Dongolese tribe, in which was born the great Mahdi. End of chapter 2part 1 chapter 3 of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by marianne spiegel in desert and wilderness by henry sinkevich translated by max anthony dresmal part 1 chapter 3 both engineers left the following night for cairo where they were to visit the British minister plenipotentiary and hold an audience with the viceroy. Stas calculated that this would require two days, and his calculation appeared accurate, for on the third day at night he received from his father, who was already at Medinet, the following message. The tents are ready. You are to leave the moment your vacation begins. Inform Fatma, through Shadigi, that we could not accomplish anything for her. A similar message was also received by Madame Olivier, who at once, with the assistance of the negress Dinah, began to make preparations for the journey. The sight of these preparations gladdened the hearts of the children, but suddenly an accident occurred which deranged their plans and seemed likely to prevent their journey. On the day on which Stas's winter vacation began, and on the eve of their departure, a scorpion stung Madame Olivier during her afternoon nap in the garden. These venomous creatures in Egypt are not usually very dangerous, but in this case the sting might become exceptionally baleful. The scorpion had crawled into the headrest of the linen chair and stung Madame Olivier in the neck at a moment when she leaned her head against the rest. As she had suffered lately from erysipelas in the face, fear was entertained that sickness might recur. A physician was summoned at once, but he arrived two hours later as he had engagements elsewhere. The neck and even the face were already swollen after which fever appeared, with the usual symptoms of poisoning. The physician announced that under the circumstances there could not be any talk of a journey, and ordered the patient to bed. In view of this it seemed highly probable that the children would be compelled to pass the Christmas holidays at home. In justice to Nell it must be stated that in the first moments, particularly, she thought more of the sufferings of her teacher than of the lost pleasures of Medinet. She only wept in corners at the thought of not seeing her father for a few weeks. Stas did not accept the accident with the same resignation. He first forwarded a dispatch and afterwards mailed a letter with an inquiry as to what they were to do. The reply came in two days. Mr. Rawlinson first communicated with the physician. Having learned from him that immediate danger was removed and that only a fear of the recurrence of the erypsipelas prevented Madame Olivier's departure from Port Said, he, above all, took precaution that she should have proper care and nursing, and afterwards sent the children permission to travel with Dinah. But as Dinah, notwithstanding her extreme attachment for Nell, was not able to take care of herself on the railways and in the hotels, the duties of guide and paymaster during the trip devolved upon Stas. It can easily be understood how proud he was of this role, and with what chivalrous spirit he assured little Nell that not a hair would fall from her head, as if, in reality, the road to Cairo and to Medinet presented any difficulties or dangers. All preparations having been completed, the children started that very day for Ismailia, by way of the canal. From Ismailia they were to travel by rail to Cairo, where they were to pass the night. On the following day they were to ride to Medinet. Leaving Ismailia they saw Lake Timsa, which Stas already knew, as Pan Torkowski, being an ardent sportsman, in moments free from his duties had taken Stas along with him to hunt for aquatic birds. Afterwards the road ran along Wadi Tumilat, close to the freshwater canal leading from the Nile to Ismailia and Suez. This canal had been dug before the Suez Canal, so that the workmen working on de Lesseps' grand achievement would not be deprived entirely of water fit for drinking purposes. 
but its excavation had yet another fortunate result for this region which before was a sterile desert bloomed anew when through it coursed a strong and life-bringing stream of fresh water the children could observe on the left side from the windows of the coach a wide belt of verdure composed of meadows on which were pastured horses camels and sheep and of tilled fields diversified with maize millet alfalfa and other varieties of plants used for fodder on the bank of the canal could be seen all kinds of wells in the shape of large wheels with buckets attached or in the usual form of well sweeps drawing water which fellows laboriously carried to the garden beds or conveyed in barrels on wagons drawn by buffaloes over the sprouting grain pigeons soared and at times a whole covey of quails sprang up on the canal banks storks and cranes gravely stalked in the distance above the mud hovels of the fellas towered like plumes of feathers the crowns of date palms on the other hand on the north side of the railway there stretched a stark desert but unlike the one which lay on the other side of the suez canal that one looked as level as would the bottom of the sea from which the water had disappeared and only wrinkled sand remained while here the sand was more yellowish heaped up as if in great knolls covered on the sides with tufts of grey vegetation between these knolls which here and there changed into high hills lay wide valleys in which from time to time caravans could be seen moving from the windows of the car the children could catch sight of heavily loaded camels walking in a long string one after another over the sandy expanse in front of each camel was an arab in a black mantle with a white turban on his head little nell was reminded of the pictures in the bible which she had seen at home representing the israelites entering egypt during the times of joseph they were exactly the same unfortunately she could not see the caravans very well as at the windows on that side of the car sat two english officers who obstructed her view but she had scarcely told this to stas when he turned to the officers with a very grave mien and touching his hat with his finger said gentlemen could you kindly make room for this little miss who wishes to look at the camels both officers accepted the suggestion with the same gravity and one of them not only surrendered his place to the curious miss but lifted her and placed her in a seat near the window and stas began his lecture this is the ancient land of goshen which pharaoh gave to joseph for his brother israelites at one time in far antiquity a canal of fresh water ran here so that this new one is but a reconstruction of the old but later it fell into ruin and the country became a desert now the soil is again fertile how does the gentleman know this asked one of the officers at my age we know such things answered stas and besides not long ago professor sterling gave us a lecture on wadi tumulat though stas spoke english quite fluently his slightly different accent attracted the attention of the other officer who asked is the little gentleman an englishman miss nell whose father entrusted her to my care on this journey is little i am not an englishman but a pole and the son of an engineer at the canal the officer hearing the answer of the pert boy smiled and said i esteem the poles i belong to a regiment of cavalry which during the times of napoleon several times fought with the polish uhlans and that tradition until the present day forms its glory and honor footnote those regiments of english cavalry which during the times of napoleon met the polish cavalry actually pride themselves with that fact at the present time and every officer speaking of his regiment never fails to say we fought with the poles see chevrolon o in d and footnote i am pleased to form your acquaintance answered stas the conversation easily proceeded farther for the officers were evidently amused it appeared that both were also riding from port said to cairo to see the british minister plenipotentiary and to receive final instructions for a long journey which soon awaited them the younger one was an army surgeon while the one who spoke to stas captain glenn had an order from his government to proceed from cairo via suez to mombasa and assume the government of the entire region adjoining that port and extending as far as the unknown samburu country stas who with deep interest read about travels in africa knew that mombasa was situated a few degrees beyond the equator and that the adjoining country although already conceded to be within the sphere of english interests was yet in truth little known it was utterly wild full of elephants giraffes rhinoceroses buffaloes and all kinds of antelopes 
which the military, missionary, and trading expeditions always encountered. He also envied Captain Glenn with his whole soul, and promised to visit him in Mombasa and go hunting with him for lions and buffaloes. Good, but I shall invite you to make the visit with that little miss, replied Captain Glenn, laughing and pointing at Nell, who at that moment left the window and sat beside him. Miss Rawlinson has a father, answered Stas, and I am only her guardian during this journey. At this the other officer turned quickly around and asked, Rawlinson, is he not one of the directors of the canal, and has he not a brother in Bombay? My uncle lives in Bombay, answered Nell, raising her little finger upwards. Then your uncle, darling, is married to my sister. My name is Clary. We are related, and I am really delighted that I met and became acquainted with you, my little dear. And the surgeon was really delighted. He said that immediately after his arrival at Port Said, he inquired for Mr. Rawlinson, but in the offices of the directory he was informed that he had left for the holidays. He also expressed his regret that the steamer, which he with Captain Glenn was to take for Mombasa, left Suez in a few days, in consequence of which he could not make a hurried visit to Medinet. He therefore requested Nell to convey his compliments to her father, and promised to write to her from Mombasa. Both officers now engaged mainly in a conversation with Nell, so that Stas remained a little on the side. At all stations they had a plentiful supply of mandarin oranges, dates, and exquisite sherbet, and, besides by Stas and Nell, these dainties were shared by Dinah, who with all her good qualities was known for her uncommon gluttony. In this manner the trip to Cairo passed quickly for the children. At the leave-taking the officers kissed Nell's little hands and face, and squeezed Stas's right hand, and at the same time Captain Glenn, whom the resolute boy pleased so much, said half jokingly and half seriously, Listen, my boy, who knows where, when, and under what circumstances we may yet meet in life? Remember, however, that you can always rely upon my good will and assistance. And you may likewise rely upon me, Stas answered with a bow full of dignity. End of section three. Part One, Chapter Four of In Desert and Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. In Desert and Wilderness by Henrik Sitkevich. Translated by Max Anthony Dresmal. Part One, Chapter Four. Pan Tarkowski, as well as Mr. Rawlinson, who loved Nell better than his life, was delighted at the arrival of the children. The young pair greeted their parents joyfully, and at once began to look about the tents, which internally were completely fitted up and were ready for the reception of the beloved guests. The tents appeared superb to them. They were double. One was lined with blue and the other with red flannel, overlaid at the bottom with saddle cloths, and they were spacious as large rooms. The agency which was concerned about the opinion of the high officials of the canal company had spared no effort for their comfort. At first Mr. Rawlinson feared that a lengthy stay under tents might prove injurious to Nell's health, and if he agreed to the arrangement it was because they could always move to a hotel in case of bad weather. Now, however, having fully investigated everything on the place, he came to the conclusion that days and nights passed in the fresh air would be a hundredfold more beneficial for his only child than a stay in the musty rooms of the small local hotels. Beautiful weather favored this. Medinet, or rather El Medina, surrounded by the sandy hills of the Libyan desert, has a much better climate than Cairo, and is not in vain called the Land of Roses. Owing to its sheltered position and the plentiful moisture in the air, nights there are not so cold as in other parts of Egypt, even those lying further south. Winter is simply delightful, and from November the greatest development of the vegetation begins. Date palms, olive trees, which on the whole are scarce in Egypt, fig, orange, mandarin trees, giant castor oil plants, pomegranate, and various other southern plants cover this delightful oasis as with a forest. The gardens are overflowing, as it were, with a gigantic wave of acacias, elders, and roses, so that at night every breeze carries their intoxicating scent. Here one breathes with full breast, and does not wish to die, as the residents of the place say. A similar climate is possessed only by Helwan, laying on the other side of the Nile, and considerably farther north, but Helwan lacks such luxuriant vegetation. 
but helwyn awoke sad recollections for mr rawlinson for there nell's mother had died for this reason he preferred medinant and gazing at present at the glowing countenance of the little girl he promised to himself in his soul soon to purchase here land with a garden to erect upon it a comfortable english house and spend in these blissful parts all vacations which he could secure and after finishing his service upon the canal perhaps even to reside here permanently but these plans were of the distant future and not yet wholly matured in the meantime the children from the moment of their arrival moved about everywhere like flies desiring even before dinner to see all the tents as well as the donkeys and camels hired at the place by the cook agency it appeared that the animals were on a distant pasture and that they could not see them until the morrow however near mr rawlinson's tent they observed with pleasure shamis the son of chadigi their good acquaintance in port said he was not in the employ of cook and mr rawlinson was somewhat surprised to meet him in beninet but as he had previously employed him to carry his implements he engaged him at present to run errands and perform all other small services the evening dinner was excellent as the old copt who for many years was a cook in the employment of the cook agency was anxious to display his culinary skill the children told about the acquaintance they had made with the two officers on the way which was particularly interesting to mr rawlinson whose brother richard was married to dr clary's sister and had resided in india for many years as it was a childless marriage this uncle greatly loved his little niece whom he knew only from photographs and he had inquired about her in all his letters both fathers were also amused at the invitation which stas had received from captain glenn to visit mombasa the boy took it seriously and positively promised himself that some time he must pay a visit to his new friend beyond the equator pan Tarkowski then had to explain to him that english officers never remain long in the same locality on account of the deadly climate of africa and that before stas grew up the captain already would hold his tenth position in rotation or would not be on earth at all after dinner the whole company went out in front of the tents where the servants placed the cloth folding chairs and for the older gentleman brought a siphon of soda water with brandy it was already night but unusually warm as there happened to be a full moon it was as bright as in daytime the white walls of the city buildings opposite the tents shone greenly the stars glowed in the sky and in the air was diffused the scent of roses acacias and heliotropes the city already was asleep in the silence of the night at times could be heard only the loud cries of cranes herons and flamingos flying from beyond the nile in the direction of lake karun suddenly however there resounded the deep bass bark of a dog which astonished stas and nell for it appeared to come from a tent which they had not visited and which was assigned for saddles implements and various travelling paraphernalia that must be an awfully big dog let's go and see him said stas pan Tarkowski began to laugh and mr rawlinson shook off the ashes of his cigar and said also laughing well it did not do any good to lock him up after which he addressed the children remember tomorrow is christmas eve and that dog was intended by pan Tarkowski to be a surprise for nell but as the surprise has started to bark i am compelled to announce it to-day hearing this nell climbed in a trice on pan Tarkowski's knees and embraced his neck and afterwards jumped into her father's lap papa how happy i am how happy i am of hugs and kisses there was no end finally nell finding herself on her own feet began to gaze in pan Tarkowski's eyes pan Tarkowski, what is it now as i already know that he is there can i see him to-night i knew exclaimed mr rawlinson feigning indignation that this little fly would not be content with the news itself and pan Tarkowski, turning to the son of chadigi said shami bring the dog the young Sudanese disappeared behind the kitchen tent and after a while reappeared, leading a big dog by the collar. Nell retreated. Oh, she exclaimed, seizing her father's hand. On the other hand, Stas grew enthusiastic. But that is a lion, not a dog, he said. He is called Saba, lion, answered Pan Tarkowski. He belongs to the breed of mastiffs. These are the biggest dogs in the world. This one is only two years old, but really is exceedingly large. Don't be afraid, Nell. He is as gentle as a lamb. Only be brave. Let him go, Shamis. Shamis let go of the collar with which he had restrained the dog, and the latter, feeling that he was free, began to wag his tail, fawn before Pan Tarkowski, with whom he was already well acquainted, 
and bark joyfully. The children gazed in the moonlight with admiration on his large round head, with hanging lips, on his bulky paws, on his powerful frame, reminding one, in truth, of a lion with the tawny yellowish color of his body. "'With such a dog one could safely go through Africa,' exclaimed Stas. "'Ask him whether he could retrieve a rhinoceros,' said Pan Tarkowski. Saba could not, indeed, answer that question, but instead wagged his tail more and more joyfully, and drew near to the group so ingratiatingly that Nell at once ceased to fear him and began to pat him on his head. "'Saba, nice, dear Saba!' Mr. Rawlinson leaned over him, raised his head toward the face of the little girl, and said, "'Saba, look at this little lady. She is your mistress. You must obey and guard her. Do you understand?' "'Wow!' was the basso response of Saba, as if he actually understood what was wanted. And he understood even better than might have been expected, for taking advantage of the fact that his head was on a level with the little girl's face, as a mark of homage he licked her little nose and cheeks with his broad tongue. This provoked a general outburst of laughter. Nell had to go to the tent to wash herself. Returning after a quarter of an hour, she saw Saba with paws upon the shoulders of Stas, who bent under the weight. The dog was higher by a head. The time for sleep was approaching, but the little one asked for yet half an hour of play in order to get better acquainted with her new friend. In fact, the acquaintance proceeded so easily that Pan Tarkowski soon placed her in lady fashion on Saba's back and, holding her from fear that she might fall, ordered Stas to lead the dog by the collar. She rode thus a score of paces, after which Stas tried to mount this peculiar saddle horse, but the dog sat on his hind legs, so that Stas unexpectedly found himself on the sand near the tail. The children were about to retire when in the distance on the marketplace, illumined by the moon, appeared two white figures walking towards the tents. The hitherto gentle Saba began to growl, howlingly and threateningly, so that Shamis, at Mr. Rawlinson's order, again had to take hold of the collar, and in the meantime two men, dressed in white burnouses, stood before the tent. "'Who is there?' asked Pantarkowski. "'Camel drivers,' asked one of the arrivals. "'Ah, Idris and Gebhar, what do you want? We come to ask whether you will need us tomorrow. No, tomorrow and the day after our great holidays, during which it is not proper to make excursions. Come on the morning of the third day. Thank you, Effendi. Have you good camels? asked Mr. Rawlinson. Bismillah, answered Idris. Real saddle horses with fat humps, and as gentle as haga, lambs. Otherwise Cook would not have employed us. Do they jolt much? Gentlemen, you can place a handful of kidney beans on their backs, and not a grain will fall during the fullest speed. If one is to exaggerate, then exaggerate after Arabian fashion, said Pan Tarkowski, laughing. Or after the Sudanese, added Mr. Rawlinson. In the meantime, Idris and Geber continued to stand like two white columns, gazing attentively at Stas and Nell. The moon illumined their very dark faces, and in its luster they looked as if cast of bronze, the whites of their eyes glittered greenishly from under the turbans. "'Good night to you,' said Mr. Rawlinson. "'May Allah watch over you, Effendi, in night and in day.' Saying this, they bowed and went away. They were accompanied by a hollow growl, similar to distant thunder, from Saba, whom the two Sudanese apparently did not please. End of section 4《ハートフルな夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜の夜A little tree in Mr. Rawlinson's tent, intended for Nell, was illuminated with hundreds of candles. To serve as a Christmas tree there had been taken an arbor vitae, cut in one of the gardens in Medinet. Nevertheless, among its branches Nell found a profusion of dainties and a splendid doll which her father had brought from Cairo for her, and Stas, his much-desired English short rifle. In addition he received from his father packages containing various hunter's supplies and a saddle for horseback riding. Nell could not contain herself for joy, while Stas, although he thought that whoever owned a genuine short rifle ought to possess a corresponding dignity, could not restrain himself, and selecting the time when no one was about, walked around the tents on his hands. 
This knack, taught him at the Port of Said school, he possessed to a surprising degree, and it often amused Nell, who, besides, sincerely envied it in him. Christmas Eve and the first day of the holidays were passed by the children partly in church services, partly in inspecting the gifts they had received, and in training Saba. The new friend appeared to possess intelligence beyond all expectations. On the very first day he learned to give his paw, retrieve handkerchiefs which, however, he would not surrender without some resistance, and he understood that cleaning Nell's face with his tongue was an act unworthy of a gentlemanly dog. Nell, holding her fingers at her little nose, gave him various instructions while he, concurring with motions of his tail, gave her in this manner to understand that he heard with becoming attention and took her lessons to heart. During their strolls over the sandy city square, the fame of Saba in Medinet grew with each hour, and, even as all fame, began to have its disagreeable side, for it drew a whole swarm of Arabian children. In the beginning they kept at a distance. Afterwards, however, emboldened by the gentleness of the monster, they approached more and more closely, and in the end sat around the tent so that no one could move about with any freedom. Besides, as every Arabian child sucks sugar cane from morning to night, the children always attracted after them legions of flies, which, besides being loathsome, are noxious, for they spread the Egyptian infection of inflammation of the eyes. For this reason the servants attempted to disperse the children, but Nell stood in their defense and, what is more, distributed among the youngest halu, that is, sweetmeats, which gained for her their great love, but also increased their number. After three days the joint excursions began, partly on the narrow-gauge railways of which the English had built quite a number in Medinent el Fayum, partly on donkeys, and sometimes on camels. It appeared that in the praises bestowed on these animals by Idris there was indeed a great deal of exaggeration, for not merely kidney beans but even people could not easily keep on the saddles. But there was also some truth. The camels in reality belonged to the variety known as Hagen, that is, for carrying passengers, and were fed with good dura, the local or Syrian maize, so that the humps were fat, and they appeared so willing to speed that it was necessary to check them. The Sudanese, Indris and Geber, gained, notwithstanding the wild glitter of their eyes, the confidence and hearts of the company, and this through their great willingness to serve and their extraordinary care over Nell. Geber always had a cruel and a trifle bestial expression of face, but Idris, quickly perceiving that the little personage was the eye in the hand of the whole company, declared at every opportunity that he cared more for her than for his own soul. Mr. Rawlinson conjectured, indeed, that, through Nell, Idris wanted to reach his pocket, but believing at the same time that there was not in the world a person who could not but love his only child, he was grateful to him, and did not stint himself in giving bakshish. In the course of five days the party visited the nearby ruins of the ancient city of Quacodilopolis, where at one time the Egyptians worshipped a deity called Spock, who had a human form with the head of a crocodile. Afterwards an excursion was made to the Hanar pyramids and the remains of the labyrinth. The longest trip was on camelback to Lake Curran. Its northern shore was a stark desert, on which were the ruins of former Egyptian cities, but no trace of life. On the other hand, on the southern shore stretched a fertile country, magnificent, with shores overgrown by heather and reeds and teeming with pelicans, flamingos, herons, wild geese, and ducks. Only here did Stas find an opportunity for displaying his marksmanship. The shooting from a common rifle, as well as from the short rifle, was so extraordinary that after every shot could be heard the astonished smacking of the lips of Idris and the Arabian rowers, and the falling of the birds into the water was accompanied by exclamations of Bismallah and Mashallah. The Arabians assured them that on the opposite desert shore were many wolves and hyenas, and that by tossing amid the sand dunes the carcass of a sheep one might get within shooting range. In consequence of these assurances, Pan Tarkowski and Stas passed two nights on the desert near the ruins of Dima, but the first sheep was stolen by Bedouins as soon as the hunters left it, while the second lured only a lame jackal, which Stas brought down. Further hunting had to be postponed, as the time had arrived for both engineers to inspect the works conducted at Bar Yusuf, near El Luhan, southeast from Medinet. Mr. Rawlinson waited only for the arrival of Madame Olivier, Unfortunately, in place of her came a letter from the physician informing them that the former erysipelas in the face had reoccurred after the bite, and that the patient for a long time would be unable to leave Port Said. The situation actually became distressing. 
It was impossible to take with them the children, old Dinah, the tents, and all the servants, if only for the reason that the engineers were to be one day here, another there, and might receive requests to go as far as the great canal of Ibrahimia. In view of this, after a short consultation, Mr. Rawlinson decided to leave Nell under the care of old Dinah and Stas, together with the Italian consular agent and the local mudir, governor, with whom he had previously become acquainted. He promised also to Nell, who grieved to part from her father, that from all the nearer localities he would, with Pan Tarkowski, rush to Medinet, where if they found some noteworthy sight, would summon the children to them. "'We shall take with us Shemis, said he, whom in a certain case we shall send for you. Let Dinah always keep Nell's company, but as Nell does with her whatever she pleases, do you, Stas, watch over both.' "'You may be sure, sir,' answered Stas, "'that I shall watch over Nell as over my own sister. She has Saba, and I a short rifle, so let anyone try to harm her.' It is not about that that I am concerned, said Mr. Rawlinson. Saba and the short rifle will certainly not be necessary for you. You will be so good as to protect her from fatigue, and at the same time take care she does not catch cold. I have asked the council, in case she feels unwell, to summon a doctor from Cairo immediately. We shall send Shemise here for news as frequently as possible. The Mudir will also visit you. I expect, besides, that our absence will never be very long." Pan Tarkowski also was not sparing in his admonitions to Stas. He told him that Nell did not require his defense, as there was not in Medinet, nor in the whole province of El Fayum, any savage people or wild animals. To think of such things would be ridiculous and unworthy of a boy who had begun his fourteenth year. So he was to be solicitous and heedful, only that they did not undertake anything on their own account, and more particularly excursions with Nell on camels, on which a ride was fatiguing. But Nell, hearing this, made such a sad face that Pan Tarkowski had to placate her. Certainly, he said, stroking her hair, you will ride camels, but with us, or towards us, if we send chemise for you. But when alone, are we not allowed to make an excursion, even though such a tiny bit of a one? asked the girl, and then she began to show on her finger about how little an excursion she was concerned. The parents in the end agreed that they could ride on donkeys, not on camels, and not to ruins where they might easily fall into some hole, but over roads of adjacent fields, and towards the gardens beyond the city. The dragoman, together with other cook servants, was always to accompany the children. After this both gentlemen departed, but they left for a place near by, Hanaret el Matka, so that after ten hours they returned to pass the night in Medinet. This was repeated the succeeding few days until they had inspected all the nearest work. Afterwards, when their employment required their presence at more distant places, Shemise arrived in the night-time, and early in the following morning took Stas and Nell to those little cities, in which their parents wanted to show them something of interest. The children spent the greater part of the day with their parents, and before sunset returned to the camp at Medinet. There were, however, days on which Shemise did not come, and then Nell, notwithstanding the society of Stas and Saba, in whom she continuously discovered some new traits, looked with longing for a messenger. In this manner the time passed until twelfth night, on the day of which festival both engineers returned to Medinet. Two days later they went away again, announcing that they left this time for a longer period, and in all probability would reach as far as Benesuyef, and from there to El Fakhan, where a canal of the same name begins, going far south alongside of the Nile. Great, therefore, was the astonishment of the children, when on the third day at eleven o'clock in the morning Shamis appeared in Medinet. Stas met him first as he went to the pasturage to look at the camels. Shamis conversed with Idris, and only told Stas that he had come for him and Nell, and that he would come immediately to the camp to inform them where they, at the request of the older gentleman, were to go. Stas ran at once with the good news to Nell, whom he found playing with Saba before the tent. "'Do you know, Shamis is here,' he cried from a distance." and Nell began at once to hop, holding both feet together, as little girls do when skipping the rope. "'We shall go, we shall go.' "'Yes, we shall go, and far.' "'Where?' she asked, brushing aside with her little hands a tuft of hair which fell over her eyes. "'I don't know. Shemis said that in a moment he would come here and tell us.' "'How do you know it is far?' "'Because I heard Idris say that he and Gebar would start at once with the camels. That means that we shall go by rail, and shall find the camels at the place where our parents will be.' and from there we shall make some kind of an excursion. The tuft of hair, owing to the continual hops, covered again not only Nell's eyes but her whole face, her feet bounding as if they were made of india rubber. 
A quarter of an hour later Chamis came, and bowed to both. Kanaga, young master, he said, we leave after three hours by the first train. Where are we going? To Garrick el Satani, and from there with the older gentleman on camelback to Wadi Rayan. Stas's heart beat with joy, but at the same time Shemise's words surprised him. He knew that Wadi Rayan was a great valley among sandy hills rising on the Libyan desert, on the south and southwest of Medinet, while on the other hand Pan Tarkowski and Mr. Rawlinson announced on their departure that they were going in a direct opposite direction, toward the Nile. What has happened? asked Stas. Then my father and Mr. Rawlinson are not in Benesuyev, but in El Garak. It happened thus, replied Shemiz. But they ordered us to write to them at El Fakan. In a letter the senior Effendi explains why they are at El Garak. And for a while he searched on his person for the letter, after which he exclaimed, Oh, Nabi, prophet, I left the letter in a pouch with the camels. I will run at once before Idris and Gebar depart. And he ran toward the camels. In the meantime the children, with Dinah, began to prepare for the journey. As it looked as if the excursion would be a long one, Dinah packed several dresses, some linen, and warmer clothing for Nell. Stas thought of himself, and especially did not forget about the short rifle and cartridges, hoping that among the sand dunes of Wadi Rayan he might encounter wolves and hyenas. Shemis did not return until an hour later. He was covered with perspiration and so fatigued that for a while he could not catch his breath. I did not find the camels, he said. I chased after them, but in vain. But that does not matter, as we shall find the letter and the effendis themselves in El Garak. Is Dinah to go with you? Why not? Perhaps it would be better if she remained. The older gentleman said nothing about her. But they announced on leaving that Dinah was always to accompany the little lady, so she shall ride now. Chamis bowed, placing his hand on his heart, and said, Let us hasten, sir, for otherwise the cutter train will set off. The baggage was ready, so they were at the station on time. The distance between Medinet and Garak is not more than nineteen miles, but the trains on the branch line which connects those localities move slowly, and the stops were uncommonly frequent. If Stas had been alone, he undoubtedly would have preferred to ride camelback, as he calculated that Idris and Gebar, having started two hours before the train, would be earlier in El Garak. But for Nell such a ride would be too long, and the little guardian, who took very much to heart, the warnings of both parents, did not want to expose the little girl to fatigue. After all the time passed for both so quickly that they scarcely noticed when they stopped at Garrick. The little station, from which Englishmen usually make excursions to Wadi Rayan, was almost entirely deserted. They found only a few veiled women, with baskets of mandarin oranges, two unknown Bedouin camel drivers, together with Idris and Geber, with seven camels, one of which was heavily packed. Of Pan Tarkowski and Mr. Rawlinson there was no trace. But Idris in this manner explained their absence. The older gentleman went into the desert to pitch the tents which they brought with them, from Esta, and ordered us to follow them. "'And how shall we find them among the sand hills? asked Stas. "'They sent guides who will lead us to them.' Saying this he pointed to the Bedouins. The older of them bowed, rubbed with his finger the one eye which he possessed, and said, "'Our camels are not so fat, but are not less speedy than yours. After an hour we shall be there.' Stas was glad that he would pass the night on the desert." but Nell felt a certain disappointment, for she had been certain that she would meet her papa in Garrick. In the meantime, the station-master, a sleepy Egyptian, with a red fez and dark spectacles, approached them, and, not having anything else to do, began to stare at the European children. "'These are the children of those Englishmen who rode this morning with rifles to the desert,' said Idris, placing Nell on the saddle. Stas, handing his short rifle to Shamis, sat beside her, for the saddle was wide and had the shape of a palaquin without a roof. Dinah sat behind Shamis. The others took separate camels, and the party started. If the station-master had stared at them longer, he might perhaps have wondered that those Englishmen, of whom Idris spoke, rode directly to the ruins on the south, while this party at once directed its movements toward Telai in a different direction. But the station-master, before that time, had returned home, as no other train arrived that day at Garrick. The hour was five in the afternoon. The weather was splendid. The sun had already passed on that side of the Nile, and declined over the desert, sinking into the golden and purple twilight glowing on the western side of the sky. The atmosphere was so permeated with the roseate luster that the eyes blinked from its superfluity. The fields assumed a lily tint, while the distant sand hills, strongly relieved against the background of the twilight, had a hue of pure amethyst. 
the world lost the traits of reality, and appeared to be one play of supernal lights. While they rode over a verdant and cultivated region, the guide, a Bedouin, conducted the caravan with a moderate pace. But with the moment that the hard sand creaked under the feet of the camels, everything changed. Yalla, yalla! suddenly yelled wild voices, and simultaneously could be heard the swish of whips and the camels, having changed from an ambling pace into a full gallop, began to speed like the whirlwind, throwing up with their feet the sand and gravel of the desert. Yalla, yalla! The ambling pace of a camel jolts more, while the gallop with which this animal seldom runs swings more, and so the children enjoyed this mad ride. But it is known that even in a swing, too much rapid movement causes dizziness. Accordingly, after a certain time, when the speed did not cease, Nell began to get dizzy, and her eyes grew dim. Stas, why are we flying so? she exclaimed, turning to her companion. I think that they allowed them to get into too much of a gallop, and now cannot check them, answered Stas. But observing that the little girl's face was becoming pale, he shouted at the Bedouins, running ahead to slacken their pace. His calls, however, had only this result, that again resounded the cries of Yala, and the animals increased their speed. The boy at first thought that the Bedouins did not hear him, but when on his repeated orders there was no response, and when Geber, who was riding behind him, did not cease lashing the camel on which he sat with Nell, he thought it was not the camels that were so spirited, but that the men for some reason unknown to him were in a great hurry. It occurred to him that they might have taken the wrong road, and that, desiring to make up for lost time, they now were speeding from fear that the older gentleman might scold them because of a late arrival but after a while he understood that such could not be the case, as Mr. Rawlinson would have been more angered for unnecessarily fatiguing Nell. Then what did it mean, and why did they not obey his commands? In the heart of the boy anger and fear for Nell began to arise. Stop! he shouted with his whole strength, addressing Geber. Auskaut! Be silent! the Sudanese yelled and replied, and they sped on. In Egypt night falls about six o'clock, so the twilight soon became extinct, and after a certain time the great moon, ruddy from the reflection of the twilight, rolled on and illuminated the desert with a gentle light. In the silence could be heard only the heavy breathing of the camels, the rapid hoof-beats on the sand, and at times the swish of whips. Nell was so tired that Stas had to hold her on the saddle. Every little while she asked how soon they would reach the destination, and evidently was buoyed up only by the hope of an early meeting with her father. But in vain both children gazed around. One hour passed, then another. Neither tents nor campfires could be seen. Then the hair rose on Stas's head, for he realized that they were kidnapped. End of section 5「Part 1, Chapter 6 of In Desert and Wilderness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Philippe in Paris, France. In Desert and Wilderness by Henrik Schenkevich. Translated by Max Anthony Dresmel. Part 1, Chapter 6. Messrs. Rawlingson and Tarkovsky actually expected the children, not amidst the sand hills of Wadi Rayan where they had no need or desire to ride, but in an entirely different direction, in the city of El Fachan, on a canal of the same name, at which they were examining the work finished before the end of the year. The distance between El Fachan and Medinet in a straight line is almost twenty-eight miles. As, however, there is no direct connection, and it is necessary to ride to El Watsar, which doubles the distance, Mr. Rawlingson, after looking over the railway guide, made the following calculations. Chamis left the night before last, he said to Pan Tarkovsky, and at El Watsar he caught the train from Cairo. He was therefore in Medinet yesterday. It would take an hour to pack up. Leaving at noon, they would have to wait for the night train running along the Nile, and as they do not permit Nell to ride at night, they would leave this morning and will be here immediately after sunset. Yes, said Pan Tarkovsky, Chamis must rest a little. And though Stas is indeed impulsive, nevertheless, where Nell is concerned, you may always depend on him. Moreover, I sent him a postal card not to ride during the night. A brave lad, and I trust him, answered Mr. Rawlingson. To tell the truth, so do I. Stas, with his various faults, has an upright character, and never lies. 
for he is brave and only a coward lies. He also does not lack energy, and, if in time he acquires a calm judgment, I think he will be able to take care of himself in this world. Certainly. As to judgment, were you judicious at his age? I must confess that I was not, replied Pantarkovsky, laughing, but I was not so self-confident as he. That will pass. Meanwhile, be happy that you have such a nice boy, and you that you have such a sweet and dear creature as Nell. May God bless her, answered Mr. Rawlingson with emotion. The two friends warmly shook hands, after which they sat down to examine the plans and the report of expenditures connected with the work. At this occupation the time passed until evening. About six o'clock, when night fell, they were at the station, strolling along the walk, and resumed their conversation about the children. Superb weather, but cool, said Mr. Rawlingson. I wonder if Nell took some warm clothing with her. Stas will think of that, and Dean also. I regret, nevertheless, that instead of bringing them here, we did not go to Medinet. You will recollect that that is just what I advised. I know, and if it were not that we are to go from here farther south, I would have agreed. I calculated, however, that the trip would take too much time, and on the whole it would be best to have the children here. Finally, I will confess to you that Chamis suggested the idea to me. He announced that he prodigiously yearned for them, and would be happy if I sent for both. I am not surprised that he should be so attached to them. Further conversation was interrupted by signals announcing the approach of the train. After an interval, the fiery eyes of the locomotive appeared in the darkness, and at the same time could be heard its puffs and whistle. A row of lighted coaches drew alongside the platform, quivered, and stood still. I did not see them in any window, said Mr. Rawlingson. Perhaps they are seated further inside, and surely will come out immediately. The passengers began to alight, but they were mainly Arabs, as El Fashan has nothing interesting to see except beautiful groves of palms and acacias. The children did not arrive. Chamis either did not make connections in El Wastar, declared Pantarkovsky with a shade of ill humour, or after a night of travel, overslept himself, and they will not arrive until tomorrow. That may be, answered Mr. Rawlingson with uneasiness, but it is also possible that one of them is sick. In that case, Stas would have telegraphed. Who knows but that we may find a dispatch in the hotel? Let us go. But in the hotel no news awaited them. Mr. Rawlingson became more and more uneasy. What do you think could have happened? said Pan Tarkovsky. If Chamis overslept himself, he would not admit it to the children, and would come to them today and tell them that they are to leave tomorrow. To us he would excuse himself by claiming that he misunderstood our orders. In any event, I shall telegraph to Stas. And I to the Mudir of Fayum. After a while the dispatches were sent. There was indeed no cause for uneasiness. Nevertheless, in waiting for the answer, the engineers passed a bad night, and early morning found them on their feet. The answer from the Budir came about ten o'clock, and was as follows. Verified at station. Children left yesterday for Garak el Sultani. It can easily be understood what amazement and anger possessed the parents at this unexpected intelligence. For some time they gazed at each other, as if they did not understand the words of the dispatch after which Pan Tarkovsky, who was an impulsive person, struck the table with his hand and said, That was Stas's whim, but I will cure him of such whims. I did not expect that of him, answered Nell's father. But after a moment he asked, But what of Chamis? He either did not find them and does not know what to do, or else he rode after them. Yes, I think so. An hour later they started for Medinet. In camp they ascertained that the camels were gone, and at the station it was confirmed that Chamis left with the children for El Gorak. The affair became darker and darker, and it could only be cleared up in El Gorak. In fact, only at the station did the dreadful truth begin to dawn. The station-master, the same sleepy one with dark spectacles and red fez, 
told him that he saw a boy about fourteen years old and an eight-year-old girl with an old negress, who rode towards the desert. He did not remember whether there were eight or nine camels altogether, but observed that one was heavily packed, as if for a long journey, and the two Bedouins also had big pack saddles. He recollected also that when he stared at the caravan, one of the camel drivers, a Sudanese, said to him that those were the children of the Englishmen who before had gone to Wadi Rayan. Did those Englishmen return? asked Pan Tarkovsky. Yes, they returned yesterday with two slain wolves, answered the station master, and I was astonished that they did not return with the children. But I did not ask the reason, as that was not my affair. Saying this, he left to attend to his duties. During this narrative, Mr. Rawlinson's face became white as paper. Gazing at his friend with a wild look, he took off his hat, pressed his hand to his forehead, covered with perspiration, and staggered as if he were about to fall. "'Be a man, Rawlinson!' exclaimed Pan Tarkovsky. "'Our children are kidnapped. It is necessary to rescue them.' "'Nell, Nell!' repeated the unhappy Englishman. "'Nell and Stas. It was not Stas's fault. Both were enticed by trickery and kidnapped. Who knows why? Perhaps for a ransom. Chamis undoubtedly is in the plot, and Idris and Gerber also.' Here he recalled what Fatma had said about both Sudanese belonging to the Dongarese tribe in which Madi was born, and that Chadigi, the father of Chamis, came from the same tribe. At this recollection, his heart for a moment became inert in his breast, for he understood that the children were abducted not for a ransom, but as an exchange for Smain's family. But what will the tribesmen of the ill omened prophet do with them? They cannot hide them on the desert, or any on the banks of the Nile, for they would all die of hunger and thirst on the desert, and they certainly would be apprehended on the Nile. Perhaps they will try to join the Mahadi. And this thought filled Pan Tarkovsky with dismay. But the energetic ex-soldier soon recovered, and began, in his mind, to review all that happened, and at the same time seek means of rescue. Fatima he reasoned, had no cause to revenge herself either upon us or our children. If they have been kidnapped, it was evidently for the purpose of placing them in the hands of Smain. In no case does death threaten them, and this is a fortune in misfortune. Still, a terrible journey awaits them, which might be disastrous for them. And at once he shared these thoughts with his friend, after which he spoke thus. Idris and Gerber, like savage and foolish men, Imagine that followers of the Mahdi are not far, while Khartoum, which the Mahdi reached, is about 1,240 miles from here. This journey they must make along the Nile, and not keep at a distance from it, as otherwise the camels and people would perish from thirst. Ride at once to Cairo, and demand of the Khadif that dispatches be sent to all military outposts, and that a pursuit be organized right and left along the river offer a large reward to all sheiks near the banks for the capture of the fugitives. In the villages, let all be detained who approach for water. In this manner, Idris and Gerber must fall into the hands of the authorities, and we shall recover the children. Mr. Rawlingson had already recovered his composure. I shall go, he said. Those miscreants forgot that Walsley's English army, hurrying to Gordon's relief, is already on the way, and will cut them off from the Mahadi. They will not escape. They cannot escape. I shall send a dispatch to our minister in a moment, and afterwards go myself. What do you intend to do? I shall telegraph for a furlough, and not waiting for an answer, shall follow the trail by way of the Nile to Nubia, to attend to the pursuit. Then we shall meet, as from Cairo I will do the same. Good, and now to work. With God's help, answered Mr. Rawlingson. End of chapter 6「パート1チャプター7 of In Desert and Wilderness」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand In Desert and Wilderness by Henrik Sienkiewicz Translated by Max Anthony Dresmel Part 1 Chapter 7 In the meantime, the camels swept like a hurricane over the sands glistening in the moonlight. 
a deep night fell the moon at the beginning as big as a wheel and ruddy became pale and rolled on high the distant desert hills were enveloped with silvery vapors like muslin which not veiling their view transformed them as if into luminous phenomena from time to time beyond the rocks scattered here and there came the piteous whining of jackals another hour passed stas held nell in his arms and supported her endeavoring in this way to allay the fatiguing jolt of the mad ride the little girl began more and more frequently to ask him why they were speeding so and why they did not see the tents and their papas stas finally determined to tell her the truth which sooner or later he would have to disclose nell he said pull off a glove and drop it unobserved on the ground why stas and he pressed her to himself and answered with a kind of tenderness unusual to him do what i tell you nell held stas with one hand and feared to let him go but she overcame the difficulty in this manner she began to pull the glove with her teeth each finger separately and finally taking it off entirely she dropped it on the ground after a time throw the other again spoke stas i have already dropped mine but yours will be easier to observe for they are bright and observing that the little girl gazed at him with an inquiring look he continued don't get frightened now it may be that we will not meet your or my father at all and that these foul people have kidnapped us but don't fear for if it is so the pursuers will follow them they will overtake them and surely rescue us i told you to drop the glove so that the pursuers may find clues in the meanwhile we can do nothing but later i shall contrive something surely i shall contrive something only do not fear and trust me but nell learning that she should not see her papa and that they are flying somewhere far in the desert began to tremble from fright and cry clinging at the same time close to stas and asking him amid her sobs why they kidnapped them and where they were taking them he comforted her as well as he could almost in the same words with which his father comforted mr rawlinson he said that their parents themselves would follow in pursuit and would notify all the garrisons along the nile in the end he assured her that whatever might happen he would never abandon her and would always defend her but her grief and longing for her father were stronger even than fear so for a long time she did not cease to weep and thus they flew both sad on a bright night over the pale sands of the desert sorrow and fear not only oppressed stas's heart but also shame he was not indeed to blame for what had happened yet he recalled the former boastfulness for which his father so often had rebuked him formerly he was convinced that there was no situation to which he was not equal he considered himself a kind of unvanquished swashbuckler and was ready to challenge the whole world now he understood that he was a small boy with whom everybody could do as he pleased and that he was speeding in spite of his will on a camel merely because that camel was driven from behind by a half savage sudanese he felt terribly humiliated and did not see any way of resisting he had to admit to himself that he plainly feared those men and the desert and what he and nell might meet he promised sincerely not only to her but to himself that he would watch over and defend her even at the cost of his own life nell weary with weeping and the mad ride which had lasted already six hours finally began to doze and at times fell asleep stas knowing that whoever fell from a galloping camel might be killed on the spot tied her to himself with a rope which he found on the saddle but after some time it seemed to him that the speed of the camels became less rapid though now they flew over smooth and soft sands in the distance could be seen only the shifting hills while on the plain began the nocturnal illusions common to the desert the moon shone in the heaven more and more palely and in the meantime there appeared before them creeping low strange rosy clouds entirely transparent woven only from light they formed mysteriously and moved ahead as if pushed by the light breeze stas saw how the burnooses of the bedouins and the camels became roseate when they rode into that illuminated space and afterwards the whole caravan was enveloped in a delicate rosy luster at times the clouds assumed an azure hue and thus it continued until the hills were reached near the hills the speed of the camels slackened yet more all about could be seen rocks protruding from sandy knolls or strewn in wild disorder amidst the sand dunes the ground became stony they crossed a few hollows sown with stone and resembling the dried-up beds of rivers at times their road was barred by ravines about which they had to make a detour the animals began to step carefully moving their legs with precision as if in a dance among the dry and hard bushes formed by roses of jericho with which the dunes and rocks were abundantly covered time and again some of the camels would stumble and it was apparent that it was due to them to give them rest accordingly the bedouin stopped in a sunken pass and dismounting from the saddles proceeded to untie the packs idris and gebhr followed their example 
they began to attend to the camels to loosen the saddle girths remove the supplies of provisions and seek flat stones on which to build a fire there was no wood or dried dung which arabs use but shamas son of chadigi plucked roses of jericho and built of them a big pile to which he set fire for some time, while the Sudanese were engaged with the camels, Stas and Nell and her nurse, old Dinah, found themselves together, somewhat apart. But Dinah was more frightened than the children and could not say a word. She only wrapped Nell in a warm plaid and, sitting close to her, began with a moan to kiss her little hands. Stas at once asked Chamis the meaning of what had happened, but he, laughing, only displayed his white teeth and went to gather more roses of Jericho. Idris, questioned afterwards, answered with these words, You will see, and threatened him with his finger. When the fire of roses, which smoldered more than blazed, finally glowed, they all surrounded it in a circle, except Geber, who remained with the camels, and they began to eat cakes of maize and dried mutton and goat's meat. The children, famished by the long journey, also ate, though at the same time Nell's eyes were closed by sleepiness. But in the meantime, in the faint light of the fire, appeared dark-skinned Geber, and with glittering eyes he held up two bright gloves and asked, "'Whose are these?' "'Mine.' answered Nell with a sleepy and tired voice. "'Yours, little viper?' the Sudanese hissed through set teeth. "'Then you mark the road so that your father can know where to pursue us.' Saying this, he struck her with the korbash, a terrible Arabian whip, which cuts even the hide of a camel. Nell, though she was wrapped in a thick plaid, shrieked from pain and fright, but Geber was unable to strike her a second time, for at that moment Stas leaped like a wildcat, butted Geber's breast with his head, and afterwards clutched him by the throat. It happened so unexpectedly that the Sudanese fell upon his back and Stas on top of him, and both began to roll on the ground. The boy was exceptionally strong for his age, nevertheless Geber soon overcame him. He first pulled his hands from his throat, after which he turned him over with face to the ground, and pressing heavily on his neck with his fist, he began to lash his back with the carabash. The shrieks and tears of Nell, who seizing the hand of the savage at the same time begged him to forgive Stas, would not have availed if Idris had not unexpectedly come to the boy's assistance. He was older than Geber, and from the beginning of the flight from Garak el Sultani, all complied with his orders. Now he snatched the korbash from his brother's hand and, pushing him away, exclaimed, "Away, you fool!" "I'll flog that scorpion," answered Geber, gnashing his teeth. But at this, Idris seized his cloak at the breast and, gazing into his eyes, began to say in a threatening though quiet voice, "The noble, all relatives of the Mahdi were termed noble. Fatma forbade us to do any harm to those children, for they interceded for her." I'll flog him, iterated Geber, and I tell you that you shall not raise the korbash at either of them. If you do, for every blow I shall give you ten. And he began to shake him like a bough of a palm, after which he thus continued, Those children are the property of the Smain, and if either of them does not reach him alive, the Mahdi himself, may God prolong his days infinitely, would command you to be hung. Do you understand, you fool? The name of the Mahdi created such a great impression upon all his believers that Geber drooped his head at once and began to repeat as if with fear, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. This cry means God is great, but Arabs utter it in moments of fear, summoning aid. Stas rose, panting and whipped, but felt that if his father could have seen and heard him at that moment, he would have been proud of him, for he had not only leaped to save Nell without thinking, but now, though the blows of the korbash burnt him like fire, he did not think of his own pain, but instead began to console and ask the little girl whether the blow had injured her. And afterwards he said, Whatever I got, I got, but he will never attack you. Oh, if I only had some weapon. The little woman entwined his neck with her arms, and dampening his cheeks with tears, began to assure him that it did not pain her very much, and that she was crying not from pain, but from sorrow for him. At this, Stas put his lips to her ear and whispered, Nell, I swear that not because he whipped me, but because he struck you, I shall not forgive him. With that, the incident closed. After a certain time, Geber and Idris, becoming reconciled, spread out their cloaks upon the ground and lay upon them, and Shamis soon followed their example. The Bedouins poured out dura for the camels, after which, having mounted two unengaged camels, they rode in the direction of the Nile. Nell, supporting her head on old Dinah's knee, fell asleep. The fire was dying out, and soon could be heard only the grinding of the dura in the camel's teeth. On high rolled small clouds, which at times veiled the moon, but the night was clear. Beyond the rocks resounded the mournful whining of jackals. After two hours, the Bedouins returned with the camels bearing leather bags filled with water. Having fed the fire, they sat on the sand and commenced to eat. Their arrival awoke Stas, who previously had been dozing, as well as Shamis, son of Chadigi, and the two Sudanese. 
Then at the campfire began the following conversation. Can we start? Idris asked. No, because we must rest. We and our camels. Did anyone see you? Nobody. We reached the river between two villages. In the distance, dogs barked. It will be necessary always to go for water at midnight and draw it at deserted places. Only let us get past the first chala, cataract. Beyond that, the villages are farther apart and they are more friendly to the prophet. A pursuing party will undoubtedly follow us. At this, Chemis turned over, with his back up, and resting his face on his hand, said, The Mehendis will first wait for the children, in al Fachin, during the whole night and until the following train. Later they will go to Fayum, and from there to Garak. Only there will they understand what has happened, and then they will have to return to Menedet to send words flying over the copper wire to cities on the Nile and to the Camel Corps which will pursue us. All that will take at least three days. Therefore we do not need to tire our camels and can peacefully drink smoke from pipe stems. Saying this, he pulled out a sprig of a rose of Jericho and lit his pipe with it, while Idris began, according to the Arabian habit, to smack his lips with satisfaction. You arranged it well, son of Chadigi, he said, but it is necessary for us to take advantage of the time and to drive during those three days and nights as far as possible southward. I shall breathe freely only when we shall cross the desert between the Nile and Karga, a great oasis west of the Nile. God grant that the camels hold out. They will hold out, declared one of the Bedouins. People also say, interposed Chamis, that the army of the Mahadi, may God prolong his life, has already reached Asuan. Here Stas, who did not lose a word of this conversation, and remembered also what Idris had said to Geber, rose and said, The army of the Mahdi is now below Khartoum. La, la! No, no! Chamis contradicted. Don't pay attention to his words, Stas replies, for he not only has a dark skin but also a dark brain. Although you bought fresh camels every three days and rushed as you have done this day, you would not reach Khartoum for a month. And perhaps you do not know that an English, not an Egyptian, army bars the road to you. These words created a certain impression, and Stas, observing this, continued, Before you find yourselves between the Nile and the Great Oasis, all the roads on the desert will be picketed by a line of army sentinels. Words over the copper wire speed quicker than the camels. How will you be able to slip through? The desert is wide, answered one of the Bedouins. But you must keep close to the Nile. We can cross over, and when they seek us on this side, we shall be on the other. Words speeding over the copper wire will reach cities and villages on both banks of the river. The Mahdi will send us an angel, who will place a finger on the eyes of the Englishmen and the Turks, Egyptians, and will screen us with his wings. Idris, said Stas, I do not address Chamis, whose head is like an empty gourd, nor Geber, who is a vile jackal, but you. I already know that you want to carry us to the Mahdi and deliver us to Smain. But if you are doing this for money, then know that the father of this little bint, girl, is richer than all the Sudanese put together. And what of it? interrupted Idris. What of it? Return voluntarily, and the great Mehendi will not spare money for you, nor will my father either. But they will give us up to the government, which will order us to be hung. No, Idris, you undoubtedly will hang, but only in case they capture you in the flight, and that surely will happen. But if you return, no punishment will be meted out to you, and besides, you will be wealthy to the end of your life. You know that the white people of Europe always keep their word. Now I give you the word for both Mehendis that it will be as I say. And Stas in reality was confident that his father and Mr. Rawlinson would prefer to fulfill the promise made by him than to expose both of them, and especially Nell, to the terrible journey and yet more terrible life among the savage and maddened hordes of the Mahdi. So with palpitating heart he waited for the reply of Idris, who was plunged in silence and only after a long interval said, You say that the father of the little bint and yours will give us a great deal of money? Yes. But can all their money open for us the gates of paradise which only the blessing of the Mahdi can do? Bismillah, shouted both Bedouins together with Shamis and Geber. Stas at once lost all hope, for he knew that howsoever much the people in the east are greedy and venal, nevertheless when a true Mohammedan views any matter from the standpoint of faith, there are not any treasures in the world with which he can be tempted. Idris, encouraged by the shouts, continued, and evidently not for the purpose of replying to Stas, but with a view of gaining greater esteem and praise from his companions. We have the good fortune not only to belong to that tribe which gave the holy prophet, but the noble Fatma and her children are his relatives, and the great Mahdi loves them. If we deliver you and the little bint to him, he will exchange you for Fatma and her sons, and will bless us. Know that even the water, in which every morning, according to the precepts of the Quran, he makes his ablutions, heals the sick and eliminates sins, and think what his blessing can accomplish. Bismillah, reiterated the Sudanese and Bedouins. 
but stas clutching at the last plank for help said then take me and let the bedouins return with the little bint for me they will surrender fatma and her sons it is yet more certain that they will surrender her for you too at this the boy addressed chamis your father shall answer for your conduct my father is already in the desert on his way to the prophet retorted chamis then they will capture and hang him here however idris deemed it proper to give encouragement to his companions those vultures he said which will pick the flesh from our bones may not yet be hatched we know it threatens us but we are not children and we know the deserts of old these men here he pointed at the bedouins were many times in berber and are acquainted with roads over which only gazelles roam there nobody will find us and nobody will seek us we must indeed turn for water to the bar yusuf and later to the nile but we'll do that in the night besides do you think that on the river there are no secret friends of the mahdi and i tell you that the farther south we go the more of them we will find there tribes and their sheiks are only waiting for the favorable moment to seize the sword in defense of the true faith these alone will supply water food and camels and lead astray the pursuit in truth we know that it is far to the mahdi but we also know that every day brings us nearer to the sheep's hide on which the holy prophet kneels to pray bismillah shouted his companions for the third time it was apparent that idris's importance grew among them considerably stas understood that all was lost so desiring at least to protect nell from the malice of the sudanese he said after six hours the little lady reached here barely alive how can you think that she can endure such a journey if she should die i also will die and then with what will you come to the mahdi now idris could not find an answer stas perceiving this continued thus and how will the mahdi and smain receive you when they learn that for your folly fatma and her children must pay with their lives but the Sudanese had recovered himself and replied, I saw how you grasped Geber's throat. By Allah, you are a lion's whelp and will not die, and she... Here he gazed at the little head of the sleeping girl resting on the knees of old Dinah, and finished in a kind of strangely gentle voice. For her we will weave on the camel's hump a nest, as for a bird, that she may not at all feel fatigue, and that she may sleep on the road as peacefully as she is sleeping now saying this he walked towards the camels and with the bedouins began to make a seat for the little girl on the back of the best dromedary at this they chattered a great deal and quarrelled among themselves but finally with the aid of ropes shaggy coverlets and short bamboo poles they made something in the shape of a deep immovable basket in which nell could sit or lie down but from which she could not fall above this seat so broad that dinah also could be accommodated in it they stretched a linen awning you see said idris to stas quail's eggs could not crack in those housings the old woman will ride with the little lady to serve her day and night you will sit with me but can ride near her and watch over her stas was glad that he had secured even this much pondering over the situation he came to the conclusion that in all probability they would be captured before they reached the first cataract and this thought gave him hope in the meantime he wanted above all things to sleep so he promised himself that he would tie himself with some kind of rope to the saddle and as he would not have to hold nell he could take a nap for a few hours the night already became paler and the jackal ceased their whining amid the passes the caravan was to start immediately but the sudanese observing the dawn went to a rock a few paces away and there conformably with the precepts of the koran began their morning ablutions using however sand instead of water which they desired to save afterwards resounded voices saying the subug or morning prayer amidst the deep silence plainly could be heard of their words in the name of the compassionate and merciful god glory to the lord the sovereign of the world compassionate and merciful on the day of judgment thee we worship and profess thee we implore for aid lead us over the road of those to whom thou dost not spare benefactions and grace and not over the paths of sinners who have incurred thy wrath and who err amen and stas hearing these voices raised his eyes upwards and in that distant region amidst tawny gloomy sands began the prayer we fly to thy patronage o holy mother of god End of part one, chapter seven. Part one, chapter eight of In Desert and Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. In Desert and Wilderness by Heinrich Schenkevich. Translated by Max Anthony Dresmel chapter eight the night faded the men already had the saddles on the camels when suddenly they observed a desert wolf 
which, with tail curled beneath it, rushed across the pass about a hundred paces from the caravan, and reaching the opposite tableland, dashed ahead, showing signs of fright as if it fled before some enemy. On the Egyptian deserts there are no wild animals before which wolves could feel any fear, and for that reason this sight greatly alarmed the Sudanese Arabs. What could this be? Was the pursuing party already approaching? One of the Bedouins quickly climbed on a rock, but he had barely glanced when he slipped down yet more quickly. "'By the prophet!' he exclaimed, confused and frightened. "'A lion is rushing towards us and is already close by.' And then from beyond the rocks came a bass wow, after which Stas and Nell shouted together, "'Saba! Saba!' As in the Arabian language this means a lion, the Bedouins became frightened yet more, but Shamis burst out laughing and said, "'I know that lion!' Saying this, he whistled drawlingly, and in a moment the gigantic mastiff dashed among the camels. Seeing the children, he leaped towards them. From joy he overturned Nell, who extended her hands to him. He reared himself on Stas. Afterwards, whining and barking, he ran round both a few times, again overturned Nell, again reared himself on Stas, and finally laying down at their feet began to pant. His sides were sunken. From his lolling tongue fell clots of froth. Nevertheless, he wagged his tail and raised his eyes full of love at Nell, as if he wanted to say, Your father ordered me to watch over you, so here I am. The children sat close to him, one on each side, and began to pat him. The two Bedouins, who never before saw a creature like this, gazed at him with astonishment, repeating, O oh Allah! O oh Kelb Kabir! By God, that is a big dog! While he for some time lay quietly. Afterwards he raised his head, inhaled the air through his black nose resembling a big truffle, scented and jumped towards the extinct campfire, near which lay the remnants of food. In the same moment goats and lambs' bones began to crack and crumble as straw in his powerful teeth. After eight people, counting old Dinah and Nell, there was enough for such Kelb Kabir. But the Sudanese were worried by his arrival, and the two camel drivers, calling Shemis to one side, began to speak to him with uneasiness and even with indignation. Iblis Iblis, one of the names of the devil in the Koran, translator's note, brought that dog here, exclaimed Geber, but in what manner did he find the children since they came to Garak by rail? Surely by the camel tracks, answered Chamis. It happened badly. Everybody who sees him with us will remember our caravan and will point out where we went. We positively must get rid of him. But how? asked Chamis. We have a rifle, so take it and shoot him in the head. In a case of urgency, Shamis might be able, for Stas had several times opened and closed his weapon before him, but he was sorry for the dog of whom he was fond, having taken care of him before the arrival of the children at Medinet. He knew perfectly that the Sudanese had no idea how to handle a weapon of the latest model and would be at a loss what to do with it. If you don't know how, he said with a crafty smile, that little Nusrani christian could kill the dog but that rifle can fire several times in succession so i do not advise you to put it in his hands god forbid replied idris he would shoot us like quails we have knives observed geber try it but remember that you have a throat which the dog will pull to pieces before you stab him then what is to be done shamis shrugged his shoulder why do you want to kill the dog if you should afterwards bury him in the sand, the hyenas will dig him out, the pursuers will find his bones, and will know that we did not cross the Nile, but made off in this direction. Let him follow us. As often as the Bedouins go for water, and we hide in the passes, you may be sure that the dog will stay with the children. Allah! It is better that he came now, for otherwise he would lead the pursuing party on our tracks as far as Berber. You do not need to feed him, for if our leavings are not sufficient, it will not be difficult for him to get a hyena or jackal. Leave him in peace, I tell you, and do not lose any time in idle talk. Perhaps you are right, said Idris. If I am right, then I will give him water, so that he shall not run to the Nile and show himself in the villages. In this manner was decided the fate of Saba, who, having somewhat rested himself and eaten his fill, in the twinkling of an eye, lapped up a bowl of water and started with renewed strength after the caravan. They now rode on high, level ground, on which the wind wrinkled the sand, and from which could be seen on both sides the immense expanse of the desert. Heaven assumed the tint of a pearl shell. Light little clouds gathered in the east and changed like opals, after which they suddenly became dyed with gold. 
one ray darted afterwards another and the sun as is usual in southern countries in which there are scarcely any twilight and dawn did not ascend but burst from behind the clouds like a pillar of fire and flooded the horizon with a bright light it enlivened heaven it enlivened the earth and the immeasurable sandy expanse was unveiled to the eyes of men we must hasten said idris for here we can be seen from a distance accordingly the rested and satiated camels sped on with the celerity of gazelles saba remained behind but there was no fear that he would get lost and not appear at the first short halt for refreshments the dromedary on which idris rode with stas ran close to the one on which nell was mounted so that the children could easily converse with each other the seat which the sudanese had made appeared splendid and the little girl really looked like a bird in a nest she could not fall even sleeping and the ride fatigued her far less than during the night the bright daylight gave courage to both children. In Stas's heart the hope entered that since Saba had overtaken them the pursuers might do the same. This hope he at once shared with Nell, who smiled at him for the first time since their abduction. "'When will they overtake us?' she asked in French, in order that Idris should not understand them. "'I do not know. It may be today, perhaps tomorrow, perhaps after two or three days.' "'But we will not ride back on camels?' "No." We will ride only as far as the Nile, and afterwards go by way of the Nile to El Wasta. That is good, oh good! Poor Nell, who had previously loved these rides, had evidently now had enough of them. By way of the Nile, to El Wasta and to Papa, she began to repeat in a sleepy voice. As at the previous stop she did not enjoy a full sound sleep, she now fell into that deep sleep which after fatigue comes towards morning. In the meantime the Bedouins drove the camels without a rest, and Saas observed that they were making their way towards the interior of the desert. So, desiring to shake Idris's confidence that he would be able to elude the pursuit, and at the same time to show him that he himself relied upon it as a dead certainty, he said, "'You are driving away from the Nile and from Bar Yusuf, but that won't help you, for of course they will not seek you on the banks where villages lie side by side, but in the interior of the desert.' And Idris asked, how do you know that we are driving away from the Nile, since the banks cannot be seen from here? Because the sun, which is in the eastern part of heaven, is warming our backs. That means we have turned to the west. You are a wise boy, said Idris with esteem. After a while he added, but the pursuing party will not overtake us, nor will you escape. No, answered Stas, I shall not escape, unless with her. And he pointed to the sleeping girl. Until noon they sped almost without pausing for breath, but when the sun rose high in the sky and began to scorch, the camels, which by nature perspire but little, were covered with sweat, and their pace slackened considerably. The caravan again was surrounded by rocks and dunes. The ravines, which during the raining season are changed into channels of streams, or so-called cores, came to view more and more frequently. The Bedouins finally halted in one of them, which was entirely concealed amid the rocks. But they had barely dismounted from the camels when they raised a cry and dashed ahead, bending over every little while and throwing stones ahead of them. Stas, who had not yet alighted from the saddle, beheld a strange sight. From among the dry bushes overgrowing the bed of the khor, a big snake emerged, and gliding sinuously with the rapidity of lightning among the fragments of rocks, escaped to some hiding place known to itself. The Bedouins chased it furiously, and Geber rushed to their aid with a knife. But owing to the unevenness of the ground, it was difficult either to hit the snake with a stone or to pin it with a knife. Soon all three returned with terror visible on their faces. And the cries, customary with Arabs, resounded, Allah! Bismillah! Mashallah! Afterwards both Sudanese began to look with a kind of strange and at the same time searching and inquiring gaze at Stas, who could not understand what was the matter. In the meantime, Nell also dismounted from her camel, and though she was less tired than during the night, Stas spread for her a saddle-cloth in the shade on a level spot and told her to lie down, in order, as he said, that she might straighten out her little feet. The Arabs prepared their noon meal, which consisted of biscuits and dates, together with a gulp of water. The camels were not watered, for they had drank during the night. The faces of Idris, Geber, and the Bedouins were still dejected, and the stop was made in silence. Finally, Idris called Stas aside and began to question him with a countenance at once mysterious and perturbed. "'Did you see the snake?' "'I did.' "'Did you conjure it to appear before us?' "'No. Some ill luck awaits us, as those fools did not succeed in killing it.' "'The gallows awaits you.' "'Be silent. Is your father a sorcerer?' 
he is answered stas without any hesitation for he understood in a moment that those savage and superstitious men regarded the appearance of a reptile as an evil omen and an announcement that the flight would not succeed so then your father sent it to us answered idris but he ought to understand that we can avenge ourselves for his charms upon you you will not do anything to me as the sons of fatma would have to suffer for any injury to me and you already understand this but remember that if it were not for me your blood would have flowed under geber's korbash yours and that little bint's also i therefore shall intercede for you only but geber shall swing on the rope at this idris gazed at him for a while as if with astonishment and said our lives are not yet in your hands and you already talk to us as our lord after a while he added you are a strange you led boy and such a one i have not yet seen thus far i have been kind to you but take heed and do not threaten god punishes treachery answered stas it was apparent however that the assurance with which the boy spoke in connection with the evil omen in the form of a snake which succeeded in escaping disquieted idris in a high degree having already mounted the camel he repeated several times yes i was kind to you as if in any event he wished to impress this upon stas's memory and afterwards he began to finger the beads of a rosary made of the shells of dumb nuts and pray about two o'clock though it was in the winter season the heat became unusual in the sky there was not a cloud lit but the horizon's border was disfigured above the caravan hovered a few vultures whose widely outstretched wings cast moving black shadows on the tawny sands in the heated air could be smelt an odor like the gas exhaled from burning charcoal the camels not ceasing to run began to grunt strangely one of the bedouins approached idris some evil is brewing what do you think asked the sudanese wicked spirits awoke the wind slumbering on the western desert and he rose from the sands and is rushing upon us idris raised himself on the saddle gazed into the distance and replied that is so he is coming from the west and south but is not as furious as a kamsen a southwest wind which blows in the spring three years ago near abu hamed he buried a whole caravan and did not sweep the sand away until last winter uwala he may have enough strength to stuff the nostrils of the camels and dry up the water in the bags it is necessary that we speed so that he can strike us only with a wing we are flying in his eyes and are not able to avoid him the quicker he comes the quicker he will pass away saying this idris struck his camel with a corbash and his example was followed by the others for some time could be heard the dull blows of the thick whips resembling the clapping of hands and the cries of yala on the southwest the horizon previously whitish darkened the heat continued and the sun scorched the heads of the riders the vultures soared very high evidently for their shadows grew smaller and smaller and they finally vanished entirely it became sultry the arabs yelled at the camels until their throats became parched after which they were silent and a funereal quiet ensued interrupted only by the groaning of the animals two very small foxes an animal smaller than our foxes called fennec with big ears stole by the caravan running in an opposite direction the same bedouin who had previously conversed with idris spoke out again in a strange and as if not his own voice this will not be a usual wind evil charms are pursuing us the snake is to blame for all i know answered idris look the air quivers that does not happen in winter in fact the heated air began to quiver and in consequence of an illusion of the eyes it seemed to the riders that the sands quivered the bedouin took his sweaty cowl from his head and said the heart of the desert beats with terror and at this the other bedouin riding in the lead as a guide of the camels turned around and began to shout he is already coming he is coming and in truth the wind came up in the distance appeared as it were dark clouds which in their eyes grew higher and higher and approached the caravan the nearest waves of air all around became agitated and sudden gusts of wind began to spin the sand here and there funnels were formed as if someone had drilled the surface of the desert with a cane at places rose swift whirlpools resembling pillars thin at the bottom and outspread on top like plumes of feathers all this lasted but the twinkling of an eye the cloud which the camel guide first espied came flying towards them with an inconceivable velocity it struck the people and beasts like the wing of a gigantic bird in one moment the eyes and mouths of the riders were filled with sand clouds of dust hid the sky hid the sun and the earth became dusky 
The men began to lose sight of one another, and even the nearest camel appeared indistinctly as if in a fog. Not the rustle, for on the desert there are no trees, but the roar of the whirlwind drowned the calls of the guide and the bellowing of the animals. In the atmosphere could be smelt an odor such as coal smoke gives. The camels stood still, and turning away from the wind, they stretched their long necks downward so that their nostrils almost touched the sand. The Sudanese, however, did not wish to allow a stop, as caravans which halt during a hurricane are often buried in sand. At such times it is best to speed with the whirlwind, but Idris and Geber could not do this, for in thus doing they would return to Fayum from where they expected a pursuit. So when the first gale passed, they again drove the camels. A momentary stillness ensued, but the ruddy dusk dissipated very slowly, for the sun could not pierce through the clouds of dust suspended in the air. The thicker and heavier particles of sand began to fall. Sand filled all the cracks and punctures in the saddles and clung to the folds of the clothes. The people with each breath inhaled dust which irritated their lungs and grated their teeth. Besides, the whirlwind might break out again and hide the whole world. It occurred to Stas that if at the time of such darkness he was with Nell on the same camel, he might turn around and escape with the wind northward. Who knows whether they would be observed amid the dusk and confusion of the elements, and if they succeeded in reaching any village on Bar Yusuf near the Nile, Idris and Gabur would not dare to pursue them, for they would at once fall into the hands of the local police. Stas, weighing all this, jostled Idris's shoulder and said, Give me the gourd with water. Idris did not refuse, for howsoever much that morning they had turned into the interior of the desert, and quite far from the river, they had enough of water, and the camels drank copiously during the time of their night stop. Besides this, as a man acquainted with the desert, he knew that after a hurricane, rain usually follows, and the dried-up cores change temporarily into streams. Stas, in reality, was thirsty, so he took a good drink, after which, not returning the gourd, he again jostled Idris's arm. Halt the caravan. Why? asked the Sudanese. Because I want to sit on the camel with the little bint and give her water. Dinah has a bigger gourd than mine. But she is greedy and surely has emptied it. A great deal of sand must have fallen into her saddle which you made like a basket. Dinah will be helpless. The wind will break out after a while and will refill it. That is the more reason why she will require help. Idris lashed the camel with his whip and for a while they rode in silence. Why don't you answer? Stas asked because I am considering whether it would be better to tie you to the saddle or tie your hands behind. You have become insane. No, I have guessed what you intended to do. The pursuers will overtake us anyway, so I would not have to do it. The desert is in the hands of God. They became silent again. The thicker sand fell entirely. There remained in the air a subtle red dust, something of the nature of pollen, through which the sun shone like a copper plate. But already they could see ahead. Before the caravan stretched level ground, at the borders of which the keen eyes of the Arabs again espied a cloud. It was higher than the previous one, and besides this, there shot from it what seemed like pillars or gigantic chimneys expanding at the top. At this sight, the hearts of the Arabs and Bedouins quailed, for they recognized the great sandy whirlpools. Idris raised his hands, and drawing his palms towards his ears, began to prostrate himself to the approaching whirlwind. His faith in one God evidently did not prevent his worship and fear of others, for Sas distinctly heard him say, Lord, we are thy children, therefore do not devour us. But the Lord just dashed at them and assailed the camels with a force so terrible that they almost fell to the ground. The animals now formed a compact pack with heads turned to the center toward each other. Whole masses of sand were stirred. The caravan was enveloped by a dusk deeper than before, and in that dusk there flew beside the riders dark and indistinct objects, as though gigantic birds or camels were dispersed with the hurricane. Fear seized the Arabs, to whom it seemed that these were the spirits of animals and men who had perished under the sands. Amid the roar and howling could be heard strange voices, similar to sobs, to laughter, to cries for help. But these were delusions. The caravan was threatened by real danger, a hundredfold greater. The Sudanese knew well that if any one of the great whirlpools, forming incessantly in the bosom of the hurricane, should catch them in its whirls, it would hurl the riders to the ground and disperse the camels, and if it should break and fall upon them, then in the twinkling of an eye an immense sandy mound would cover them in which they would remain until the next hurricane, blowing away the sand, should reveal their skeletons. Stas's head swam, his lungs seemed choked, the sand blinded him. But at times it seemed to him that he heard Nell crying and calling, so he thought only of her. Taking advantage of the fact that the camel stood in a close pack, 
and that Idris might not observe him, he determined to creep over quietly to the girl's camel, not for the purpose of escaping, but to give her assistance and encouragement. But he had barely extended his limbs from under him and stretched out his hands to grasp the edge of Nell's saddle, when the giant hand of Idris grabbed him. The Sudanese snatched him like a feather, laid him before him, and began to tie him with a palm rope, and after binding his hands, placed him across the saddle. Stas pressed his teeth and resisted as well as he could, but in vain. Having a parched throat and a mouth filled with sand, he could not convince Idris that he desired only to go to the girl's assistance and did not want to escape. After a while, however, feeling that he was suffocating, he began to shout in a stifled voice, Save the little bint! Save the little bint! But the Arabs preferred to think of their own lives. The blasts became so terrible that they could not sit on the camels, nor could the camels stand in their places. The two Bedouins, with Shamis and Geber, leaped to the ground, in order to hold the animals by cords attached to the mouthpieces under their lower jaws. Idris, shoving Stas to the rear of the saddle, did the same. The animals spread out their legs as widely as possible in order to resist the furious whirlwind, but they lacked strength, and the caravan, scourged by gravel which cut like hundreds of whips and the sand which pricked like pins, began now slowly, then hurriedly, to turn about and retreat under the pressure. At times the whirlwind tore holes under their feet, then again the sand and gravel bounding from the sides of the camels would form, in the twinkling of an eye, mounds reaching to their knees and higher. In this manner passed hour after hour. The danger became more and more terrible. Idris finally understood that the only salvation was to remount the camels and fly with the whirlwind. But this would be returning in the direction of Fayoun, where Egyptian courts and the gallows were waiting for them. Ha! It cannot be helped, thought Idris. The hurricane will also stop the pursuit, and when it ceases, we will again proceed southward. And he began to shout that they should resume their seats on the camels. But at this moment, something happened which entirely changed the situation. Suddenly, the dusky, almost black, clouds of sand were illuminated with a livid light. The darkness then became still deeper, but at the same time there arose, slumbering on high and awakened by the whirlwind, thunder. It began to roll between the Arabian and Libyan deserts. Powerful, threatening, one might say angry. It seemed as if from the heavens, mountains and rocks were tumbling down. The deafening peal intensified, grew, shook the world, began to roam all over the whole horizon. In places it burst with a force as terrible as if the shattered vault of heaven had fallen upon earth, and afterwards it again rolled with a hollow, continual rumble. Again it burst forth, again broke. It blinded with lightning, and struck with thunderbolts, descended, rose, and pealed continuously. The author heard in the vicinity of Aden thunder which lasted without intermission for half an hour. See Letters from Africa. The wind subsided as if overawed, and when, after a long time, somewhere in the immeasurable distance, the chain bolt of heaven rattled, a deadly stillness followed the thunder. But after a while in that silence, the voice of the guide resounded. God is above the whirlwind and the storm. We are saved. They started, but they were enveloped by a night so impenetrable that though the camels ran close together, the men could not see each other and had to shout aloud every little while in order not to lose one another. From time to time glaring lightning, livid or red, illuminated the sandy expanse, but afterwards fell a darkness so thick as to be almost palpable. Notwithstanding the hope, which the voice of the guide poured into the hearts of the Sudanese, uneasiness did not yet leave them, because they moved blindly, not knowing in truth in which direction they were going, whether they were moving around in a circle or were returning northward. The animals stumbled against each other every little while and could not run swiftly, and besides they panted strangely, and so loudly that it seemed to the riders that the whole desert panted from fear. Finally fell the first drops of rain, which almost always follows a hurricane, and at the same time the voice of the guide broke out amidst the darkness. Kor! They were above a ravine. The camels paused at the brink, after which they began to step carefully towards the bottom. End of chapter 8《Part One, Chapter Nine of In Desert and Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. In Desert and Wilderness by Heinrich Schenkevich. Translated by Max Anthony Dresmel. Chapter Nine. The core was wide, covered on the bottom with stones, among which grew dwarfish, thorny shrubs. A high rock full of crevices and fissures formed its southern wall. The Arabs discerned all of this by the light of quiet but more and more frequent lightning flashes. 
soon they also discovered in the rocky wall a kind of shallow cave or rather a broad niche in which people could easily be harbored and in case of a great downpour could find shelter the camels also could be comfortably lodged upon a slight elevation close by the niche the bedouins and two sudanese removed from them their burdens and saddles so that they might rest well and shamis son of shadigi occupied himself in the meantime with pulling thorny shrubs for a fire big single drops fell continually but the downpour began only when the party lay down to sleep at first it was like strings of water afterwards ropes and in the end it seemed as if whole rivers were flowing from invisible clouds such rains which occur only once in several years swell even in winter time the water of canals and the nile and in aden fill immense cisterns without which the city could not exist at all stas never in his life had seen anything like it at the bottom of the core the stream began to rumble the entrance to the niche was veiled as if by a curtain of water around could be heard only splashing and spluttering the camel stood on an elevation and the downpour at most would give them a bath nevertheless the arabs peered out every little while to see if any danger threatened the animals to the others it was agreeable to sit in the cave safe from danger by the bright fire of brushwood which was not yet soaked on their faces joy was depicted idris who immediately after their arrival had untied stas's hand so that he could eat now turned to him and smiling contemptuously said the mahdi is greater than all white sorcerers he subdued the hurricane and sent rain stas did not reply for he was occupied with nell who was barely alive first he shook the sand from her hair afterwards directed old dinah to unpack the things which she in the belief that the children were going to their parents brought with her from fayum he took a towel wet it and wiped the little girl's eyes and face with it dinah could not do this as seeing but poorly with one eye only she lost her sight almost entirely during the hurricane and washing her heated eyelids did not bring her any relief Nell submitted passively to all of stas's efforts she only gazed at him like an exhausted bird and only when he removed her shoes to spill out the sand and afterwards when he smoothed out the saddle cloths did she throw her arms around his neck his heart overflowed with great pity he felt that he was a guardian an older brother and at that time nell's only protector and he felt at the same time that he loved this little sister immensely far more than ever before he loved her indeed in port said but he regarded her as a baby so for instance it never even occurred to him to kiss her hand in bidding her good night if any one had suggested such an idea to him he would have thought that a bachelor who had finished his thirteenth year could not without derogation to his dignity and age do anything like that but at present a common distress awoke in him dormant tenderness so he kissed not one but both hands of the little girl lying down he continued to think of her and determined to perform some extraordinary deed to snatch her from captivity he was prepared for everything even for wounds and death only with this little reservation secreted in his heart that the wound should not be too painful and that the death should not be an inevitable and real death as in such case he could not witness the happiness of nell when liberated afterwards he began to ponder upon the most heroic manner of saving her but his thoughts became confused for a while it seemed to him that whole clouds of sand were burying him afterwards that all the camels were piling on his head and he fell asleep the arabs exhausted by the battle with the hurricane after attending to the camels also fell into a sound sleep the fire became extinct and a dusk prevailed in the niche soon the snores of the men resounded and from outside came the splash of the downpour and the roar of the waters clashing over the stones on the bottom of the core in this manner the night passed but before dawn stas was awakened from a heavy sleep by a feeling of cold it appeared that the water which accumulated in the fissures on the top of the rock slowly passed through some cleft in the vault of the cave and began finally to trickle onto his head the boy sat up on the saddle cloth and for some time struggled with sleep he did not realize where he was and what had happened to him after a while however consciousness returned to him aha he thought yesterday there was a hurricane and we are kidnapped and this is the cave in which we sought shelter from the rain and he began to gaze around at first he observed with astonishment that the rain had passed away and that it was not at all dark in the cave as it was illuminated by the moon which was about to set in its pale beams could be seen the whole interior of that wide but shallow niche stas saw distinctly the arabs lying beside each other and under the other wall of the cave the white dress of nell who was sleeping close to dinah and again great tenderness possessed his heart sleep now sleep he said to himself but i do not sleep and must save her after this glancing at the arabs he added in his soul ah i do want to have all these rogues suddenly he trembled 
His gaze fell upon the leather case containing the short rifle presented to him as a Christmas gift, and the cartridge boxes lying between him and Shamis, so near that it would suffice for him to stretch out his hand. And his heart began to beat like a hammer. If he could secure the rifle and boxes, he would certainly be the master of the situation. It would be enough, in that case, to slip noiselessly out of the niche, hide about fifty paces away, among the rocks, and from there watch the exit of the Sudanese and Bedouins. He thought that if they awakened and observed his absence, they would rush out of the cave together, but at that time he could with two bullets shoot down the first two, and before the others could reach him, the rifle could be reloaded. Shamis would remain, but he could take care of him. Here he pictured to himself four corpses lying in a pool of blood, and fright and horror seized his breast. To kill four men! Indeed, they were knaves, but even so it was a horrifying affair. He recollected that at one time he saw a laborer, a fella, killed by the crank of a steam dredge, and what a horrible impression his mortal remains, quivering in a red puddle, made upon him. He shuddered at the recollection. And now four would be necessary. Four! The sin and the horror! No, no, he was incapable of that. He began to struggle with his thoughts. For himself he would not do that, no. But Nell was concerned. Her protection, her salvation, and her life were involved, for she could not endure all this, and certainly would die either on the road or among the wild and brutalized hordes of dervishes. What meant the blood of such wretches beside the life of Nell, and could anyone in such a situation hesitate? For Nell! For Nell! But suddenly a thought flew like a whirlwind through Stas's mind and caused the hair to rise on his head. What would happen if any one of the outlaws placed a knife at Nell's breast and announced that he would murder her if he, Stas, did not surrender and return the rifle to them? Then answered the boy to himself, I should surrender at once. And with a realization of his helplessness, he again flung himself impotently upon the saddle cloth. The moon now peered obliquely through the opening of the cave, and it became less dark. The Arabs snored continually. Some time passed, and a new idea began to dawn in Stas's head. If, slipping out with the weapon and hiding among the rocks, he should not kill the men but shoot the camels. It would be too bad and a sad ending for the innocent animals, that is true, but what was to be done? Why, people kill animals not only to save life, but for broth and roast meat. Now it was a certainty that if he succeeded in killing four, and better still five camels, further travel would be impossible. No one in the caravan would dare to go to the villages near the banks to purchase new camels. And in such a case, Stas, in the name of his father, would promise the men immunity from punishment and even a pecuniary reward, and nothing else would remain to do but to return. Yes, but if they should not give him time to make such a promise and should kill him in the first transports of rage. They must give him time and hear him, for he would hold the rifle in his hand. He would be able to hold them at bay until he stated everything. When he had done, they would understand that their only salvation would be to surrender. Then he would be in command of the caravan and lead it directly to Bar Yusuf and the Nile. To be sure, at present, they are quite a distance from it, perhaps one or two days' journey, as the Arabs, through caution, had turned considerably into the interior of the desert. But that did not matter. There would remain, of course, a few camels, and on one of them Nell would ride. Stas began to gaze attentively at the Arabs. They slept soundly, as people exceedingly tired do, but as the night was waning, they might soon awaken. It was necessary to act at once. The taking of the cartridge boxes did not present any difficulties as they lay close by. A more difficult matter was to get the rifle which Chamis had placed at his further side. Stas hoped that he would succeed in purloining it, but he decided to draw it out of the case and put the stock and barrels together when he should be about fifty paces from the cave, as he feared that the clank of iron against iron would wake the sleepers. The moment arrived. The boy bent like an arch over Chamis and seizing the case by the handle began to transfer it to his side. His heart and pulse beat heavily, his eyes grew dim, his breathing became rapid, but he shut his teeth and tried to control his emotions. Nevertheless, when the straps of the case creaked lightly, drops of cold perspiration stood on his forehead. That second seemed to him an age, but Shamis did not even stir. The case described an arch over him and rested silently beside the box with the cartridges. Stas breathed freely. One half of the work was done. Now it was necessary to slip out of the cave noiselessly and run about fifty paces. Afterwards, to hide in a fissure, open the case, put the rifle together, load it, and fill his pockets with cartridges. The caravan then would be actually at his mercy. Stas's black silhouette was outlined on the brighter background of the cave's entrance. A second more and he would be on the outside and would hide in the rocky fissure. 
and then even though one of the outlaws should wake before he realized what had happened and before he roused the others it would be too late the boy from fear of knocking down some stone of which a large number lay at the threshold of the niche shoved out one foot and began to seek firm ground with his step and already his head leaned out of the opening and he was about to slip out wholly when suddenly something happened which turned the blood in his veins to ice amid the profound stillness pealed like a thunderbolt the joyous bark of saba it filled the whole ravine and awoke the echoes reposing in it the arabs as one man were startled from their sleep and the first object which struck their eyes was the sight of stas with the case in one hand and the cartridge box in the other ah saba what have you done end of chapter nine part one chapter ten of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by philippe in paris france in desert and wilderness by henrik schenkevich translated by max anthony dresmel Part One, Chapter Ten. With cries of horror, all in a moment rushed at Stas. In the twinkling of an eye, they wrested the rifle and cartridges from him and threw him on the ground, tied his hands and feet, striking and kicking him all the time, until finally Idris, from fear of the boy's life, drove them off. Afterwards, they began to converse in disjointed words as people do over whom had impended a terrible danger and whom only an accident had saved that is satan incarnate exclaimed idris with face pallid with fright and emotion he would have shot us like wild geese for food added gerber ah if it were not for that dog god sent him and you wanted to kill him said chamis from this time no one shall touch him he shall always have bones and water Allah, Allah, repeated Idris, not being able to compose himself. Death was upon us. Ugh. And they began to stare at Stas lying there, with hatred, but with a certain wonder that one small boy might have been the cause of their calamity and destruction. By the Prophet, spoke out one of the Bedouins, it is necessary to prevent this son of Iblis from twisting our necks. We are taking a viper to the Mahadi. What do you intend to do with him? "'We must cut off his right hand!' exclaimed Gerber. The Bedouins did not answer, but Idris would not consent to this proposition. It occurred to him that if the pursuers should capture them, a more terrible punishment would be meted to them for the mutilation of the boy. Finally, who could guarantee that Stas would not die after such an operation? In such a case, for the exchange of Fatma and her children, only Nell would remain. So when Gerber pulled out his knife with the intention of executing his threat, Idris seized him by the wrist and held it. No, he said, it would be a disgrace for five of the Mahdi's warriors to fear one Christian whelp so much as to cut off his fist. We will bind him for the night, and for that which he wanted to do, he shall receive ten lashes of the kurbash. Gerber was ready to execute the sentence at once. But Idris again pushed him away, and ordered the flogging to be done by one of the Bedouins, to whom he whispered not to hit very hard. As Chamis, perhaps out of regard for his former services with the engineers, or perhaps for some other reason, did not want to mix in the matter, the other Bedouin turned Stas over with his back up, and the punishment was about to take place when at that moment an unexpected obstacle came. At the opening of the niche, Nell appeared with Saba. Occupied with her pet, who, dashing into the cave, threw himself at once at her little feet, she had heard the shouts of the Arabs. But, as in Egypt, Arabs as well as Bedouins yell on every occasion as if they were about to annihilate each other, she did not pay any attention to them. Not until she called Stas and received no reply from him, did she go out to see whether he was not already seated on the camels. With terror she saw in the first lustre of the morning Stas lying on the ground and above him a Bedouin with a kurbash in his hand. At the sight of this she screamed with all her strength and stamped with her little feet, and when the Bedouin, not paying any attention to this, aimed the first blow, 
she flung herself forward and covered the boy with her body. The Bedouin hesitated, as he did not have an order to strike the little girl. And in the meantime her voice resounded full of despair and horror. Saba! Saba! And Saba understood what was the matter, and in one leap was in the niche. The hair bristled on his neck and back. His eyes flamed redly. In his breast and powerful throat there was a rumble as if of thunder, and afterwards the lips of his wrinkled jaws rose slowly upward, and the teeth as well as the white fangs an inch long appeared as far as the bloody gums. The giant mastiff now began to turn his head to the right and to the left, as if he wanted to display his terrible equipment to the Sudanese and Bedouins, and tell them, Look! Here is something with which I shall defend the children. They, on the other hand, retreated hurriedly, for they knew in the first place that Saba had saved their lives, and again that it was a clear thing that whoever approached Nell at that moment would have the fangs of the infuriated mastiff sunk at once in his throat. So they stood irresolute, staring with an uncertain gaze, and as if asking one another what in the present situation had better be done. Their hesitation continued so long that Nell had sufficient time to summon old Dina and order her to cut Stas's bonds. Then the boy, placing his hand on Saba's head, turned to his assailants. I did not want to kill you. Only the camels, he said through his teeth. But this information so startled the Arabs that they undoubtedly would have again rushed Stas were it not for Saba's flaming eyes and bristling hair. Gerber even started to dash towards him, but one hollow growl riveted him to the spot. A moment of silence followed, after which Idris's loud voice resounded, To the road! To the road! End of chapter 10「Part One, Chapter Eleven of In Desert and Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Philippe in Paris, France. In Desert and Wilderness by Henrik Schenkevich. Translated by Max Anthony Dresmel. Part One, Chapter Eleven. A day passed, a night, and yet another day, and they drove constantly southward, halting only for a brief time in the cores, in order not to fatigue the camels too much, to water and feed them, and also to divide their provisions and water. From fear of the pursuit, they turned yet farther to the west, for they did not have to concern themselves about water for some time. The downpour had lasted indeed no more than seven hours but it was as tremendous as if a cloudburst had occurred on the desert. Idris and Gerber, as well as the Bedouins, knew that on the beds of the cores and in those places where the rocks formed natural cavities and wells, they would, for a few days, find enough water to suffice not only for their and the camels' immediate wants, but even for replenishing their supplies. After the great rain, as usual, splendid weather followed. The sky was cloudless, and the air so transparent that the view reached over an immeasurable distance. At night, the heaven, studded with stars, twinkled and sparkled as if with thousands of diamonds. From the desert sands came a refreshing coolness. The camel humps already grew smaller, but the animals being well fed were, according to the Arabian expression, haw. That is, they were unimpaired in strength, and ran so willingly that the caravan advanced but little slower than on the first day after their departure from Garak el Sultani. Stas, with astonishment, observed that in some of the cores, in rocky fissures protected from the rain, were supplies of dura and dates. He inferred from this that before their abduction certain preparations were made, and everything was prearranged between Fatma. Idris and Gerber on one side, and the Bedouins on the other. It was also easy to surmise that both Bedouins were Mahadist adherents and believers who wanted to join their leader, 
and for that reason were easily drawn into the plot by the Sudanese. In the neighborhood of Fayum and ground Garak el Sultani, there were quite a number of Bedouins who, with their children and camels, led a migratory life on the desert, and came to Medinet and the railway stations for gain. Stas, however, had never seen these two before, and they could also not have been in Medinet, for it appeared they did not know Saba. The idea of bribing them occurred to the boy, but recollecting their shouts full of fervour whenever the name of the Mahadi was mentioned by them, he deemed this an impossibility. Nevertheless, he did not submit passively to the events, for in that boyish soul there was embedded a really astonishing energy which was inflamed by the past failures. Everything which I have undertaken, he soliloquized, ended in my getting a whipping. But even if they flog me with that kurbash every day and even kill me, I will not stop thinking of rescuing Nell and myself from the hands of these villains. If the pursuers catch them, so much the better. I, however, will act as if I did not expect them. And at the recollection of what he had met, at the thought of those treacherous and cruel people who, after snatching away the rifle, had belaboured him with fists and kicked him, his heart rebelled and rancour grew. He felt not only vanquished, but humiliated by them in his pride as a white man. Above all, however, he felt Nell's wrong, and this feeling, with the bitterness which intensified within him after the last failure, changed into an inexorable hatred of both Sudanese. He had often heard, indeed, from his father, that hatred blinds, and that only such souls yield to it as are incapable of anything better. But for the time being he could not subdue it within him, and did not know how to conceal it. He did not know to what extent Idris had observed it, and had begun to get uneasy, understanding that in case the pursuing party should capture them, he could not depend upon the boy's intercession. Idris was always ready for the most audacious deed, but as a man not deprived of reason, he thought that it was necessary to provide for everything, and in case of misfortune, to leave some gate of salvation open. For this reason, after the last occurrence, he wanted in some manner to conciliate Stas, and, with this object at first stop, he began the following conversation with him. After what you wanted to do, he said, I had to punish you as otherwise they would have killed you. But I ordered the Bedouin not to strike you hard. And when he received no reply, he after a while continued thus. Listen, you yourself have said that the white people always keep their oath. So if you will swear by your God, and by the head of that little bint that you will do nothing against us, then I will not order you to be bound for the night. Stas did not answer a single word to this, and only from the glitter of his eyes did Idris perceive that he spoke in vain. Nevertheless, notwithstanding the urging of Gerber and the Bedouins, he did not order him to be bound for the night. And when Gerber did not cease his importunities, he replied with anger, Instead of going to sleep, you will tonight stand on guard. I have decided that from this time, one of us shall watch during the sleep of the others. And in reality, a change of guards was introduced permanently from that day. This rendered more difficult and completely frustrated all plans of Stas, to whom every sentinel paid watchful attention. But on the other hand, the children were left in greater freedom, so that they could approach each other and converse without hindrance. Immediately after the first stop, Stas sat close to Nell, for he was anxious to thank her for her aid. But though he felt great gratitude to her, he did not know how to express himself, either in a lofty style or tenderly. So he merely began to shake both of her little hands. Nell, he said, you are very good and I thank you. And besides this, I frankly say that you acted like a person of at least thirteen years. On Stas's lips, words like these were the highest praise, so the heart of the little woman was consumed with joy and pride. It seemed to her at that moment that nothing was impossible. Wait till I grow up, then we shall see, she replied, throwing a belligerent glance in the direction of the Sudanese. But she did not understand the cause of the trouble and why all the Arabs rushed at Stas. 
the boy told her how he had determined to purloin the rifle kill the camels and force all to return to the river if i had succeeded he said we would now be free but they awoke asked the little girl with palpitating heart they did that was caused by saba who came running toward me barking loud enough to waken the dead then her indignation was directed against saba nasty saba nasty for this when he comes running up to me i won't speak a word to him and will tell him that he is horrid at this stas though he was not in a laughing mood laughed and asked how will you be able not to say a word to him and at the same time tell him he is horrid nell's eyebrows rose and her countenance reflected embarrassment after which she said he will know that from my looks perhaps but he is not to blame for he could not know what was happening remember also that afterwards he came to our rescue this recollection placated nell's anger a little she did not however want to grant pardon to the culprit at once that is very well she said but a real gentleman ought not to bark on greeting stas burst out laughing again neither does a real gentleman bark on leave-taking unless he is a dog and saba is one but after a while sorrow dimmed the boy's eyes he sighed once then again after which he rose from the stone on which they sat and said the worst is that i could not free you and nell raised herself on her little toes and threw her arms round his neck she wanted to cheer him she wanted with her little nose close to his face to whisper her gratitude but as she could not find the appropriate words she only squeezed his neck more tightly and kissed his ear in the meantime saba always late not so much because he was unable to keep pace with the camels but because he hunted for jackals on the way or drove away vultures perched on the crests of rocks with his barking came rushing up making his customary noise the children at the sight of him forgot about everything and notwithstanding their hard situation began their unusual caresses and play until they were interrupted by the arabs chamis gave the dog food and water after which all mounted the camels and started with the greatest speed southward End of chapter 11part 1 chapter 12 of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson in desert and wilderness by henrik sinkovich translated by max anthony dresmer chapter 12 it was their longest journey for they rode with small interruption for 18 hours only real saddle camels having a good supply of water in their stomachs could endure such a drive idris did not spare them for he really feared the pursuit he understood that it must have started long ago and he assumed that both engineers would be at its head and would not lose any time danger threatened from the direction of the river for it was certain that immediately after the abduction telegraphic orders were dispatched to all settlements on the banks directing the sheikhs to start expeditions into the interior of the desert on both sides of the nile and to detain all parties riding southward chamis assured the others that the government and engineers must have offered a large reward for their capture and that in consequence of this the desert was undoubtedly swarming with searching parties the only course to pursue would be to turn as far as possible to the west but on the west lay the great oasis of Kaga, to which dispatches also could reach and besides if they rode too far west they would lack water after a few days and death from thirst would await them and the question of food became a vital one the bedouins in the course of the two weeks preceding the abduction of the children had placed in hiding places supplies of durra biscuits and dates but only for a distance of four days journey from medinet idris with fear thought that when provision should be lacking it would be imperatively necessary 
to send men to purchase supplies at the villages on the river banks and then these men in view of the aroused vigilance and reward offered for the capture of the fugitives might easily fall into the hands of the local sheikhs and betray the whole caravan the situation was indeed difficult almost desperate and idris each day perceived more plainly upon what an insane undertaking he had ventured if we could only pass aswan if we could only pass aswan he said to himself with alarm and despair in his soul he did not indeed believe shamis who claimed that the mahdi's warriors had already reached aswan as stas denied this idris long since perceived that the white uled knew more than all of them but he supposed that beyond the first cataract where the people were wilder and less susceptible to the influences of englishmen and the egyptian government he would find more adherents of the prophet who in a case of emergency would give them succor and would furnish food and camels but it was as the bedouins reckoned about five days journey to aswan over a road which became more and more desolate and every stop visibly diminished their supplies for man and beast fortunately they could urge the camels and drive with the greatest speed for the heat did not exhaust their strength during daytime at the noon hour the sun indeed scorched strongly but the air was continually invigorating and the night so cool that stas with the consent of idris changed his seat to nell's camel desiring to watch over her and protect her from catching cold but his fears were vain as dinah whose eyes or rather i improved considerably watched with great solicitude over her little lady the boy was even surprised that the little one's health thus far did not suffer any impairment and that she bore the journey with ever decreasing stops as well as himself grief fear and the tears which she had shed from longing for her papa evidently did not harm her much perhaps her slightly emaciated and bright little countenance was tanned by the wind but in the later days of the journey she felt far less fatigued than at the beginning it is true that idris gave her the easiest carrying camel and had made an excellent saddle so that she could sleep in it lying down nevertheless the desert air which she breathed day and night mainly gave her strength to endure the hardships and irregular hours stas not only watched over her but intentionally surrounded her with a worship which notwithstanding his immense attachment to his little sister he did not at all feel for her he observed however that this affected the arabs and that they involuntarily were fortified in the conviction that they were bearing something of unheard-of value some exceptionally important female captive with whom it was necessary to act with the greatest possible care idris had been accustomed to this while at medinet so now all treated her well they did not spare water and dates for her the cruel geber would not now have dared to raise his hand against her perhaps the extraordinarily fine stature of the little girl contributed to this and also that there was in her something of the nature of a flower and of a bird and this charm even the savage and undeveloped souls of the arabs could not resist often also when at a resting place she stood by the fire fed by the roses of jericho or thorns rosy from the flame and silvery in the moonlight the sudanese as well as the bedouins could not tear their eyes from her smacking their lips from admiration according to their habit and murmuring allah mashallah bismillah the second day at noon after that long rest stas and nell who rode this time on the same camel had a moment of joyful emotion immediately after sunrise a light and transparent mist rose over the desert but it soon fell afterwards when the sun ascended higher the heat became greater than during the previous days at moments when the camels halted there could not be felt the slightest breeze so that the air as well as the sands seemed to slumber in the warmth in the light and in the stillness the caravan had just ridden upon a great monotonous level ground unbroken by cause when suddenly 
a wonderful spectacle presented itself to the eyes of the children groups of slender palms and pepper trees plantations of mandarins white houses a small mosque with projecting minaret and lower walls surrounding gardens all these appeared with such distinctness and at distance so close that one might assume that after the lapse of half an hour the caravan would be amid the trees of the oasis what is this exclaimed stas nell nell look nell rose and for a time was silent with astonishment but after a while began to cry with joy medinet to papa to papa and stas turned pale from emotion truly perhaps that is kaga but no that is medinet perhaps i recognize the minaret and even see the windmills above the wells in fact in the distance the highly elevated american windmills resembling great white stars actually glistened on the verdant background of the trees they could be seen so perfectly that stas's keen sight could distinguish the borders of the veins painted red that is medinet stas knew from books and narratives that they were on the desert phantasms known as fata morgana and that sometimes travelers happen to see oases cities tufts of trees and lakes which are nothing more than an illusion a play of light and a reflection of real distant objects but this time the phenomenon was so distinct so well-nigh palpable that he could not doubt that he saw the real medinet there was the turret upon the mudir's house there the circular balcony near the summit of the minaret from which the muezzin called to prayers there that familiar group of trees and particularly those windmills no that must be the reality it occurred to the boy that the sudanese reflecting upon their situation had come to the conclusion that they could not escape and without saying anything to him had turned back to fayum but their calmness suggested to him the first doubts if that really was fayum would they gaze upon it so indifferently they of course saw the phenomenon and pointed it out to each other with their fingers but on their faces could not be seen the least perplexity or emotion stas gazed yet once more and perhaps this indifference of the arabs caused the picture to seem fainter to him he also thought that if in truth they were returning the caravan would be grouped together and the men though only from fear would ride in a body but in the meanwhile the bedouins who by idris's order for the past few days drove considerably in advance could not be seen at all while chamis riding as a rearguard appeared at a distance not greater than a vulture lying on the ground fata morgana said stas to himself in the meantime idris approached him and shouted hey speed your camel you see medinet he evidently spoke jokingly and there was so much spite in his voice that the last hope that the real medinet was before him vanished in the boy's heart and with sorrow in his heart he turned to nell to dispel her delusion when unexpectedly an incident occurred which drew the attention of all in another direction at first a bedouin appeared running towards them at full speed and brandishing from afar a long arabian rifle which no one in the caravan possessed before that time reaching idris he exchanged a few hurried words with him after which the caravan turned precipitately into the interior of the desert but after a time the other bedouin appeared leading by a rope a fat she camel with a saddle on its hump and leather bags hanging on its sides a short conversation commenced of which stas could not catch a word the caravan in full speed made for the west it halted only when they chanced upon a narrow core full of rocks scattered in wild disorder and of fissures and caverns one of these was so spacious that the sudanese hid the people and camels in it stas although he conjectured more or less what had happened lay beside idris and pretended to sleep hoping that the arabs who thus far had exchanged but a few words about the occurrence would now begin to speak about it in fact his hope was not disappointed for immediately after pouring out fodder for the camels the bedouins and the sudanese with chamis sat down for a consultation 
Henceforth we can ride only in the night. In the daytime we will have to hide, spoke out the one-eyed Bedouin. There will be many cores now, and in each one of them we will find a safe hiding place. Are you sure that he was a sentinel? asked Idris. Allah! We spoke with him. Luckily there was only one. He stood hidden by a rock so that we could not see him, but we heard from a distance the cry of his camel. Then we slackened our speed and rode up so quietly that he saw us only when we were a few paces away. He became very frightened and wanted to aim his rifle at us. If he had fired, though he might not have killed any of us, the other sentinels would have heard the shot. So, as hurriedly as possible, I yelled to him, Halt! We are pursuing men who kidnapped two white children, and soon the whole pursuit will be here. The boy was young and foolish, so he believed us. Only he ordered us to swear on the Koran that such was the case. We got off our camels and swore, The Mahdi will absolve us. And bless you, said Idris. Speak, what did you do afterwards? Now, continued the Bedouin, when we swore, I said to the boy, but who can vouch that you yourself do not belong to the outlaws who are running away with the white children, and whether they did not leave you here to hold back the pursuit? And I ordered him also to take an oath. To this he assented, and this caused him to believe us all the more. We began to ask him whether any orders had come over the copper wire to the sheikhs, and whether a pursuit was organized. He replied, yes, and told us that a great reward was offered, and that all corps at a two days' distance from the river were guarded, and that the great barbers, steamers, with Englishmen and troops are continually floating over the river. Neither the barbers nor the troops can avail against the might of Allah and the Prophet. May it be as you say. Tell us how you finish with the boy. The one-eyed Bedouin pointed at his companion. Abu Anga he said, asked him whether there was not another sentinel nearby, and the sentinel replied that there was not. Then Abu Anga thrust his knife into the sentinel's throat so suddenly that he did not utter a word. We threw him into a deep cleft and covered him with stones and thorns. In the village they will think that he ran away to the Mahdi, for he told us that this does happen. May God bless those who run away, as he blessed you answered idris yes he did bless us retorted abu anga for we now know that we will have to keep at a three days distance from the river and besides we captured a rifle which we needed and a milk sheep camel the gourds added the one-eyed are filled with water and there is considerable millet in the sacks but we found but little powder shamis is carrying a few hundred cartridges for the white boy's rifle from which we cannot shoot Powder is always the same and can be used in ours. Saying this, Idris nevertheless pondered, and heavy anxiety was reflected in his dark face, for he understood that when once a corpse had fallen to the ground, Stas's intercession would not secure immunity for them from trial and punishment, if they should fall into the hands of the Egyptian government. Stas listened with palpitating heart and strained attention. In that conversation there were some comforting things, especially that a pursuit was organized, that a reward was offered, and that the sheikhs of the tribes on the river banks had received orders to detain caravans going southward. The boy was comforted also by the intelligence about steamers filled with English troops plying on the upper river. The dervishes of the Mahdi might cope with the Egyptian army and even defeat it, but it was an entirely different matter with English people and Stas did not doubt for a moment that the first battle would result in the total rout of the savage multitude. So, with comfort in his soul, he soliloquized thus, Even though they wish to bring us to the Mahdi, it may happen that before we reach his camp there will not be any Mahdi or his dervishes. But this solace was embittered by the thought that in such case there awaited them whole weeks of travel, which in the end must exhaust Nell's strength, and during all this time they would be forced to remain in the company of knaves and murderers. At the recollection of that young Arab, whom the Bedouins had butchered like a lamb, fear and sorrow beset Stas. 
he decided not to speak of it to nell in order not to frighten her and augment the sorrow she felt after the disappearance of the illusory picture of the oasis of fayum and the city of medinet he saw before their arrival at the ravine that tears were involuntarily surging to her eyes therefore when he had learned everything which he wished to know from the bedouin's narratives he pretended to awake and walked towards her she sat in a corner near dinah eating dates moistened a little with her tears but seeing stas she recollected that not long before he declared that her conduct was worthy of a person of at least thirteen years so not desiring to appear again as a child she bit the kernel of a date with the full strength of her little teeth so as to suppress her sobs nell said the boy medinet that was an illusion but i know for a certainty that we are being pursued so don't grieve and don't cry at this the little girl raised towards him her tearful pupils and replied in a broken voice no stas i do not want to cry only my eyes perspire so but at that moment her chin began to quiver from under her closed eyelashes big tears gushed and she wept in earnest however she was ashamed of her tears and expected a rebuke for them from stas a little from shame and a little from fear she hid her head in his bosom wetting his clothes copiously but he at once consoled her nell don't be a fountain you saw that they took away from some arab a rifle and a she-camel do you know what that means it means that the desert is full of soldiers once these wretches succeeded in trapping a sentinel but the next time they themselves will get caught a large number of steamboats are plying over the nile also why of course now we will return we will return and in a steamer to boot don't be afraid and he would have comforted her further in this manner were not his attention attracted by a strange sound coming from the outside from the sand drifts which the hurricane blew onto the bottom of the ravine it was something resembling the thin metallic notes of a reed pipe stas broke off the conversation and began to listen after a while these very thin and mournful sounds came from many sides simultaneously through the boy's mind the thought flashed that these might be arabian guards surrounding the ravine and summoning aid with their whistles his heart began to beat he glanced once and again at the sudanese hoping that he would behold consternation on their faces but no idris geber and the two bedouins calmly chewed biscuits only shamis appeared a little surprised the sounds continued after a while idris rose and looked out of the cavern returning he stopped near the children and said the sands are beginning to sing stas's curiosity was so aroused that he forgot that he had determined not to speak to idris any more and asked sands what does it mean it happens thus and means that for a long time there will be no rain but the heat will not distress us since as far as aswan we will ride only during the night and no more can be learned from him stas and nell listened long to these peculiar sounds which continued until the sun descended in the west after which night fell and the caravan started on its further journey end of chapter 12part 1 chapter 13 of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org in desert and wilderness by henrik sienkiewicz translated by max anthony dresmore part 1 chapter 13 in the daytime they hid in places concealed and difficult of access amid rocks and chasms and during the night they hurried without respite until they passed the first cataract when finally the bedouins discerned from the situation and form of the cause that aswan was behind them a great burden fell off idris's breast as they suffered already from want of water they drew nearer to the river a half day's distance there idris concealing the caravan sent all the camels with the bedouins to the nile in order to water them well and for a longer time 
Beyond Aswan, the fertile belt along the river was narrower. In some places the desert reached the river. The villages lay at a considerable distance from each other. The Bedouins therefore returned successfully, unseen by anyone, with a considerable supply of water. It was necessary now to think of provisions. As the animals had been fed sparingly during the past week, they grew lean. Their necks lengthened, their humps sank, and their legs became weak. The durra and the supplies for the people, with the greatest stint, would suffice for two days more. Idris thought, however, that they might, if not during daytime, then at night, approach the pastures on the river banks and perhaps buy biscuits and dates in some village. Saba already was given nothing at all to eat or drink, and the children hid leavings of food for him, but he somehow managed to take care of himself, and came running to the stopping places with bleeding jaws and marks of bites on his neck and breast. Whether the victim of these fights was a jackal or a hyena, or perhaps a desert fox or a gazelle, no one knew. It was enough that there were no signs of great hunger on him. At times also his black lips were moist as if he drank. The Bedouins surmised that he must have dug deep holes at the bottom of the ravines, and in this manner reached water which he scented under the ground. In this manner, travellers who get lost, dig the bottoms of chasms, and if they do not often find water, they almost always reach damp sand, and sucking it, cheat in this way the pangs of thirst. In Saba, however, considerable changes took place. He still had a powerful breast and neck, but his sides were sunken, through which he appeared taller. In his eyes, about the red and whites, there was now something savage and threatening. To Nell and to Stas, he was as attached as previously, and permitted them to do with him whatever they pleased. He still at times wagged his tail at Chamis, but he growled at the Bedouins and Sudanese, or snapped with his terrible teeth, which at such times clashed against each other like steel nails. Idris and Geber plainly begun to fear and hate him, to the extent that they would have killed him with the captured rifle, were it not that they desired to bring this extraordinary animal to Smain and were it not also that they had already passed Aswan. They had passed Aswan. Stas thought of this continually, and doubt that the pursuit would ever overtake them stole gradually into his soul. He knew, indeed, that not only Egypt proper, which ends at Wadi Haifa, that is, at the second cataract, but the whole of Nubia was up to that time in the hands of the Egyptian government. But he also understood that beyond Aswan, and particularly Wadi Haifa, the pursuit would be more difficult, and the commands of the government would be executed carelessly. His only hope was that his father, with Mr. Rawlinson, after making arrangements for the pursuit from Fayum, would go to Wadi Haifa by steamer, and there securing troops of the Camel Corps, would endeavour to intercept the caravan from the south. The boy reasoned that if he were in their place he would do just this, and for that reason he assumed that his supposition was very probable. He did not, however, abandon the thought of a rescue on his own account. The Sudanese wanted to have powder for the captured rifle, and with this object decided to disjoin a score of the rifle cartridges. So he told them that he alone was able to do that, and that if any one of them should undertake the task unskillfully, the cartridge would explode in his fingers and tear off his hands. Idris, fearing English inventions and unknown things generally, determined finally to entrust the boy with this undertaking. Stas went at it willingly, hoping in the first place that the powerful English powder at the first shot would burst the old Arabian rifle to pieces, and again that he might be able to hide a few cartridges. In fact, he succeeded more easily than he expected. Apparently they watched him at the work, but the Arabs began at once to talk among themselves, and soon they were more occupied with their conversation than with their supervision. Finally, this loquacity and inbred carelessness permitted Stas to conceal in his bosom seven cartridges. Now all that was necessary was to secure the rifle. The boy judged that beyond Wadi Haifa, the second cataract, this would not be a very difficult matter, as he foresaw that as they drew nearer their destination, the Arabs' vigilance would relax. The thought that he would have to kill the Sudanese, the Bedouins, and even Chamis always caused him to shudder. But after the murder which the Bedouins had committed, he did not have any scruples. He said to himself that the defence, liberty, and life of Nell were involved, and in view of this, the lives of his adversaries did not deserve any consideration, especially if they did not surrender and it came to a fight. But he was anxious about the short rifle. Stas resolved to secure it by stratagem, whenever the opportunity presented itself, 
and not to wait until they reached Wadi Haifa, but perform the deed as soon as possible. Accordingly, he did not wait. Two days had elapsed since they passed Aswan, and Idris finally, at the dawn of the third day, was forced to dispatch the Bedouins for provisions which were totally lacking. In view of the diminished number of adversaries, Stas said to himself, Now or never, and immediately turned to the Sudanese with the following question. Idris, do you know that the country which begins not far beyond Wadi Haifa is really Nubia? I know. I was fifteen years old, and Geba eight, when my father took us from the Sudan to Fayum, and I remember that we rode at that time on camels over the whole of Nubia. But this country still belongs to the Turks, the Egyptians. Yes, the Mahdi is only before Khartoum, and you see how foolishly Chamis chatted when he told you that the army of dervishes reached as far as Aswan. However, I shall ask you something else. Now I have read that in Nubia there are many wild animals and many brigands who do not serve anyone, and who attack alike the Egyptians and the faithful Mahdists. With what will you defend yourself if wild animals or brigands attack you? Stas purposely exaggerated in speaking of wild animals. But on the other hand, highway robberies in Nubia from the time of the war occurred quite frequently, particularly in the southern part of the country bordering on the Sudan. Idris pondered for a while over the question which surprised him, as heretofore he had not thought of these new dangers, and replied, We have knives and a rifle. Such a rifle is good for nothing. I know, yours is better, but we do not know how to shoot from it, and we will not place it in your hands. Even unloaded? Yes, for it may be bewitched. Stas shrugged his shoulders. Idris, if Geber said that, I would not be surprised, but I thought that you had more sense. From an unloaded rifle, even your Mahdi could not fire. Silence, interrupted Idris sternly. The Mahdi is able to fire even from his finger. Then you also can fire in that way. The Sudanese looked keenly into the boy's eyes. Why do you want me to give you the rifle? I want to teach you how to fire from it. Why should that concern you? A great deal, for if the brigands attack us, they might kill us all. But if you are afraid of the rifle and of me, then it does not matter. Idris was silent. In reality, he was afraid, but did not want to admit it. He was anxious, however, to get acquainted with the English weapon, for its possession and skill in its use would increase his importance in the Mardis' camp, to say nothing of the fact that it would be easier for him to defend himself in case of an attack. So after a brief consideration, he said, Good, let Chamis hand you the rifle case and you can take it out. Chamis indifferently performed the order, which Geber could not oppose, as he was occupied at some distance with the camels. Stas, with quivering hands, took out the stock and afterwards the barrels and handed them to Idris. You see, they are empty. Idris took the barrels and peered upward through them. Yes, there is nothing in them. Now observe, said Stas, this is the way to put a rifle together and saying this, he united the barrel and stock. This is the way to open it. Do you see? I will take it apart again, and you can put it together. The Sudanese, who watched Stas's motions with great attention, tried to imitate him. At first it was not easy for him, but as Arabians are well known for their skilfulness, the rifle after a while was put together. Open, commanded Stas. Idris opened the rifle easily. Close. This was done yet more easily. Now, give me two empty shells. I will teach you how to load the cartridges. The Arabs had kept the empty cartridges, as they had a value for them as brass. So Idris handed two of them to Stas, and the instruction began anew. The Sudanese at first was frightened a little by the crack of the caps of the shells, but finally became convinced that no one was able to fire from empty barrels and empty shells. In addition, his trust in Stas returned, because the boy handed the weapon to him every little while. Yes, said Stas. You already know how to put a rifle together. You know how to open, to close, and to pull the trigger. But now it is necessary for you to learn to aim. That is the most difficult thing. Take that empty water gourd and place it at a hundred paces, on those stones, and afterwards return to me. I will show you how to aim. Idris took the gourd, and without the slightest hesitation walked to the place by the stones which Stas had indicated. But before he made the first hundred steps, Stas extracted the empty shells and substituted loaded cartridges. Not only his heart, but the arteries of his temples began to throb with such a force that he thought his head would burst. The decisive moment arrived, the moment of freedom for Nell and himself, the moment of victory, terrible and at the same time desirable. 
Now Idris's life was in his hands. One pull of the trigger, and the traitor who had kidnapped Nell would fall a corpse. But Stas, who had in his veins both Polish and French blood, suddenly felt that for nothing in the world would he be capable of shooting a man in the back. Let him at least turn around and face death in the eye. And after that, what? After that, Geber would come rushing up, and before he ran ten paces he also would bite the dust. Chamis would remain, but Chamis would lose his head, and even though he should not lose it, there would be time to insert new cartridges in the barrels. When the Bedouins arrived, they would find three corpses, and meet a fate they richly deserved. After that, he would only have to guide the camels to the river. All these thoughts and pictures flew like a whirlwind through Stas's brain. He felt that what was to happen after a few minutes was at the same time horrible and imperative. The pride of a conqueror surged in his breast, with a feeling of aversion for the dreadful deed. There was a moment when he hesitated, but he recalled the tortures which the white prisoners endured. He recalled his father, Mr. Rawlinson, Nell, also Geber, who struck the little girl with a corbash, and the hatred burst out in him with renewed force. It is necessary, he said through his set teeth and inflexible determination was reflected on his countenance, which became as if carved out of stone. In the meantime, Idris placed the gourd on a stone about a hundred paces distant and turned around. Stas saw his smiling face and his whole tall form upon the plain. For the last time the thought flashed through his mind that this living man would fall after a moment upon the ground, clutching the sand with his fingers in the last convulsions of the throes of death. But the hesitation of the boy ended and when idris sauntered fifty paces towards him he began slowly to raise the weapon to his eye but before he touched the trigger with his finger from beyond the dunes about a few hundred paces distant could be heard tumultuous cheers and in the same minute about twenty riders on horses and camels debouched on the plain idris became petrified at the sight stas was amazed no less but at once amazement gave way to insane joy the expected pursuit at last yes it could not be anything else evidently the bedouins had been captured in a village and were showing where the rest of the caravan was concealed idris thought the same when he collected himself he ran to stas his face ashen from terror and kneeling at his feet began to repeat in a voice out of breath sir i was kind to you i was kind to the little bint remember that stas mechanically extracted the cartridges from the barrels and gazed the riders drove horses and camels at the fullest speed shouting from joy and flinging upward their long arabian rifles which they caught while in full gallop with extraordinary dexterity in the bright transparent air they could be seen perfectly in the middle at the van ran the two bedouins waving their hands and burnooses as if possessed after a few minutes the whole band dashed to the caravan some of the riders leapt off the horses and camels some remained on their saddles yelling at the top of their voices amid these shouts only two words could be distinguished khartoum gordon gordon khartoum finally one of the bedouins the one whom his companion called abu anga ran up to idris cringing at stas's feet and began to exclaim khartoum is taken gordon is killed the mahdi is victorious idris stood erect but did not yet believe his ears and these men he asked with quivering lips these men were to seize us but now are going together with us to the prophet stas's head swam end of chapter 13 part 1 chapter 14 of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Desert and Wilderness by Henrik Sienkiewicz Translated by Max Anthony Dresmel Part 1, Chapter 14 It was evident that the last hope of escaping during the journey had become extinct. Stas now knew that his schemes would avail nothing, that the pursuit would not overtake them and that if they endured the hardships of the journey they would reach the mahdi and would be surrendered to smain the only consolation now was the thought that they were kidnapped so that smain might exchange them for his children but when would that happen and what would they encounter before that time what dreadful misfortune awaited them among the savage hordes intoxicated with blood 
would Nell be able to endure all these fatigues and privations? This no one could answer. On the other hand, it was known that the Mahdi and his dervishes hated Christians and Europeans in general. So in the soul of the boy there was bred a fear that the influence of Smain might not be sufficient to shield them from indignities, from rough treatment, from the cruelties and the rage of the Mahdist believers, who even murdered Mohammedans loyal to the government. For the first time since the abduction, deep despair beset the boy, and at the same time some kind of vague notion that an untoward fate was persecuting them. Why, the idea itself of abducting them from Fayum and conveying them to Khartoum was sheer madness, which could only be committed by such wild and foolish men as Idris and Geber, not understanding that they would have to traverse thousands of kilometres over a country subject to the Egyptian government, or, more properly, English people. With proper methods they ought to have been caught on the second day, and nevertheless everything combined so that now they were not far from the second cataract and none of the preceding pursuing parties had overtaken them and the last one which could have detained them joined the kidnappers and from this time would aid them to stas's despair to his fears about little nell's fate was linked a feeling of humiliation that he was unequal to the situation and what was more was unable now to devise anything for even if they returned the rifle and cartridges to him he could not of course shoot all the arabs composing the caravan and he was gnawed all the more by these thoughts because deliverance had been already so near if khartoum had not fallen or if it had fallen only a few days later these same men who went over to the side of the mahdi would have seized their captors and delivered them to the government stas sitting on the camel behind idris and listening to their conversation became convinced that this undoubtedly would have happened for immediately after they proceeded upon their further journey the leader of the pursuing party began to relate to idris what induced them to commit treason to the khedive they knew previously that a great army not an egyptian now but an english one had started southward against the dervishes under the command of general wolseley they saw a multitude of steamers which carried formidable english soldiers from aswan to wadi haifa from whence a railroad was built for them to abu hamed for a long time all the sheiks on the river banks those who remained loyal to the government as well as those who in the depths of their soul favoured the mahdi were certain that the destruction of the dervishes and their prophet was inevitable for no one had ever vanquished the englishman akbar allah interrupted idris raising his hand upwards nevertheless they have been vanquished no replied the leader of the pursuing party the mahdi sent against them the tribes of the jalin barabra and jangi nearly thirty thousand in all of his best warriors under the command of musa the son of helu at abu Klea, a terrible battle took place in which god awarded the victory to the unbelievers yes it is so musa the son of helu fell and of his soldiers only a handful returned to the mahdi the souls of the others are in paradise while their bodies lie upon the sands awaiting the day of resurrection news of this spread rapidly over the nile then we thought that the english would go further south and relieve khartoum the people repeated the end the end and in the meantime god disposed otherwise how what happened asked idris feverishly what happened said the leader with a brightened countenance why, in the meantime, the Mahdi captured Khartoum, and during the assault, Gordon's head was cut off, and as the Englishmen were concerned only about Gordon, learning of his death, they immediately returned to the north. Allah! We again saw the steamers with the stalwart soldiers floating down the river, but did not understand what it meant. The English published good news immediately and suppressed bad. Some of our people said that the Mahdi had already perished but finally the truth came to the surface this region belongs yet to the government in wadi haifa and further as far as the third and perhaps the fourth cataract the soldiers of the khedive can be found nevertheless after the retirement of the english troops we believe now that the mahdi will subdue not only nubia and egypt not only mecca and medina but the whole world for that reason instead of capturing you and delivering you to the hands of the government we are going together with you to the prophet so orders came to capture us 
to all the villages, to all the sheiks, to the military garrisons, wherever the copper wire over which fly the commands of the Khedive does not reach, there came the Zabdis, gendarmes, with the announcement that whoever captures you will receive one thousand pounds reward. Mashallah, that is great wealth, great. Idris glanced suspiciously at the speaker. But you prefer the blessing of the Mahdi? Yes, he captured such immense booty and so much money in Khartoum that he measures the Egyptian pounds in fodder sacks and distributes them among his faithful. Nevertheless, if the Egyptian troops are yet in Wadi Haifa and further, they may seize us on the way. No, it is necessary only to hurry before they recover their wits. Now, since the retreat of the Englishmen, they have lost their heads entirely, the sheiks loyal to the government as well as the soldiers and Zabdis all think that the mahdi at any moment will arrive for that reason those of us who in our souls favoured him are now running to him boldly and nobody is pursuing us for in the first moments no one is issuing orders and no one knows whom to obey yes replied idris you say truly that it is necessary to hurry before they recover their wits since khartoum is yet far for an instant a faint gleam of hope glimmered again for stars if the egyptian soldiers up to that time occupied various localities on the banks in nubia then in view of the fact that the english troops had taken all the steamers they would have to retreat before the mahdi's hordes by land in such case it might happen that the caravan would encounter some retreating detachment and might be surrounded stas reckoned also that before the news of the capture of khartoum circulated among the arabian tribes north of wadi haifa considerable time would elapse the more so as the egyptian government and the english people suppressed it he therefore assumed that the panic which must have prevailed among the egyptians in the first moment must have already passed away to the inexperienced boy it never occurred that in any event the downfall of khartoum and the death of gordon would cause people to forget about everything else and that the sheiks loyal to the government as well as the local authorities would now have something else to do than to think of rescuing two white children and in fact the arabs who joined the caravan did not fear the pursuit very much they rode with great haste and did not spare the camels but they kept close to the nile and often during the night turned to the river to water the animals and to fill the leather bags with water at times they ventured to ride to the villages even in the daytime for safety they sent in advance for scouting a few men who under the pretext of buying provisions inquired for news of the locality whether there were any egyptian troops near by and whether the inhabitants belonged to the loyal Turks. If they met residents secretly favouring the Mahdi, then the entire caravan would visit the village, and often it happened that it was increased by a few or even a dozen or more young Arabs who also wanted to fly to the Mahdi. Idris learned also that almost all the Egyptian detachments were stationed on the side of the Nubian desert, therefore on the right, the eastern side of the Nile in order to avoid an encounter with them it was necessary only to keep to the left bank and to pass by the larger cities and settlements this indeed lengthened their route a great deal for the river beginning at wadi haifa forms a gigantic arch inclining far towards the south and afterwards again curving to the northeast as far as abu hamed where it takes a direct southern course but on the other hand this left bank particularly from the oasis of selimé was left almost entirely unguarded the journey passed merrily for the sudanese in an increased company with an abundance of water and supplies passing the third cataract they ceased even to hurry and rode only at night hiding during the day among sandy hills and ravines with which the whole desert was intersected a cloudless sky now extended over them grey at the horizon's edges bulging in the centre like a gigantic cupola silent and calm with each day however the heat in proportion to their southward advance became more and more terrible and even in the ravines in the deep shade it distressed the people and the beasts on the other hand the nights were very cool they scintillated with twinkling stars which formed as it were greater and smaller clusters stars observed that they were not the same constellations which shone at night over port said at times he had dreamed of seeing some time in his life the southern cross and finally beheld it beyond el orde but at present its lustre proclaimed to him his own misfortune for a few nights there shone for him the pale scattered and sad zodiacal light which after the waning of the evening twilight silvered until a late hour the western side of the sky end of chapter fourteen
Part One, Chapter Fifteen of In Desert and Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. In Desert and Wilderness by Henrik Schenkiewicz. Translated by Max Anthony Dresmel. Part One, Chapter Fifteen. In two weeks after starting from the neighbourhood of Wadi Haifa, the caravan entered upon the region subdued by the Mahdi. They speedily crossed the hilly Jazira desert, and near Shendi, where previously the English forces had completely routed Musa Uled of Helu, they rode into a locality entirely unlike the desert. Neither sands nor dunes could be seen here. As far as the eye could reach, stretched a step overgrown in part by green grass and in part by a jungle amid which grew clusters of thorny acacias yielding the well-known sudanese gum while here and there stood solitary gigantic nabuk trees so expansive that under their boughs a hundred people could find shelter from the sun from time to time the caravan passed by high pillar-like hillocks of termites or white ants with which tropical africa is strewn the verdure of the pasture and the acacias agreeably charmed the eyes after the monotonous tawny-hued sands of the desert in the places where the steppe was a meadow herds of camels pastured guarded by the armed warriors of the mahdi at the sight of the caravan they started up suddenly like birds of prey rushed towards it surrounded it from all sides and shaking their spears and at the same time yelling at the top of their voices they asked the men from whence they came why they were going southward and whither they were bound at times they assumed such a threatening attitude that idris was compelled to reply to their questions in the greatest haste in order to avoid attack stas who had imagined that the inhabitants of the sudan differed from other arabs residing in egypt only in this that they believed in the mahdi and did not want to acknowledge the authority of the khedive perceived that he was totally mistaken the greater part of those who every little while stopped the caravan had skins darker than even idris and geber and in comparison with the two bedouins were almost black the negro blood in them predominated over the arabian their faces and breasts were tattooed and the prickings represented various designs or inscriptions from the koran some were almost naked others wore jubhas or wrappers of cotton texture sewed out of patches of various colours a great many had twigs of coral or pieces of ivory in their pierced nostrils lips and ears the heads of the leaders were covered with caps of the same texture as the wrappers and the heads of common warriors were bare but not shaven like those of the arabs in egypt on the contrary they were covered with enormous twisted locks often singed red with lime with which they rubbed their tufts of hair for protection against vermin their weapons were mainly spears terrible in their hands but they did not lack remington carbines which they had captured in their victorious battles with the egyptian army and after the fall of khartoum the sight of them was terrifying and their behaviour towards the caravan was hostile for they suspected that it consisted of egyptian traders whom the mahdi in the first moments after the victory prohibited from entering the sudan having surrounded the caravan they pointed the spears with tumult and menace at the breasts of the people or aimed carbines at them to this hostile demonstration idris answered with a shout that he and his brother belonged to the dongolese tribe the same as that of the mahdi and that they were conveying to the prophet two white children as slaves this alone restrained the savages from violence in stas when he came in contact with this dire reality the spirit withered at the thought of what awaited them on the ensuing days idris also who previously had lived long years in a civilized community had never imagined anything like this he was pleased when one night they were surrounded by an armed detachment of the emir nur el tadhil and conducted to khartoum nur el tadhil before he ran away to the mahdi was an egyptian officer in a negro regiment of the khedive so he was not so savage as the other mahdists and idris could more easily make himself understood but here disappointment awaited him he imagined that his arrival at the mahdi's camp with the white children would excite admiration if only on the account of the extraordinary hardships and dangers of the journey he expected that the mahdists would receive him with ardour with open arms and lead him in triumph to the prophet who would lavish gold and praises upon him as a man who had not hesitated to expose his head in order to serve his relative fatma 
In the meantime, the Mardis placed spears at the breasts of the members of the caravan, and Nur el Tardhil heard quite indifferently his narrative of the journey. And finally, to the question whether he knew Smain, the husband of Fatma, answered, No. In Omdurman and Khartoum there are over one hundred thousand warriors, so it is easy not to meet one another, and not all the officers are acquainted with each other. The domain of the Prophet is immense, therefore many emirs rule in distant cities in Senar, in Kordovan, and Darfur, and around Fashoda. It may be that this Smain, of whom you speak, is not at present at the Prophet's side. Idris was nettled by the slighting tone with which Nur spoke of this Smain, so he replied with a shade of impatience, Smain is married to a first cousin of the Mahdi, and therefore Smain's children are relatives of the Prophet. Nur el Tadhil shrugged his shoulders. The Mahdi has many relatives, and cannot remember all of them. For some time they rode in silence, after which Idris again asked, How soon shall we arrive at Khartoum? Before midnight, replied el Tadhil, gazing at the stars which began to appear in the eastern part of the heavens. Shall we at that late hour be able to obtain food and fodder? Since our last rest at noon we have not eaten anything. You will pass this night with me, and I shall feed you in my house, but to-morrow in Omdurman you shall have to seek for food yourself, and I warn you in advance that this will not be an easy matter. Why? Because we have a war. The people for the past few years have not tilled the fields, and have lived solely upon meat, so that when finally cattle were lacking, famine came. There is famine in all the Sudan, and a sack of dura today costs more than a slave. Allah Akbar! exclaimed Idris with surprise. I saw, nevertheless, herds of camels and cattle on the steppes. They belong to the Prophet, to the noble, that is, the noble brothers and relatives of the Mahdi, and to the Caliphs, yes, the Dongolisi from which tribe the Mahdi came, and the Bagara, whose leader is the chief Caliph, Abdullahi, have still quite numerous herds, but for other tribes it has become more and more difficult to live in the world. Here Nur el Tadhil patted his stomach and said, in the service of the Prophet I have a higher rank, more money, and a greater authority, but I had a fuller stomach in the Khedive's service. But, realizing that he might have said too much, after a while he added, But all this will change when the true faith conquers. Idris, hearing these words, involuntarily thought that nevertheless in Fayum, in the service of the Englishman, he had never suffered from hunger, and gains could be more easily secured, so he was cast into a deep gloom after which he began to ask further. Are you going to transport us tomorrow to Omdurman? Yes. Khartoum by command of the Prophet is to be abandoned, and very few reside there. They are raising the large buildings and conveying the bricks with the other booty to Omdurman. The Prophet does not wish to live in a place polluted by unbelievers. I shall beat my forehead before him tomorrow, and he will command that I be supplied with provisions and fodder. Ha! Huh. If in truth you belong to the Dongolisi, then perhaps you might be admitted to his presence. But know this, that his house is guarded day and night by a hundred men equipped with corbashes, and these do not spare blows to those who crave to see the Mahdi without permission. Otherwise, the swarm would not give the holy man a moment of rest. Allah, I even saw Dongolisi with bloody welts on their backs. Idris with each moment was possessed by greater disillusionment. So the faithful did not see the Prophet? he asked. The faithful see him daily at the place of prayer, where, kneeling on a sheep's hide, he raises his hands to God, or when he instructs the swarm and strengthens them in the true faith. But it is difficult to reach and speak with him, and whoever attains that happiness is envied by all, for upon him flows the divine grace which wipes away his former sins. A deep night fell, and with it came a piercing chill. In the ranks resounded the snorting of horses. The sudden change from the daily heat to cold was so strong that the hides of the steeds began to reek, and the detachment rode as if in a mist. Stas, behind Idris, leaned towards Nell and asked, Do you feel cold? No, answered the little girl, but no one will protect us now. And tears stifled her further words. This time he did not find any comfort for her for he himself was convinced that there was no salvation for them. Now they rode over a region of wretchedness, famine, bestial cruelties, and blood. They were like two poor little leaves in a storm which bore death and annihilation, not only to the heads of individuals, but to whole towns and entire tribes, 
what hand could snatch from it and save two small defenceless children the moon rolled high in the heaven and changed as if into silvery feathers the mimosa and acacia twigs in the dense jungles resounded here and there the shrill and at the same time mockingly mirthful laugh of the hyenas which in that gory region found far too many corpses from time to time the detachment conducting the caravan encountered other patrols and exchanged with them the agreed countersign they came to the hills on the river banks and through a long pass reached the nile the people and the camels embarked upon wide and flat dahabiyas and soon the heavy oars began with measured movements to break and ruffle the smooth river's depth strewn with starry diamonds after the lapse of half an hour on the southern side on which the dahabiyas floated upon the water flashed lights which as craft approached them changed into sheaves of red lustre lying on the water nur el tadhil shook idris's arm after which stretching out his hand before him he said khartoum End of part one chapter fifteen part one chapter sixteen of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by k hand in desert and wilderness by heinrich shankovitz translated by max anthony dresmel chapter sixteen they stopped at the city's limits in a house which formerly was the property of a rich Italian merchant, and after his murder during the assault upon the city, had fallen to Tadil at the division of the spoils. The wives of the emir, in quite a humane manner, took charge of Nell, who was barely alive after the rough treatment, and, though in all Khartoum could be felt a want of provisions, they found for the little Jan a few dried dates and a little rice with honey after which they led her upstairs and put her to bed stas who passed the night among the camels and horses in the courtyard had to be content with one biscuit on the other hand he did not lack water for the fountain in the garden by a strange chance was not wrecked notwithstanding great weariness he could not sleep first on account of scorpions creeping incessantly over the saddle cloth on which he lay and again on account of a mortal dread that they would separate him from nell and that he would not be able to watch over her personally this uneasiness was evidently shared by saba who sent it about and from time to time howled all of which enraged the soldiers stas quieted him as well as he could from fear that some injury might be done to him fortunately the giant mastiff aroused such admiration in the emir himself and in all the dervishes that no one lifted a hand against him idris also did not sleep from the previous day he had felt unwell and besides after the conversation with nur el tadhil he lost many of his delusions and gazed at the future as though through a thick veil he was glad that on the morrow they would be transported to omdurman which was separated from khartoum only by the width of the white nile he had a hope that he would find smain there but what further during the journey everything had presented itself to him somewhat more distinctly and far more splendidly he sincerely believed in the prophet and his heart was drawn all the more to him because both came from the same tribe but in addition he was like almost every arab covetous and ambitious he had dreamed that he would be loaded with gold and made an emir at last he had dreamed of military expeditions against the turks of captured cities and spoils now after what he had heard from el tadhil he began to fear whether in the presence of far greater events all his acts would not fade into insignificance just as a drop of rain disappears into the sea perhaps he thought with bitterness nobody will pay attention to what i have accomplished and smain will not even be pleased that i have brought those children to him and he was gnawed by this thought the morrow was to dispel or confirm those fears so he awaited it with impatience the sun rose at six o'clock and the bustle among the dervishes began nur el tadhil soon appeared and ordered them to prepare for the journey he declared at the same time that they would go to the ferry on foot beside his horse to stas's great joy dinah led nell from an upper floor after which they proceeded on the rampart skirting the whole city as far as the place at which the ferry boats stopped nur el tadhil rode ahead on horseback 
Stas escorted Nell by the hand. After them came Idris, Gebher, and Shamis, with Dinah and Saba, as well as thirty of the emir's soldiers. The rest of the caravan remained in Khartoum. Stas, glancing around, could not understand how a city so strongly fortified and lying in a fork formed by the White and Blue Niles, and therefore surrounded on three sides by water and accessible only from the south, could fall. Only later did he learn from a Christian slave that the river at the time had subsided and left a wide, sandy strip, which facilitated access to the ramparts. The garrison, losing hope of relief and reduced by hunger, could not repel the assault of infuriated savages, and the city was captured, after which a massacre of the inhabitants took place. Traces of the battle, though a month had already elapsed since the assault, could everywhere be seen along the ramparts. On the inside protruded the ruins of raised buildings against which the first impetus of the victors had been directed, and on the outside the moat was full of corpses, which no one thought of burying. Before they reached the ferry, Stas counted over four hundred. They did not, however, infect the air as the Sudanese sun dried them up like mummies. All had the hue of gray parchment and were so much alike that the bodies of the Europeans, Egyptians, and Negroes could not be distinguished from each other. Amid the corpses swarmed small gray lizards, which, at the approach of men, quickly hid under those human remains and often in the mouths or between the dried-up ribs. Stas walked with Nell in such a manner as to hide this horrible sight from her, and told her to look in the direction of the city. But from the side of the city many things transpired which struck the eyes and soul of the little girl with terror. The sight of the English children taken into captivity, and of Saba led with a leash by Shamus, attracted a throng, which, as the procession proceeded to the ferry, increased with each moment. The throng after a certain time became so great that it was necessary to halt. From all sides came threatening outcries. Frightfully tattooed faces leaned over Stas and over Nell. Some of the savages burst into laughter at the sight of them and from joy slapped their hips with the palms of their hands. Others cursed them. Some roared like wild beasts, displaying their white teeth and rolling their eyes. Finally they began to threaten and reach out towards them with knives. Nell, partly unconscious from fright, clung to Stas while he shielded her as well as he knew how, in the conviction that their last hour was approaching. Fortunately, this persistent molestation of the brutal swarm at last disgusted even Nur el Tadhil. By his command, between ten and twenty soldiers surrounded the children, while the others began without mercy to scourge the howling mob with cowerbashes. The concourse dispersed hurriedly. But on the other hand, a mob began to gather behind the detachment, and amid wild shrieks accompanied it to the boat. The children breathed more freely during the passage over the river. Stas comforted Nell with the statement that when the dervishes became accustomed to the sight of them, they would cease their threats, and he assured her that Smain would protect and defend both of them, and particularly her, for if any evil should befall them, he would not have anyone to exchange for his children. This was the truth, but the little girl was so terror-stricken by the previous assaults that, having seized Stas's hand, she did not want to let go of it for a moment, repeating continually as if in a fever, I am afraid, I am afraid. He, with his whole soul, wished to get as soon as possible into the hands of Smain, who knew them of old, and who in ports said, had displayed great friendship towards them, or at least had pretended to display it. At any rate, he was not so wild as the other Dongolese of the Sudan, and captivity in his house would be more endurable. The only concern now was whether they would find him in Omdurman. Of this Idris spoke with Nur el Tadhil, who at last recollected that a year before, while tarrying by the order of the Caliph Abdulhali of Kordofan, far from Khartoum, he had heard of a certain Smain who taught the dervishes how to fire from the cannons captured from the Egyptians, and afterwards became a slave hunter. Nur suggested to Idris the following method of finding him. At noon, when you hear the sound of the Umbajas, be with the children at the place of prayer, to which the Mahdi repairs daily to edify the faithful with an example of piety, and to fortify them in the faith. There, besides the sacred person of the Mahdi, you will behold all the nobles, and also the three caliphs, as well as the pashas and emirs. Among the emirs you may find Smain. But what am I to do, and where shall I stay until the time of the afternoon prayer? You will remain with my soldiers. 
and will you nur el tadhil leave us i am going for orders to the caliph abdullah is he the greatest of caliphs i have come from far and though the names of the commanders have reached my ears nevertheless you may instruct me more definitely about them abdullah my commander is the mahdi's sword may allah make him the son of victory for some time the boat floated in silence there could be heard only the grating of the oars on the boat's edges and once in a while a splash of water by a crocodile struck in the tail many of these ugly reptiles had swam down from the south to khartoum where they found an abundance of food for the river teemed with corpses not only of the people who were slaughtered after the capture of the city but also of those who died of diseases which raged amidst the modests and particularly among the slaves the commands of the caliphs prohibited indeed the contamination of the water but they were not heated and the bodies which the crocodiles did not devour floated with the water face downward to the sixth cataract even as far as Bieber. but idris thought of something else and after a while said this morning we did not get anything to eat i do not know whether we can hold out from hunger until the hour of prayer and who will feed us later you are not a slave replied tadhil and can go to the marketplace where merchants display their supplies there you can obtain dried meat and sometimes donchnu millet but for a high price as i told you famine reigns in amdoran but in the meantime wicked people will seize and kill those children the soldiers will protect them and if you give money to any one of them he will willingly go for provisions this advice did not please idris who had a greater desire to take money than to give it to any one but before he was able to make reply the boat touched the bank to the children amdurman appeared different from khartoum in the latter place there were houses of several stories built of brick and stone there was a murdira that is a governor's palace in which the heroic gordon had perished there were a church a hospital missionary buildings an arsenal great barracks for the troops and a large number of greater and smaller gardens with magnificent tropical plants amdorman on the other hand seemed rather a great encampment of savages the fort which stood on the northern side of the settlement had been raised by command of gordon as a whole as far as the eye could reach the city consisted of circular conical huts of dotch new straw narrow thorny little fences separated these huts from each other and from the streets here and there could be seen tents evidently captured from the egyptians elsewhere a few palm mats under a piece of dirty linen stretched upon bamboo constituted the entire residence the population sought shelter under the roofs during rain or exceptional heat for the rest they passed their time built fires cooked food lived and died out of doors so the streets were so crowded that in places the detachment with difficulty forced its way through the multitude formerly amdurman was a wretched village at present counting the ives over two hundred thousand people were huddled in it even the mahdi and his caliphs were perturbed by this vast concourse which was threatened with famine and disease they continually dispatched to the north expeditions to subjugate localities and cities loyal yet to the egyptian government at the sight of the white children here also resounded unfriendly cries but at least the rabble did not threaten with the death it might be that they did not dare to being so close to the prophet's side and perhaps because they were more accustomed to the sight of prisoners who were all transported to amdorman immediately after the capture of khartoum stas and nell however saw hell on earth they saw europeans and egyptians lashed with cowabashes until they bled hungry thirsty bending under burdens which they were commanded to carry or under buckets of water they saw european women and children who were reared in affluence at present begging for a handful of dura or a shred of meat covered with rags emaciated resembling spectres with faces swarthy from want on which dismay and despair had settled and with a bewildered stare they saw how the savages burst into laughter at the sight of these unfortunates how they pushed and beat them on all the streets and alleyways there were not lacking sights from which the eyes turned away with horror and aversion in Omdurman, dysentery and typhoid fever and above all smallpox raged in a virulent form the sick covered with sores lay at the entrances of the hovels infecting the air the prisoners carried wrapped in linen the bodies of the newly dead to bury them in the sand beyond the city where the real charge of the funeral was assumed by hyenas 
above the city hovered flocks of vultures from whose wings fell melancholy shadows upon the illuminated sand stas witnessing all this thought that the best for him and nell would be to die as soon as possible nevertheless in this sea of human wretchedness and malice there bloomed at times compassion as a pale flower blooms in a putrid marsh in Amdorman there were a few Greeks and Copts whom the Mahdi had spared because he needed them. These not only walked about freely but engaged in trade and various affairs, and some, especially those who pretended to change their faith, were even officers of the Mahdi, and this gave them considerable importance among the wild dervishes. One of these Greeks stopped the detachment and began to question the children as to how they happened to be there. Learning with amazement that they had just arrived, and that they had been kidnapped from far away Fayum, he promised to speak about them to the Mahdi, and to inquire about them in the future. In the meantime, he nodded his head compassionately at Nell, and gave to each a few handfuls of dried wild figs, and a silver dollar with an image of Maria Theresa, after which he admonished the soldiers not to dare to do any harm to the little girl, and he left, repeating in English, Poor little bird. End of Part 1 Chapter 16Part One, Chapter Seventeen of In Desert and Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. In Desert and Wilderness by Heinrich Schenkewitz. Translated by Max Anthony Dresmel. Chapter Seventeen. Through tortuous little streets they finally arrived at the marketplace, which was situated in the center of the city. On the way they saw many men with a hand or foot cut off. They were thieves or transgressors who had concealed booty. The punishment meted by the caliphs for disobedience or violation of the laws promulgated by the prophet was horrible, even for a trivial offense, such as smoking tobacco. The delinquent was whipped with cowerbashes until he bled or became unconscious but the caliphs themselves observed these commands only seemingly at home they indulged in everything so that the penalties fell upon the poor who at one blow were despoiled of all their goods afterwards there remained for them nothing to do but beg and as in omdurman there was a scarcity of provisions they died of starvation a large number of beggars also swarmed around the provision stalls the first object, however, which attracted the attention of the children was a human head fastened on a high bamboo set up in the center of the marketplace. The face of this head was dried up and almost black, while the hair on the skull and chin was white as milk. One of the soldiers explained to Idris that that was Gordon's head. Stas, when he heard this, was seized by fathomless sorrow, indignation, and a burning desire for revenge. At the same time, terror froze the blood in his veins thus had perished that hero that night without fear and without reproach a man just and kind who was loved even in the sudan and the english people had not come in time to his aid and later retired leaving his remains without a christian burial to be thus dishonored stas at that moment lost his faith in the english people heretofore he naively believed that england for an injury to one of her citizens was always ready to declare war against the whole world at the bottom of his soul there had lain a hope that in behalf of Rawlinson's daughter, after the unsuccessful pursuit, formidable English hosts would be set in motion even as far as Khartoum and farther. Now he became convinced that Khartoum and that whole region was in the hands of the Mahdi, and that the Egyptian government and England were thinking rather of preserving Egypt from further conquests than of delivering the European prisoners from captivity. He understood that he and Nell had fallen into an abyss from which there was no escape, and these thoughts, linked with the horrors which he witnessed on the streets of Omdurman, disheartened him completely. His customary energy gave way to total passive submission to fate and a dread of the future. In the meantime he began aimlessly to gaze about the marketplace and at the stalls at which Idris was bargaining for provisions. The hucksters, mainly Sudanese women and negresses, sold jubhas here, that is, white linen gowns, pieced together with many colored patches, akea gum, hollow gourds, glass beads, sulfur, and all kinds of mats. There were a few stalls with provisions, and around all of them the throng pressed. The modists bought at high prices, principally dried strips of meat of domestic animals, 
likewise of buffaloes antelopes and giraffes dates figs manioc and dura were totally lacking they sold here and there water and honey of wild bees and grains of dochnu soaked in a decoction of tamarind fruit idris fell into despair for it appeared that in view of the prevailing market prices he would soon exhaust all the money he had received from fatma Semain for living expenses and afterwards would in all probability have to beg his only hope now was in Smain, and strangely enough stas also relied solely upon Smain's assistance after a lapse of an hour nur el tadhil returned from the caliph abdullah evidently he had met with some kind of disagreeable mishap there for he returned in a bad humor so when idris asked him if he had learned anything about smain he replied testily fool do you think that the caliph and i have nothing better to do than seek smain for you well what are you going to do with me do what you please i give you a night's lodging in my house and a few words of good advice and now i do not want to know anything more about you that is well but where shall i find shelter it is all the same to me saying this he took the soldiers and went away with great difficulty idris prevailed upon him to send to the market-place the camels and the rest of the caravan including those arabs who had joined it between asuan and wadi haifa these people did not come until the afternoon and it appeared that none of them knew what they were going to do the two bedouins began to quarrel with idris and gebher claiming that they had promised them an entirely different reception and that they had cheated them after a long dispute and much deliberation they finally decided to erect at the outskirts of the city huts of dachnu boughs and reeds as shelter during the night and for the rest to depend upon the will of providence and wait after the erection of the huts which employment does not require much time from sudanese and negroes all excepting chamis who was to prepare the supper repaired to the place of public prayer it was easy for them to find it as the swarm of all Amdurman was bound thither the place was spacious encircled partly by a thorny fence and partly by a clay enclosure which was being built in the center stood a wooden platform the prophet ascended it whenever he desired to instruct the people in front of the platform were spread upon the ground sheep hides for the mahdi the caliphs and eminent sheiks planted at the sides were the flags of emirs which fluttered in the air displaying all colors and looking like great flowers the four sides were surrounded by the compact ranks of dervishes around could be seen a bold numberless forest of spears with which almost all the warriors were armed it was real good fortune for idris and gebhir and for the other members of the caravan that they were taken for a retinue of one of the emirs for that reason they could press forward to the first rows of the assembled throng the arrival of the mahdi was announced by the beautiful and solemn notes of umbajas but when he appeared there resounded the shrill notes of fifes the beating of drums the rattle of stones shaken in empty gourds and whistling on elephants teeth all of which combined created an infernal din the swarm was swept by an indescribable fervor some threw themselves on their knees others shouted with all their strength o oh, messenger of god o oh, victorious O oh, merciful O oh, gracious this continued until the Mahdi entered the pulpit then a dead stillness fell when he raised his hands placed his big fingers to his ears and for some time prayed the children did not stand far away and could see him well he was a middle-aged man prodigiously obese as though bloated and almost black stas who had an unusually keen sight perceived that his face was tattooed in one ear he wore a big ivory ring he was dressed in a white jubha and had a white cap on his head his feet were bare as on mounting the platform he shook off red half boots and left them on the sheep's hide on which he was afterwards to pray there was not the least luxury in his clothing only at times the wind carried a strong sandal scent which the faithful present inhaled eagerly through their nostrils at the same time they rolled their eyes from joy on the whole stas had pictured differently this terrible prophet plunderer and murderer of so many thousand people and looking now at the fat face with its mild look with eyes suffused with tears and with a smile as though grown to those lips he could not overcome his astonishment he thought that such a man ought to bear on his shoulders the head of a hyena or a crocodile and instead he saw before him a chubby-faced gourd resembling drawings of a full moon but the prophet began his instruction 
his deep and resonant voice could be heard perfectly all over the place so that his words reached the ears of all the faithful he first spoke of the punishments which god meted out to those who disobeyed the commands of the mahdi and hide booty get intoxicated upon marissa spare the enemy in battles and smoke tobacco on account of these crimes allah sends upon the sinners famine and that disease which changes the face into a honeycomb smallpox temporal life is like a leaky leather bottle riches and pleasures are absorbed in the sand which buries the dead only faith is like a cow which gives sweet milk but paradise will open only for the victorious whoever vanquishes the enemy wins for himself salvation whoever dies for the faith will rise from the dead for eternity happy a hundredfold more happy are those who have already fallen we want to die for the faith answered the swarm in one tumultuous shout and for a while an infernal uproar again prevailed the umbanjas and drums sounded the warriors struck sword against sword spear against spear the martial ardor spread like a flame some cried the faith is victorious others to paradise through death stas now understood why the egyptian army could not cope with this wild host when the hubbub had somewhat subsided the prophet resumed his address he told them of his visions and of the mission which he had received from god allah commanded him to purify the faith and spread it over the entire world whoever does not acknowledge him as the mahdi the redeemer is condemned to damnation the end of the world is already near but before that time it is the duty of the faithful to conquer egypt mecca and all those regions beyond the seas where the gentiles dwell such is the divine will which nothing can change a great deal of blood will flow yet many warriors will not return to their wives and children under their tents but the happiness of those who fall no human tongue can describe after which he stretched out his arms towards the assembled throng and concluded thus therefore i the redeemer and servant of god bless this holy war and you warriors i bless your toils wounds death i bless victory and weep over you like a father who has conceived an affection for you and he burst into a flood of tears when he descended from the pulpit a roar and a clamor resounded weeping became general below the two caliphs abdulli and ali uled helu took the prophet under the arms and escorted him to the sheep hide on which he knelt during this brief moment idris asked stas feverishly whether smain was not among the emirs no replied the boy who vainly sought the familiar face with his eyes i do not see him anywhere perhaps he fell at the capture of khartoum the prayers lasted long during these the mahdi threw his arms and legs about like a buffoon or raised his eyes in rapture repeating lo it is he lo it is he and the sun began to decline towards the west when he rose and left for his home the children now could be convinced with what reverence the dervishes surrounded their prophet for the crowds eagerly followed him and scratched up the places where his feet touched they even quarreled and came to blows for they believed that such earth protected the healthy and healed the sick the place of prayer was vacated gradually idris himself did not know what to do and was about to return with the children and his whole party to the huts and to shemis for the night when unexpectedly there stood before him that same greek who in the morning had given stas and nell each a dollar and a handful of wild figs i spoke with the mahdi about you he said in arabian and the prophet desires to see you thanks to allah and to you sir exclaimed idris shall we find smain at the prophet's side smain is in fashoda answered the greek after which he addressed stas in the english language it may be that the prophet will take you under his protection as i endeavored to persuade him to do i told him that the fame of his mercy would then spread among all the white nations here terrible things are taking place and without his protection you will perish from starvation and want of comforts from sickness or at the hands of madmen but you must reconcile him and that depends on you what am i to do stas asked in the first place when you appear before him throw yourself upon your knees and if he should tender his hand kiss it with reverence and beseech him to take you two under his wings here the greek broke off and asked do any of the men understand english no idris and gebher only understand a few simple words and the others not even that that is well so listen further for it is necessary to anticipate everything now the mahdi will in all probability ask you whether you are ready to accept his faith 
answer at once that you are and that at the sight of him from the first glance of the eye an unknown light of grace flowed upon you remember an unknown light of grace that will flatter him and he will enroll you among his mazalams that is among his personal servants you will then enjoy plenty and all the comforts which will shield you from sickness if you should act otherwise you would endanger yourself that poor little creature and even me who wishes your good do you understand stas set his teeth and did not reply but his face was icy and his eyes flashed up sullenly seeing which the greek continued thus i know my boy that this is a disagreeable matter but it cannot be helped all of those who were saved after the massacre and khartoum accepted the mahdi's doctrines only a few catholic missionaries and nuns did not assent to it but that is a different matter the quran prohibits the slaughter of priests so though their fate is horrible they are not at least threatened with death for the secular people however there was no other salvation i repeat they all accepted mohammedism the germans italians englishmen copts greeks i myself and here though stas had assured him that no one in that crowd understood english he nevertheless lowered his voice besides i need not tell you that this is no denial of faith no treason no apostasy in his soul everyone remained what he was and god saw it before superior force it is necessary to bend though seemingly it is the duty of man to preserve life and it would be madness and even a sin to jeopardize it for what for appearances for a few words which at the same time you may disavow your soul and remember that you hold in your hands not only your life but the life of your little companion which it is not permissible for you to dispose of in truth i can guarantee to you if ever god saves you from these hands then you will not have anything to reproach yourself with nor will anyone find fault with you as this is the case with all of us the greek speaking in this manner perhaps deceived his own conscience but stas's silence deceived him also for in the end he mistook it for fear he determined therefore to give the boy courage these are the houses of the mahdi he said he prefers to live in the wooden sheds of amdurman rather than in khartoum though there he could occupy gordon's palace well then bravely don't lose your head to the question reply firmly they prize courage here also do not imagine that the mahdi will at once roar at you like a lion no he always smiles even when contemplating nothing good and saying this he began to shout at the crowd standing in front of the house to make way for the prophet's guests end of part 1 chapter 17part 1 chapter 18 of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand in desert and wilderness by henrik shankovich translated by max anthony dresmel chapter 18 when they entered the room the mahdi lay on a soft cot surrounded by his wives two of whom fanned him with great ostrich feathers and the other two lightly scratched the soles of his feet besides his wives there were present only the caliph abdullah and the seraph caliph as the third ali uled helu was despatching at that time troops to the north particular to Babar and abu hamed which already had been captured by the dervishes at the sight of the arrivals the prophet dismissed his wives and sat up on the cot idris gebher and the two bedouins fell on their faces and afterwards knelt with hands crossed on their breasts the greek beckoned to stas to do the same but the boy pretending not to see the gesture only bowed and remained standing erect his face was pale but his eyes shone strongly and from his whole posture and head haughtily upraised from his tightly compressed lips it could easily be seen that something had taken an ascendancy over him that uncertainty and fear had passed away that he had adopted an inflexible resolution from which he would not recede for anything the greek evidently understood this as great uneasiness was reflected on his features the mahdi observed both children with a fleeting glance brightened his fat face with his customary smile after which he first addressed Idris and Gebhar. "'You come from the distant north,' he said. Idris struck the ground with his forehead. "'Yes, O Mahdi. 
we belong to the tribe of dongola therefore we abandoned our homes in fayum in order to kneel at your blessed feet i beheld you in the desert that was a terrible journey but i sent an angel to guard and shield you from death at the hands of the infidels you did not see this but he watched over you thanks to thee redeemer and you brought those children to Spain to exchange them for his own, that the Turks imprisoned together with Fatma in Port said. Thee we desired to serve. Whoever serves me serves his own salvation, therefore you have opened for yourselves the path to paradise. Fatma is my relative. But verily I say unto you, that when we subjugate the whole of Egypt, then my relative and her posterity will anyway regain liberty. And therefore do with these children whatever thou desirest o blessed one the Mahdi closed his eyes after which he opened them smiling kindly and nodded at stas approach boy stas advanced a few paces with an energetic as if soldierly stride he bowed a second time after which he straightened as a cord and looking straight into the Mahdi's eyes waited are you delighted that you came to me the Mahdi asked no prophet we were abducted in spite of our wills from our parents this plain answer created a certain sensation upon the ruler accustomed to flattery and upon those present caliph abduli frowned the greek gnawed his mustache and began to wring his hand the mahdi however did not cease to smile but he said you are at the fountain of truth do you want to drink at that fountain a moment of silence followed so the Mahdi, thinking the boy did not understand the question, repeated it more plainly. Do you desire to accept my doctrines? To this Stas imperceptibly made a sign of the Holy Cross with his hand which he held at his breast, as though he was about to leap from a sinking ship into a watery chaos. Prophet, he said, your doctrines I do not know. Therefore, if I accepted them, I would do it out of fear like a coward and a base man. Are you anxious that your faith should be professed by cowards and base people? And speaking thus, he looked steadfastly in the eyes of the Mahdi. It became so quiet that only the buzz of flies could be heard. But at the same time, something extraordinary happened. The Mahdi became confused, and for the nonce did not know what reply to make. The smile vanished from his face, on which was reflected perplexity and displeasure. He stretched out his hand, took hold of the gourd, filled it with water and honey, and began to drink, but obviously only to gain time and to conceal his confusion. And the brave boy, a worthy descendant of the defenders of Christianity, of the true blood of the victors at Coxim and Vienna, stood with upraised head, awaiting his doom. On his emaciated cheeks, tanned by the desert winds, bloomed bright blushes, his eyes glittered and his body quivered with the thrill of ardor all others he soliloquized accepted his doctrines but i have denied neither my faith nor my soul and fear before what might and was to follow at that moment was subdued in his heart and joy and pride overflowed it in the meantime the mahdi replaced the gourd and asked so you reject my doctrines i am a christian like my father Whoever closes his eyes to the voice of God, said the Mahdi, slowly in a changed voice, is only fuel for the flames. At this the Caliph Abdullah, notorious for his ferocity and cruelty, displayed his white teeth like a savage animal and spoke out. The speech of this boy is insolent. Therefore punish him, Lord, or permit me to punish him. It has happened, Stas thought but the mahdi always desired that the fame of his mercy should spread not only among the dervishes but over the whole world therefore he thought that a too severe sentence particularly upon a small boy might injure that fame for a while he fingered the rosary beads and meditated and afterwards said no these children were abducted for smain so though i do not want to enter into any negotiations with the infidels it is necessary to send them to smain such is my will it shall be obeyed answered the caliph but the mahdi pointed to idris gebher and the bedouins and said reward these men for me o abdullah for they made a long and dangerous journey to serve god and me after which he nodded in sign that the audience was ended and at the same time ordered the greek to leave also 
the latter when they found themselves in darkness on the place of prayer seized stas's arm and began to shake it with anger and despair accursed you have sealed the doom of that innocent child he said pointing at nell you have ruined yourself and perhaps me i could not do otherwise answered stas you could not know that you are condemned to a journey a hundredfold worse than the first and that is death do you understand in fashoda the fever will kill you within the course of a week the mahdi knew why he sent you to smain in amdorman we also would perish that is not true you would not have perished in the house of the mahdi in plenty and comfort and he was ready to take you under his wings i know that he was you also repaid me nicely for interceding for you but do what you wish abdullah will dispatch the camel post to fashoda in about a week and during that time do whatever you please you will not see me any more saying this he went away but after a while returned he like all greeks was loquacious and it was necessary for him to tell everything he had to say he wanted to pour upon stas's head all the bile which had accumulated within him he was not cruel and did not possess a bad heart he desired however that the boy should understand more thoroughly the awful responsibility which he had assumed in not heeding his advice and warnings who would have prevented you from remaining a christian in your soul he said do you think that i am not one but i am not a fool you on the other hand preferred to make a parade of your false heroism heretofore i have rendered great services to the white prisoners but now i shall not be able to aid them for the mahdi has become incensed at me all will perish and your little companion in misfortune also you have killed her in fashoda even adult europeans die of the fever like flies and what of such a child and if they order you to go on foot beside the horses and camels she will fall the first day you did all this enjoy yourself now you christian and he left them while they turned from the place of prayer towards the huts they walked long as the city was spread over an immense space Nell, worn out by fatigue, hunger, fright, and the horrible impressions of the whole day, began to lag. Idris and Gebher urged her to walk faster, but after a time her limbs became entirely numb. Then Stas, without reflection, took her in his arms and carried her. On the way he wanted to speak to her, he wanted to justify himself, but ideas were torpid, as if they were dead in his mind. So he only repeated in a circle, Nell, Nell, Nell and he clasped her to his bosom, not being able to say anything more. After a few score paces, Nell fell asleep in his arms from exhaustion, so he walked in silence amid the quiet of the slumbering little streets, interrupted only by the conversations of Idris and Gebher, whose hearts overflowed with joy. This was fortunate for Stas, as otherwise they would have punished him for his insolent reply to the Mahdi. They were, however, so occupied with what they had seen that they could not think of anything else. I felt sick, said Idris, but the sight of the prophet healed me. He is like a palm in the desert, and like cool water on a scorching day, and his words are like ripe dates, answered Gebher. Nur el Tadhil lied when he said that he would not permit us to be admitted into his presence. He admitted us, blessed us, and ordered Abduli to lavish gifts upon us. Who will munificently enrich us, for the wish of the Mahdi is sacred? Bismala, may it be as you say spoke out one of the bedouins and gebher began to dream of whole herds of camels horned cattle and bags full of piastres from these dreams he was awakened by idris who pointing at stas carrying the sleeping girl asked what shall we do with that hornet and that fly ha smain ought to reward us for them separately since the prophet says that he will not permit any negotiations with the infidels, Smain will have no interest in them. In such case, I regret that they did not get into the hands of the caliph, who would have taught that whelp what it is to bark against the truth and the elect of the Lord. The Mahdi is merciful, answered Idris. After which he pondered for a while and said, Nevertheless, Smain having both in his hands will be certain that neither the Turks nor the English people will kill his children and Fatma. So he may reward us? Yes. Let Abduli's post take them to Fashoda. A weight will fall off our heads, and when Smain returns here, we will demand recompense from him. You say, then, that we will remain in Amdurman? Allah! Have you not had enough journey from Fayum to Khartoum? 
the time for rest has come the huts were now not far off stas however slackened his pace for his strength began to wane nell though light seemed heavier and heavier the sudanese who were anxious to go to sleep shouted at him to hurry and afterwards drove him on striking him on the head with their fists gebher even pricked him painfully in the shoulder with a knife the boy endured all this in silence protecting above all his little sister and not until one of the bedouins shoved him so that he almost fell did he say to them through his set teeth we are to arrive at fashoda alive and these words restrained the arabs for they feared to violate the commands of the mahdi a yet more effective restraint however was the fact that idris suddenly became so dizzy that he had to lean on geber's arm after an interval the dizziness passed away but the sudanese became frightened and said allah something ails me has not some sickness taken hold of me you have seen the mahdi so you will not fall sick answered geber they finally reached the huts stas hurrying with the remnants of his strength delivered sleeping now to the hands of old dinah who though unwell also nevertheless made a comfortable bed for her little lady the sudanese and the bedouins swallowing a few strips of raw meat flung themselves like logs on the saddle cloth stas was not given anything to eat but old dinah shoved into his hands a fistful of soaked dura a certain amount of which she had stolen from the camels but he was not in the mood for eating or sleeping for the load which weighed on his shoulders was in truth too heavy he felt that in rejecting the favor of the mahdi for which it was necessary to pay with the denial of faith and soul he had acted as he should have done he felt that his father would have been proud and happy at his conduct but at the same time he thought that he had caused the destruction of nell his companion in misfortune his little beloved sister for whom he would willingly have sacrificed his last drop of blood so when all had fallen asleep he burst into a flood of tears and lying on a piece of saddle cloth he wept long like the child which after all he still was end of chapter 18part 1 chapter 19 of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson in desert and wilderness by henrik sinkovich translated by max anthony dresmar chapter 19 the visit to the Mahdi and the interview with him evidently did not heal Idris, as during the night he grew worse, and in the morning became unconscious. Shamis, Geber, and the two Bedouins were summoned to the Caliph, who detained them some hours and praised their courage, but they returned in the worst humour, and with rage in their souls, for they had expected the Lord knows what rewards, and in the meantime, Abdullahi gave each one an Egyptian pound about five dollars and a horse the bedouins began a quarrel with geber which almost resulted in a fight in the end they announced that they would ride together with a camel post to fashoda to demand payment from smain they were joined by shamis who expected that the patronage of smain would be more beneficial to him than a sojourn in omdurman for the children a week of hunger and misery began for geber did not think of feeding them fortunately stas had the two dollars with the effigy of maria theresa which he got from the greek so he went to the city to buy dates and rice the sudanese did not oppose this trip as they knew that he could not escape from omdurman and that under no circumstances would he desert the little bint this experience did not pass without some adventures however for the sight of a boy in european dress buying provisions at the market-place again attracted a crowd of semi-savage dervishes who received him with laughter and yells fortunately many knew that he had been at the mahdi's the previous day and they restrained those who wanted to assault him only children threw sand and stones at him but he paid no attention to them at the market-place the prices were too high 
Stas could not obtain any dates at all, and a considerable part of the rice was taken away from him by Gebhr for his sick brother. The boy resisted with all his strength, in consequence of which a scuffle and fight ensued, in which the really weaker one came out with numerous contusions and bruises. In addition, the cruelty of Shamis became manifest. The latter evinced an attachment for Saba and fed him with raw meat. On the other hand, at the distress of the children, whom he knew of old and who had always been kind to him, he looked with the utmost indifference, and when Stas addressed him with a request that he should at least give Nell a morsel of food, he replied, laughing, Go and beg! And it finally came to pass that Stas, during the following days, desiring to save Nell from death by starvation, begged. Nor was he always unsuccessful. At times some former soldier or officer of the Egyptian Khedive gave him a few piastres or a few dried figs and promised to aid him on the following day. Once he happened to meet a missionary and a sister of charity who, hearing his story, bemoaned the fate of both children, and though they themselves were wasted with hunger, shared with him everything which they had. They also promised to visit them in the huts and did actually come the next day in the hope that they might succeed in taking the children with them until the time of the departure of the post. But Geber with Shamis drove them away with Kurbashes. On the following day Stas met them again and received from them a little measure of rice together with two quinine powders which the missionary instructed him to save most carefully in the expectation that the fashoda fever inevitably awaited both you will ride now he said alongside in the dense floating masses in the white nile or the so-called suits the river not being able to flow freely across the barriers composed of vegetation and weeds which the current of the water carries and deposits in the more shallow places forms there extensive and infectious swamps amid which the fever does not spare even the negroes beware particularly of sleeping on the bare ground without a fire we already wish to die answered stas almost with a moan at this the missionary raised his haggard face and for a while prayed after which he made the sign of the cross over the boy and said trust in god you did not deny him so his mercy and care will be over you Stas tried not only to beg but to work a certain day seeing a crowd of men laboring at the place of prayer He joined them and began to carry clay for the palisade with which the place was to be surrounded They jeered at and jostled him but at evening the old sheikh who superintended the work gave him 12 dates Stas was immensely overjoyed at this compensation for dates with rice formed the only wholesome nourishment for Nell and became more and more difficult to obtain in Omdurman. So he brought them with pride to his little sister, to whom he gave everything which he could secure. He sustained himself for a week almost exclusively upon Jura, taken from the camels. Nell was greatly delighted at the sight of her favorite fruit, but wanted him to share it with her. So, tiptoeing, she placed her hands on his shoulders, and turning up her head, began to gaze into his eyes and plead stas eat a half eat to this he replied i have already eaten i have eaten i have eaten my fill and he smiled but immediately began to bite his lips in order not to weep as he really was hungry he promised himself that the following day he would go again and earn some more but it happened otherwise in the morning a musalem from Abdullahi came with the announcement that the camel post was to leave at night for Fashoda and with the Caliph's command that Idris Geber Shamis and the two Bedouins should prepare to go with the children This command amazed and aroused the indignation of Geber So he declared that he would not go as his brother was sick and there was no one to attend to him And even if he were well both had decided to remain at Omdurman but the Musalem replied the Mahdi has only one will and Abdullahi his caliph and my master never alters commands Your brother can be attended by a slave while you will depart for Fashoda 
then i shall go and inform him that i will not depart to the caliph are admitted only those whom he himself desires to see and if you go without permission and through violence should force yourself into his presence i will lead you to the gallows allah akbar then tell me plainly that i am a slave be silent and obey orders answered the muzalem the sudanese had seen in omdurman gallows breaking under the weight of hanging men by orders of the ferocious abdullahi these gallows were daily decorated with new bodies geber became terror-stricken that which the muzalem told him and the Mahdi commanded but once was reiterated by all the dervishes there was therefore no help it was necessary to ride i shall see idris no more thought geber in his tigerish heart was concealed a sort of attachment for his older brother so that at the thought that he would have to leave him in sickness he was seized by despair in vain did shamis and the bedouins represent to him that they might fare better in fashoda than in omdurman and that smain in all probability would reward them more bountifully than the caliph had done no words could assuage geber's grief and rage and the rage rebounded mainly upon stas it was indeed a day of martyrdom for the boy he was not permitted to go to the market-place so he could not earn anything or beg and was compelled to work as a slave at the pack saddles which were being prepared for the journey this became a more difficult matter as from hunger and torture he weakened very much he was certain that he would die on the road if not under geber's courbash then from exhaustion fortunately the greek who had a good heart came in at the evening to visit the children and to bid them farewell and at the same time to provide for them on the way he brought a few quinine powders and besides these a few glass beads and a little food finally learning of idris's sickness he turned to geber shamis and the bedouins know this he said i come here by the mahdi's command and when they heard this they smote with their foreheads and he continued you are to feed the children on the way and treat them well they are to render a report of your behavior to smain smain shall write of this to the prophet if any complaint against you comes here the next post will carry a death sentence for you a new bow was the only reply to these words in addition geber and shamis had the means of dogs on which muzzles are placed the greek then ordered them away after which he thus spoke to the children in english i fabricated all this for the mahdi did not issue any new orders but as he said that you were to go to fashoda it is necessary that you should reach there alive i also reckoned upon this that none of them will see either the mahdi or the caliph before their departure after which to stas i took umbrage at you boy and, and feel it yet do you know that you almost ruined me the mahdi was offended at me and to secure his forgiveness i was forced to surrender to abdullahi a considerable portion of my estate and besides i do not know for how long a time i have saved myself in any case i shall not be able to assist the captives as i have heretofore done but i felt sorry for you particularly for her and here he pointed at nell i have a daughter of the same age whom i love more than my own life and for her sake i have done everything which i have done christ will judge me for this up to this time she wears under her dress on her breast a silver cross her name is the same as yours little one were it not for her i would have preferred to die than to live in this hell he was deeply moved for a while he was silent after which he rubbed his forehead with his hand and began to speak of something else the mahdi sends you to fashoda with the idea that there you will die in this manner he will revenge himself upon you for your stubbornness boy which touched him deeply and he will not lose his fame for mercy he always acts thus but who knows who is destined to die first abdullahi suggests to him the idea that he should order the dogs who kidnapped you to go with you he rewarded them miserably and now he fears that they may publish it besides they both preferred that the people should not be told that there are still in egypt troops 
cannons money and englishmen it will be a hard road and distant you will go into a country desolate and unhealthy so guard as the eye in the head those powders which i gave to you sir order gaber once more not to dare to starve or hit nell said stas do not fear i commended you to the old sheikh who has charge of the post he is an old acquaintance of mine i gave him a watch and with that i gained his protection for you saying this he began to bid them farewell taking nell in his arms he pressed her to his bosom and repeated may god bless you my child in the meantime the sun descended and the night became starry in the dusk resounded the snorting of horses and the groans of the heavily loaded camels End of chapter 19part one chapter twenty of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson in desert and wilderness by henrik sinkovich translated by max anthony dresmar chapter twenty the old sheikh hatim faithfully kept his promise given to the greek and watched over the children with great solicitude the journey up the white nile was difficult they rode through katane ed duane and kawa afterwards they passed abba a woody nile island on which before the war the mahdi dwelt in a hollow tree as a dervish hermit the caravan often was compelled to make a detour around extensive floating masses overgrown with pyrus or so-called suds from which the breeze brought the poisoned odor of decomposed leaves carried by the current of water english engineers had previously cut through these barriers and formerly steamboats could ascend from khartoum to fashoda and farther at present the river was blocked again and being unable to run freely overflowed on both sides the right and left banks of this region were covered by a high jungle amid which stood hillocks of termites and solitary gigantic trees here and there the forest reached the river in dry places grew groves of acacias during the first week they saw arabian settlements and towns composed of houses with strange conical roofs made of dochnu straw but beyond abba from the settlement of goz abu guma they rode in the country of the blacks it was nearly desolate for the dervishes had almost totally carried away the local negro population and sold it in the markets of khartoum omdurman fasha da el obeid and other cities in the sudan darfur and kardofan those inhabitants who succeeded in escaping slavery in thickets in the forest were exterminated by starvation and smallpox which raged with unusual virulence along the white and blue niles the dervishes themselves said that whole nations had died of it the former plantations of sorghum manioc and bananas were covered by a jungle only wild beasts not pursued by any one multiplied plentifully sometimes before the evening twilight the children saw from a distance great herds of elephants resembling movable rocks walking with slow tread to watering places known only to themselves at the sight of them hatim a former ivory dealer smacked his lips sighed and spoke thus to stas in confidence mashallah how much wealth there is here but now it is not worth while to hunt for the mahdi has prohibited egyptian traders from coming to khartoum and there is no one to sell the tusks to unless to the emirs for umbajas they met also giraffes which seeing the caravan escaped hurriedly with heavy ambling pace swinging their long necks as if they were lame beyond goz abu guma appeared more and more frequently buffaloes and whole herds of antelopes the people of the caravan when they lacked fresh meat hunted for them but almost always in vain for the watchful and fleet animals would not allow themselves to be approached or surrounded provisions were generally scarce as owing to the depopulation of the region they could not obtain either millet or bananas or fish 
which in former times were furnished by the Shiluk and Dinka tribes, who exchanged them willingly for glass beads and brass wire. Hatim, however, did not permit the children to die of starvation, and what is more, he kept a strict control over Geber, and once, when the latter at about bedtime struck Stas while removing saddles from the camels, he ordered the Sudanese to be stretched upon the ground and whipped thirty times on each heel with a bamboo. For two days the cruel Sudanese could walk only on his toes and curse the hour when he left Fayum and revenged himself upon a young slave named Kali who had been presented to him. Stas at the beginning was almost pleased that he had left infected Omdurman and that he saw a country of which he always had dreamed. His strong constitution thus far endured perfectly the toils of the journey and the abundant food restored his energy. Several times during the journey and at the stops he whispered to his little sister that it was possible to escape even from beyond the White Nile and that he did not at all abandon that design. But her health disquieted him. Three weeks after the day of their departure from Omdurman, Nell had not indeed succumbed to the fever, but her face grew thinner and instead of being tanned it became more and more transparent and her little hands looked as if they were moulded of wax. She did not lack care, and even such comforts as Stas and Dinah, with the aid of Hatim, could provide. But she lacked the salubrious desert air. The moist and torrid climate, united with the hardships of the journey, more and more undermined the strength of the child. Stas, beginning at Goz Abu Guma, gave her daily a half-powder of quinine, and worried terribly at the thought that this remedy which could be obtained nowhere later would not last him long but it could not be helped for it was necessary above all things to prevent the fever at moments despair possessed him he deluded himself however with the hope that smain if he desired to exchange them for his own children would have to seek for them a more salubrious place than the neighbourhood of fashoda but misfortune seemed continually to pursue its victims. On the day before the arrival at Fashoda, Dinah, who while in Omdurman felt weak, fainted suddenly at the untying of the small luggage with Nell's things taken from Payun, and fell from the camel. Stas and Shamis revived her with the greatest difficulty. She did not, however, regain consciousness, or rather, she regained it at the evening only to bid a tearful farewell to her beloved little lady, and to die. After her death, Geber insisted upon cutting off her ears in order to show them to Smain as proof that she died during the journey, and to demand of him a separate payment for her abduction. This was done with a slave who expired during the journey, but Hatim, at the entreaties of Stas and Nell would not consent to this, so they buried her decently, and her mound was safeguarded against hyenas with the assistance of stones and thorns. The children felt yet more lonely, for they realized that in her they had lost the only near and devoted soul. This was a terrible blow, particularly for Nell, so Stas endeavored to comfort her throughout the whole night and the following day. The sixth week of the journey arrived, and the next day at noon the, the caravan reached Fashoda, but they found only a pyre. The Mahdists bivouacked under the bare heaven or in huts hurriedly built of grass and boughs. Three days previously the settlement had been burnt down. There remained only the clay walls of the round hovels blackened with smoke and, standing close by the water, a great wooden shed which during the egyptian times served as a storage place for ivory in it at present lived the commander of the dervishes emir seki tamala he was a distinguished personage among the mahdists a secret enemy of abdullahi but on the other hand a personal friend of hatim he received the old sheikh and the children hospitably but immediately at the introduction told them unfavorable news Smain was not in Fashoda. Two days before he had gone southeast from the Nile on an expedition for slaves, and it was not known when he would return. As the nearer localities were so depopulated that it was necessary to seek for human chattels very far. Near Fashoda, indeed, lay Abyssinia, 
with which the dervishes likewise waged war but smain having only three hundred men did not dare to cross its borders guarded vigilantly at present by king john's warlike inhabitants and soldiers in view of this seki tamala and hatim began to deliberate as to what was to be done with the children the consultation was held mainly at supper to which the emir invited stas and nell i he said to hatim must soon start with all the men upon a distant expedition against emin pasha emin pasha by birth the german jew was after the occupation by egypt of the region around albert nyanza governor of the equatorial provinces his headquarters were at wadalai the mahdist attacked it a number of times he was rescued by stanley who conducted him with a greater part of his troops to bagamoyo on the indian ocean who is located at ledo having steamers and troops there such is the command which you hatim brought me therefore you must return to omdurman for in pashoda there will not remain a single living soul here there is no place in which to live there is nothing to eat and sickness is raging i know indeed that the white people do not catch smallpox but fever will kill those children within a month i was ordered to bring them to fashoda replied hatim so i brought them and need not trouble myself about them any more but they were recommended to me by my friend the greek calliopoli for that reason i would not want them to perish and this will surely happen then what is to be done instead of leaving them in desolate fashoda send them to smain together with those men who brought them to omdurman smain went to the mountains to a dry and high region where the fever does not kill the people as on the river how will they find smain by the trail of fire he will set fire to the jungle first in order to drive the game to the rocky ravines in which it will be easy to surround and slaughter it and then in order to scare out of the thickets the heathens who hid in them before pursuit smain will not be hard to find will they however overtake him he will at times pass a week in one locality to cure meat even though he rode away two or three days ago they surely will overtake him but why should they chase after him he will return to fashoda anyway no if the slave hunt is successful he will take the slaves to the cities to sell them what is to be done remember that both of us must leave fashoda the children even though the fever does not kill them will die of starvation by the prophet that is true and there really remained nothing else to do but to dispatch the children upon a new wandering life hatim who appeared to be a very good man was only troubled about this whether geber with whose cruel disposition he had become acquainted during the journey would not treat them too harshly but the stern seki tamala who aroused fear even in his own soldiers commanded the sudanese to be summoned and announced to them that he was to convey the children alive and in good health to smain and at the same time to treat them kindly as otherwise he would be hung the good hatim entreated the emir to present to little nell a female slave who would serve her and take care of her during the journey and in smain's camp nell was delighted greatly with this gift and it appeared that the slave was a young dinka girl with pleasant features and a sweet facial expression stas knew that fashoda was death so he did not at all beg hatim that he should not send them upon a new journey the third in rotation in his soul he thought also that riding in an easterly and southerly direction he must approach the abyssinian boundaries and that he might escape he had a hope that upon the dry tableland nell would be safeguarded against the fever and for these reasons he willingly and zealously entered into the preparation for the journey geber shamis and the two bedouins also were not opposed to the expedition reckoning that at smain's side they would succeed in capturing a considerable number of slaves and afterwards sell them profitably in the markets they knew that slave dealers in time amass great fortunes in any case they preferred to ride rather than to remain at that place under the immediate control of hatim and seki tamala 
the preparations however consumed considerable time particularly as the children had to recuperate the camels were unavailable now for this journey so the arabs and stas and nell were to ride on horseback kali gaber's slave and nell's maid called mia upon stas's suggestion were to go on foot beside the horses hatim also procured a donkey to carry a tent intended for the little girl and provisions for three days for the children more seki tamala could not give them for nell something in the nature of a lady's saddle made of saddle cloth palm and bamboo mats was constructed the children passed three days in fashoda to rest but the countless number of mosquitoes above the river made their stay unendurable during the daytime appeared swarms of big blue flies which did not indeed bite but were so vexing that they crept into the ears filled the eyes and fell even into the mouths stas had heard while in port said that the mosquitoes and flies spread fever and an infection of the inflammation of the eyes finally he himself entreated seki tamala to hurry the expedition particularly as the rainy spring season was approaching End of chapter 20part 1 chapter 21 of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson in desert and wilderness by henrik sinkovich translated by max anthony dresmar chapter 21 Stas, why are we riding and speeding and have not yet reached Smain? I do not know. He undoubtedly is moving rapidly ahead in order to reach as quickly as possible the region in which he can catch Negroes. Are you anxious that we should join his detachment? The little girl nodded her pale yellow little head in sign that she was very much concerned about it. Why should you be so anxious? asked Stas because perhaps geber will not dare in smain's company to beat that poor kali so cruelly smain probably is no better they all have no mercy for their slaves is that so and two little tears coursed over her emaciated cheeks it was the ninth day of the journey geber who was now the leader of the caravan in the beginning easily discovered traces of smain's march his way was indicated by a trail of burnt jungle and camping grounds strewn with picked bones and various remnants but after a lapse of five days they came upon a vast expanse of burnt steppe on which the wind had carried the fire in all directions the trails became deceptive and confusing as apparently smain had divided his detachment into ten or more small divisions in order to facilitate the surrounding of the game and the capture of provisions Gaber did not know in which direction to go, and often it happened that the caravan, after moving long in a circle, returned to the same place from which it started. Afterwards they chanced upon forests, and after passing through them they entered upon a rocky country, where the ground was covered by smooth rocks or small stones, scattered over the immense expanse so thickly that the children were reminded of city pavements. The vegetation there was scant, only here and there in the crannies of rocks grew euphorbias mimosas and thorny and scrubby plants and more infrequently yet a slender light green tree which kali in the kiswahili language called mti and with the leaves of which the horses were fed in this locality little rivers and streams were lacking but fortunately from time to time the rain began to fall so they found water in the hollows and excavations of the rocks the game was driven away by smain's detachment and the caravan would have died of starvation were it not for a multitude of guinea fowls which every little while started from under the horse's legs and at evening encumbered the trees so thickly that it was sufficient to shoot in their direction to cause a few to fall to the ground in addition they were not timid and permitted a close approach and they rose so heavily and indolently that saba rushing ahead of the caravan seized and choked some of them almost every day 
Chamis killed about a score of them daily with an old shotgun which he had bartered from one of the dervishes serving under Hatim during the trip from Omdurman to Fashoda. He did not, however, have shot for more than twenty charges, and he became uneasy at the thought of what would happen when the supply was exhausted. Indeed, notwithstanding the scaring away of the game, there appeared at times amidst the rocks herds of aerials, beautiful antelopes common in all Central Africa, but it was necessary to shoot at the aerials with the short rifle, while they did not know how to use Stas's gun, and Gaber did not want to place it in his hands. The Sudanese likewise began to grow uneasy at the long journey. At times it occurred to him to return to Fashoda, because in case he and Smain should miss each other, they might stray in wild regions in which, not to speak of starvation, they were in danger of attacks of wild animals, and savage negroes panting for revenge for the hunt which had been dispatched against them. But as he did not know that Seki Tamala was preparing an expedition against Emin, for the conversation about this was not held in his presence, he was seized with terror at the thought of appearing before the face of the puissant emir, who had commanded him to convey the children to Smain, and had given him a letter addressed to him, and in addition had announced that if he did not acquit himself properly of his duty, he would be hung. All of this taken together filled his soul with bitterness and rage. He did not dare, however, to revenge himself for his disappointments upon Stas and Nell. Instead, the back of poor Kali was covered with blood under the kurbash. The young slave approached his cruel master, always trembling and in fear. In vain he embraced his feet and kissed his hands. In vain he fell upon his face before him. The stony heart was not moved either by humility or by groans, and the kurbash gashed the body of the unhappy boy upon the most trivial cause, and often for none whatever. At night his feet were placed in a wooden board with an opening to prevent him from running away During the day he walked tied with a rope fastened to a horse This amused Shamis very much Nell shed tears over Kali's plight Stas's heart raged and a number of times he passionately interceded for him But when he perceived that this inflamed Geber still more he set his teeth and remained silent but Kali understood that those two interceded for him and he began to love them deeply with his afflicted heart For two days they rode in a stony ravine lined with high steep rocks from the stones heaped and scattered in disorder It was easy to perceive that during the rainy season the ravine was filled with water, but at present its bed was entirely dry on the walls on both sides grew small patches of grass a great many thorns and here and there even a tree Geber directed his way by this stony gullet because it went continually upwards So he thought that it would lead him to some eminence from which he could descry smoke during the daytime and Smain's campfires at night In some places the ravine became so narrow that only two horses could go side by side In other places it widened into small round valleys Surrounded as if by high stone walls on which sat big baboons playing with each other barking and displaying their teeth at the caravan It was five o'clock in the afternoon the Sun already lowered towards the west Gaber thought of a resting place He wanted only to reach some small valley in which he could construct a zareba That is enclose the caravan and horses with a fence of thorny mimosa and acacias for protection against attacks of wild animals Saba rushed ahead Barking at the baboons which at sight of him shook uneasily and all of a sudden disappeared in the bend of the ravine Echo repeated loudly his barking Suddenly however he became silent and after a while he came rushing to the horses with hair bristling on his back and tail curled under him The Bedouins and Geber understood that something must have frightened him But staring at each other and desiring to ascertain what it could be they proceeded further but riding around a small bend the horses shied and stood still in one moment as if thunderstruck by the sight which met their eyes on a fair-sized rock situated in the middle of the ravine which was quite wide at that place lay a lion 
At most, a hundred paces separated him from them. The powerful beast, seeing the riders and horses, rose on his forepaws and began to gaze at them. The sun, which now stood low, illumined his large head and shaggy breasts, and in that ruddy luster he was like one of those sphinxes which ornament the entrances to ancient Egyptian temples. The horses began to sit upon their haunches, to wince and draw back. The amazed and frightened riders did not know what to do. So from mouth to mouth there flowed only the fearsome and helpless words, Allah, Bismillah, Allah Akbar. And the king of the wilderness gazed at them from above, motionless as if cast in bronze. Geber and Shamis had heard from traders who came to Egypt from the Sudan with ivory and gum, that lions sometimes lie down in the paths of caravans, which, on account of this, must turn aside. But here there was no place which they could turn to. It behoved them, perhaps, to turn about and fly. Yes, but in such case it was a certainty that the dreadful beast would rush after them in pursuit. Again resounded the feverish interrogations. What is to be done? Allah, perhaps he will step aside. No, he will not. And again a silence fell. Only the snorting of the horses and the quickened breathing of the human breasts could be heard. Untie Kali, Shamis suddenly exclaimed to Geber, and we will escape on the horses. The lion will first overtake him and kill him only. Do that, repeated the Bedouins. But Geber surmised that in such a case Kali, in the twinkle of an eye, would climb on the rocky wall and the lion would chase after the horses. Therefore, another horrible idea suggested itself to him. He would kill the boy with his knife and fling his body ahead of him, and then the lion, dashing after them, would see on the ground the bleeding corpse and stop to devour it. So he dragged Kali by the rope to the saddle and had already raised his knife when the same second Stas clutched the wide sleeve of his juba. Villain! What are you doing? Geber began to tug, and if the boy had seized him by the hand, he would have freed it at once. But it was not so easy with the sleeve, so he began to tug and splutter with a voice stifled with fury. Dog, if he is not enough, I shall stab you both. Allah, I shall stab you. I shall stab you. And Stas paled mortally, for like lightning the thought flashed through his mind that the lion chasing after the horses, above all, might actually overlook Kylie, and in such case Geber, with the greatest certainty, would stab them both in turn. So pulling the sleeve with redoubled strength, he shouted, Give me the short rifle, I will kill the lion. These words astonished the Bedouins, but Shamis, who had witnessed Stas's shooting in Port Said, began at once to cry, Give him the rifle, he will kill the lion. Geber recollected at once the shots on Lake Karun, and in view of the horrible danger, assented with great haste he gave the boy the short rifle and shamis as quick as a thought opened the cartridge box from which stars took a large fistful of cartridges after which he leaped off his horse inserted the cartridges in the barrels and moved forward for the first few steps he was as though stupefied and saw only himself and nell with throats cut by gaber's knife but soon the nearer and more horrible danger commanded him to forget about everything else. He had a lion before him. At the sight of the animal his eyes grew dim. He felt a chill on his cheeks and nose. He felt that he had feet as if made of lead and he could scarcely breathe. Plainly he feared. In Port Said he had read during the recitation time of lion hunts, but it was one thing to examine pictures in books and another to stand eye to eye with the monster who now gazed at him as if with amazement wrinkling his broad forehead which resembled a shield the arabs held the breath in their breasts for never in their lives had they seen anything like this on the one side was a small boy who amid the steep rocks appeared yet smaller on the other a powerful beast golden in the sun's rays magnificent formidable the lord with the great head as the sudanese say stas overcame with the whole force of his will the inertness of his limbs and advanced farther for a while yet it seemed to him that his heart had leaped up into his throat 
and this feeling continued until he raised the rifle to his face then it was necessary to think of something else whether to approach nearer or to fire at once where to aim the smaller the distance the surer the shot therefore nearer and nearer forty paces too many yet thirty twenty already the breeze carried the pungent animal odor the boy stood a bullet between the eyes or it will be all over with me he thought in the name of the father and of the son and the lion rose stretched his body and lowered his head his lips began to open his brows to contract over his eyes this might of being had dared to approach too closely so he prepared for a leap sitting with haunches quivering on his hind legs but stas during the twinkling of an eye perceived that the bead of the rifle was in a direct line with the forehead of the animal and pulled the trigger the shot pealed the lion reared so that for a while he straightened out to his full height after which he toppled over on his back with his four paws up and in the final convulsions he rolled off the rock onto the ground Stas for several minutes covered him with his rifle but seeing that the quivering ceased and that the tawny body was stretched out inertly he opened the rifle and inserted another cartridge the stony walls reverberated yet with the thunderous echo Geber, Shamis, and the Bedouins could not at once descry what had happened, as on the previous night rain had fallen, and owing to the dampness of the weather, the smoke veiled everything in the narrow ravine. Only when the smoke abated did they shout with joy and wanted to rush towards the boy, but in vain, as no power could force the horses to move ahead. And Stas turned around, took in the four Arabs with his gaze, and fixed his eyes on Geber ah there has been enough of this he said through his set teeth you have exceeded the measure you shall not torment now or any one else any more and suddenly he felt that his nose and cheeks turned pale but this was a different chill caused not by fright but by a terrible and inflexible resolution from which the heart in the bosom becomes from the time being iron yes it is imperative these are mere villains executioners murderers and nell is in their hands you shall not murder her he repeated he approached them again stood and suddenly with the rapidity of lightning raised the rifle to his face two shots one after the other jarred the ravine with an echo geber tumbled to the ground and chamois swayed in the saddle and struck his horse's neck with his bleeding forehead the two Bedouins uttered a horrified cry of consternation and springing from the horses dashed at Stas a Bend was not far behind them and if they had run in the other direction Which Stas in his soul desired they could have saved their lives But blinded by terror and fury they thought that they would reach the boy before he would be able to change the cartridges and cut him to pieces with their knives fools they ran barely a dozen paces when again the ill-omened rifle cracked the ravine resounded with the echo of new shots and both fell with faces on the ground flouncing about like fishes taken out of water one of them who in the haste was hurt the least raised himself and propped himself on his hands but at that moment saba sunk his fangs in his throat a mortal silence ensued it was broken only by the moans of kali who threw himself on his knees and stretching out his hands exclaimed in the broken kiswahili tongue buana kubwa great master kill the lion kill bad people but do not kill kali stas however paid no heed to his cries for some time he stood as if dazed after which observing nell's pallid face and half-conscious eyes opened widely from terror he ran towards her nell do not fear now we are free in fact they actually were free but astray in a wild uninhabited region in the heart of the land of the blacks end of chapter 21part 2 chapter 1 of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. In Desert and Wilderness by Henrik Sinkovich. Translated by Max Anthony Dressmal. Chapter 1 before Stas and the young Negro dragged the slain Arabs and the lion's heavy body to the side of the ravine, the sun had descended still more, and night was soon to fall. But it was impossible to sleep in the vicinity of the corpses. So, though Kali stroked his stomach and repeated, smacking with his tongue, Mzuri Nyama, good meat, Stas did not permit him to busy himself with the Nyama, and instead ordered him to catch the horses which ran away after the shooting the black boy did this with extraordinary skill instead of running after them in the ravine in which case they would have sped away farther and farther he climbed to the top and shortening his way by avoiding the bends he intercepted the startled steeds from the front in this manner he easily caught two and two more he drove towards stas only Gebu's and Shami's horses could not be found, but at any rate four remained, not counting the lap-eared creature, loaded with the tent and things, who, in view of the tragic occurrences, displayed a true philosophical calm. They found him beyond a bend, cropping closely, and without any haste, the grass growing on the bottom of the ravine. The medium-sized Sudanese horses are accustomed generally to the sight of wild animals, but they fear lions, so it is with considerable difficulty that they were led past the rock, which was blackened with a puddle of blood. The horses snorted, dilating their nostrils and stretching their necks towards the blood-stained stones. Nevertheless, when the donkey, only pricking his ears a little, passed by calmly, they also passed on. Night had already fallen. They nevertheless rode over half a mile, and halted only in a place where the ravine widened again into a small amphitheatrical vale, overgrown with dense thorns and prickly mimosa trees. Master, said the young negro, Kali will make a fire, a big fire. And taking the broad Sudanese sword, which he had removed from Geber's corpse, he began to cut with it thorns and even little trees. After building the fire, he continued to cut until he secured a supply which would suffice for the whole night, after which, with studs, he pitched the tent for Nell, under a steep perpendicular wall of the ravine, and later they surrounded it with a semicircular, broad and prickly fence, or so-called zariba. Stas knew from descriptions of African travels that travellers in this manner safeguarded themselves against the attacks of wild animals. The horses could not be placed within the fence, so the boy, unsaddling them and removing the tin utensils and bags, only hobbled them so that they could not stray too far in seeking grass or water. Mia finally found water nearby in a stony cavity, forming, as it were, a little basin under the opposite rocks. There was so copious a supply that it sufficed for the horses and the cooking of the guinea fowls, which were shot that morning by Shami. In the pack saddles which the donkey bore, they also found about three pots of dura, a few fistfuls of salt, and a bunch of dried manioc roots. This sufficed for a bounteous supper. Kali and Mia mainly took advantage of it. The young negro, whom Geber had starved in a cruel manner, ate such an amount of food as would have sated two men. But for this he was grateful with his whole heart to his new master and mistress, and immediately after supper he fell on his face before Stas and Nell, in token that he desired to remain their slave to the end of his life, and afterwards he also prostrated himself with due humility before Stas's short rifle, understanding that it was the best policy to conciliate so formidable a weapon. After this he announced that during the slumber of the great master and the bibi, he, alternately with Mia, would watch that the fire should not go out, and squatted near it, mumbling quietly something in the nature of a song, in which every little while was repeated the refrain, Simba Kufa, Simba Kufa, which in the Kiswahili language means, The Lion is Killed. But the great master and the little Bibi were not inclined to sleep. Nell, at Stas's urgent request, 
barely swallowed a few pieces of guinea fowl and a few grains of boiled durra she said that she did not care to eat or sleep but only to drink a fear seized stas that she might be suffering from fever but he soon became satisfied that her hands were cool and even too cold he persuaded her to enter the tent where he prepared bedding for her first searching carefully in the grass for scorpions he himself sat upon a stone with short rifle in hand to defend her from attacks by wild beasts if the fire did not afford sufficient protection he was beset by great fatigue and exhaustion in his soul he repeated to himself i killed geber and shami i killed the bedouins i killed the lion and we are free but it was as if those words were whispered to him by someone else and as if he himself did not comprehend their full meaning he had not a feeling that they were free but that something awful at the same time had happened which filled him with uneasiness and weighed upon his bosom like a heavy stone finally his thoughts began to grow blunt for a long time he gazed at the big moths hovering above the flame and in the end he nodded and dozed kali also dozed but awoke every little while and threw twigs into the fire the night became dark and what is a rare occurrence under the tropics very still they could hear only the cracking of the burning thorns and the hissing of flames which illumined the overhanging rocks forming a semicircle the moon did not shine into the depths of the ravine but above twinkled a swarm of unknown stars the air became so cool that stas shook off his drowsiness and began to worry whether the chill would not incommode little nell but he became reassured when he recollected that he left her under the tent upon the plaid cloth which dinah took with her from fayum it also occurred to him that riding continuously from the nile upwards though imperceptibly they must have ridden through so many days quite high therefore to a region which was not threatened with fever as are the low river banks the penetrating night chill appeared to confirm his supposition and this thought encouraged him he went for a moment to nell's tent to listen whether she slept peacefully after which he returned sat nearer the fire and again began to doze and even fell into a sound slumber suddenly he was awakened by the growling of saba who previously had lain down to sleep close by his feet kali awoke also and both began to look about uneasily at the mastiff who stretching out like a cord pricked his ears and with quivering nostrils scented in the direction from which they had come gazed fixedly at the same time into the darkness the hair bristled on his neck and back and his breasts heaved from air which during the growling he inhaled into his lungs the young slave flung dry twigs into the fire as speedily as possible master he whispered take the rifle take the rifle stas took the rifle and moved before the fire to see better in the dusky depth of the ravine saba's growls changed into barks for a long time nothing could be heard after which however from the distance there reached the ears of kali and stas a hollow clattering sound as if some great animals were rushing in the direction of the fire this sound reverberated in the stillness with an echo against the stony walls and became louder and louder stas realized that a dire danger was drawing near but what could it be buffaloes perhaps perhaps a pair of rhinoceroses seeking an exit from the ravine in such case if the report of the shot did not scare them and turn them back nothing could save the caravan for those animals not less ferocious and aggressive than rapacious beasts do not fear fire and tread underfoot everything in their way if however it should be a division of smain's forces who having encountered the corpses in the ravine are pursuing the murderers stas did not know which would be better a sudden death or new captivity in addition it flitted through his mind that if smain himself was in the division he might spare them but if he was not then the dervishes would at once kill them or what was worse torture them in a horrible manner before their death ah he thought god grant that these are animals not men in the meantime the clatter increased and changed into a thunder of hoofbeats until finally there emerged out of the darkness glittering eyes dilated nostrils and wind-tossed manes horses cried kali 
In fact, they were Gerbis and Chamis's horses. They came running, driven evidently by fright, but dashing into the circle of light, and seeing their fettered companions, they reared on their hind legs, after which, snorting, they implanted their hoofs in the ground and remained for a while motionless. But Stas did not lower his rifle. He was certain that at any moment after the horses a shaggy-haired lion or a flat-skulled panther would appear. But he waited in vain. The horses quieted slowly, and, what was more, Saba, after a certain time, ceased to scent. Instead, he turned about a few times on the spot, as dogs usually do, lay down, rolled himself into a ball, and closed his eyes. Apparently, if any rapacious animal had chased the horses, then, having smelt the smoke, or seen the reflection of the fire on the rocks, it had retreated into the distance. Something must have frightened them badly, Stas said to Kali, since they did not fear to rush by the body of the lion and the men's corpses. Master, said the boy, Kali can guess what happened. Many, many hyenas and jackals entered the ravine to get at the corpses. The horses ran before them, but the hyenas are not chasing them, for they are eating Geber and those others. That may be, but do you now unsaddle the horses, remove the utensils and bags, and bring them here. Do not fear, for the rifle will protect you. Kali does not fear, answered the boy. And pushing aside the thorns close by the rocks, he slipped out of the zareba. In the meantime, Nell came out of the tent. Saba rose at once, and, pressing his nose close to her, claimed his usual caress. But she, extending at first her hand, withdrew it at once as if with aversion. "'Stas, what has happened?' she asked. "'Nothing. Those two horses came running up. Did their hoof-beats awaken you?' "'I was awake before then and even wanted to come out of the tent, but—' "'But what?' "'I thought that you might get angry. I? At you?' And Nell raised her eyes and began to gaze at him with a peculiar look, with which she had never eyed him before. Great astonishment stole over Stas's face, for in her words and gaze he plainly read fear. "'She fears me,' he thought and in the first moment he felt something like a gleam of satisfaction. He was flattered by the thought that, after what he had accomplished, even Nell regarded him not only as a man fully matured, but as a formidable warrior spreading alarm about. But this lasted only a short time, for misfortune had developed in him an observing mind and talent. He discerned, therefore, that in those uneasy eyes of the girl could be seen, besides fright, abhorrence as it were of what had happened of the bloodshed and the horrors which she that day had witnessed he recalled how a few moments before she withdrew her hand not wishing to pat saba who had finished by strangling one of the bedouins yes stas himself felt an incubus on his breast it was one thing to read in port side about american trappers killing in the far west red-skinned indians by the dozens and another to accomplish that personally and see men alive a short while before struggling in their death throes in a pool of blood yes nell's heart undoubtedly was full of fear and at the same time aversion which would always remain with her she will fear me stas thought and in the depths of her heart involuntarily she will not cease holding it ill of me and this will be my reward for all i have done for her at this thought great bitterness swelled in his bosom for it was apparent to him that if it were not for nell he would either have been killed or would have escaped for her he suffered all that he had endured and these tortures and that hunger resulted only in this that she now stood before him frightened as if she was not the same little sister and lifted her eyes towards him not with former trustfulness but with a strange fear Stas suddenly felt very unhappy for the first time in his life he understood what it was to be moved to tears in spite of his will tears flowed to his eyes and were it not for the fact that it did not under any circumstances become a formidable warrior to weep he might perhaps have shed tears he restrained himself however and turning to the little girl asked do you fear nell 
and she replied in a low voice Somehow it is so horrible at this Stas ordered Kali to bring the saddlecloth from a saddle and covering with one of them a rock on which he had previously dozed he spread the other upon the ground and said sit here beside me near the fire how chilly the night is if sleep overcomes you rest your head upon me and you will fall asleep but nell repeated somehow it is so horrible stas wrapped her carefully in plaids and for some time they sat in silence supporting each other and illuminated by a rosy luster which crept over the rocks and sparkled on the mica plates with which the stony fissures were bespangled beyond the zareba could be heard the snorting of horses and the crunching of grass in their teeth listen now stas spoke out i had to do that Gebra threatened that he would stab us both if the lion would not be content with kali and should continue to pursue them didn't you hear him think of it he threatened by that not only me but you and he would have done it i tell you sincerely that if it were not for that threat though formerly i already was thinking of it i would not have shot at them i think i could not but he exceeded the measure you saw how cruelly before that time he treated kali and shami how vilely he betrayed us besides do you know what would have happened if they did not find smain gebra would likewise have vented his anger upon us upon you it is dreadful to think that he would have whipped you daily with the corbash and would have tortured us both to death and after our death he would have returned to fashoda and say that we died of fever now i did not do that from fiendishness but i had to think of this how to save you i was concerned only about you and his face plainly reflected that affliction which overflowed in his heart nell evidently understood this as she pressed yet more closely to him while he momentarily mastering his emotions continued thus i of course shall not change and shall guard and watch over you as before as long as they lived there was no hope of rescue now we may fly to abyssinia the abyssinians are black and wild but christians and foe of the dervishes if you only retain your health we shall succeed for it is not so very far to abyssinia and even though we do not succeed though we fall into smain's hand do not think that he will revenge himself upon us he never in his life saw either Geba or the bedouins he knew only shami but what was shami to him besides we need not tell smain that shami was with us if we succeed in reaching abyssinia then we are saved and if not you will not fare any worse but better for tyrants worse than those men probably cannot be found in the world do not fear me now and desiring to win her confidence and at the same time cheer her he began to stroke her little yellow head the little maid listened raising timidly her eyes to him evidently she wanted to say something but hesitated and feared finally she laid her head so that her hair entirely covered her face and asked in a yet lower and slightly quivering voice stas what is it dear they will not come here who stas asked with amazement those killed what are you talking about now i am afraid i am afraid and her pallid lips began to quiver silence ensued stas did not believe that the slain could rise from the dead but as it was night and their bodies lay not far away he became depressed in spirit a chill passed over his back what are you saying now he repeated then dinah taught you to fear ghosts the dead do not and he did not finish for at that moment something awe-inspiring occurred amid the stillness of the night in the depths of the ravine from the direction in which the corpses lay suddenly resounded a kind of inhuman frightful laughter in which quivered despair and joy and cruelty and suffering and pain and sobbing and derision the heart-rending and spasmodic laughter of the insane or condemned nell screamed and with her whole strength embraced stas with her arms stas's hair stood on end Sabas started up suddenly and began to growl 
Bacali, sitting at some distance, quietly raised his head and said almost gleefully, Those are hyenas gloating over Gabriel and the lion. End of Part 2 Chapter 1part two chapter two of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson in desert and wilderness by henrik sinkovich translated by max anthony dresmar part two chapter two the great events of the preceding day and the sensations of the night so tired out stas and nell that when finally slumber overcame them they fell into a deep sleep and the little girl did not appear outside the tent until about noontime stas rose somewhat earlier from a saddle cloth spread near the campfire and in expectation of his little companion he ordered kali to prepare a breakfast which in view of the late hour was to form at the same time their dinner the bright light of the day dispelled the terrors of the night both awoke not only well rested but refreshed in spirit nell looked better and felt stronger as both wanted to ride away as far as possible from the place where the slain sudanese were lying immediately after the refreshments they mounted their horses and moved ahead at that time of the day all travellers in africa stop for the noon rest and even caravans composed of negroes seek shelter under the shade of great trees for they are the so-called white hours hours of heat and silence during which the sun broils unmercifully and looking from above seems to seek whom to slay every beast at such times burrows itself in the greatest thicket the song of birds ceases the buzz of insects stops and all nature falls into silence secreting itself as if desirous of guarding against the eye of a wicked divinity but they rode on in the ravine in which one of the walls cast a deep shadow enabling them to proceed without exposing themselves to the scorching heat stas did not want to leave the ravine firstly because above they might be espied from a distance by smain's detachments and then it was easier to find in rocky crevices water which in uncovered places soaked into the ground or under the influence of the sun's rays was transformed into steam the road continuously but imperceptibly led upwards on the rocky walls could be seen from time to time yellow traces of sulphur the water in the clefts was saturated with its odor which reminded both children unpleasantly of omdurman and the Mahdists who smeared their heads with fat mixed with sulphur powder in some places muscats could be smelt but there where from high overhanging rocks magnificent cascades of lianas fell to the bottom of the ravine came an intoxicating scent of vanilla the little wanderers willingly stopped in the shade of these tapestries embroidered with purple flowers and lilies which with the leaves provided food for the horses animals could not be seen only from time to time on the crests of rocks monkeys squatted resembling on the blue background those fantastic idols which in india adorn the borders of temples big males with long manes displayed their teeth at saba or stretched out their jaws in sign of amazement and rage and at the same time jumped about blinking with their eyes and scratching their sides but saba accustomed already to the sight of them did not pay much heed to their menaces they rode briskly joy at recovering liberty drove away from stas's breast that incubus which had throttled him during the night his mind was now occupied with the thought of what was to be done farther how to lead nell and himself from a locality in which they were threatened by new captivity with the dervishes what measures to adopt during the long journey through the wilderness in order not to die of hunger and thirst and finally whither to go he knew already from hatim that the abyssinian boundary in a direct line from fashoda was not more than five days journey and he calculated that this would be about one hundred english miles 
now from their departure from Frashoda, almost two weeks had elapsed so it was clear that they had not gone by the shortest route but in seeking smain must have turned considerably towards the south he recollected that on the sixth day they had crossed a river which was not the nile and that afterwards before the country began to rise they rode around great swamps at school in port said the geography of africa was taught very thoroughly and in Stas's memory remained the name of balor designating an expansion of the little known river sobat a tributary of the nile he was not indeed certain whether they had passed that expansion but assumed that they had it occurred to him that smain desiring to capture slaves could not seek for them directly west of fashoda as that country was already entirely depopulated by dervishes and smallpox but that he would have to go to localities which heretofore were not visited by the expedition stas deduced from this that they were following smain's trail and the thought frightened him in the first moments he therefore reflected whether it would not be better to abandon the ravine which turned more and more plainly towards the south and go directly eastward but after a moment's consideration he relinquished the plan on the contrary to follow the tracks of smain's band at two or three days distance appeared to him to be the safest course as it was very improbable that smain would return with his human wares by way of the same circuitous route instead of making his way directly for the nile stas understood also that abyssinia could be reached only from the southern side where that country borders on a great wilderness and not from the eastern boundary which was carefully guarded by dervishes as a result of these thoughts he determined to venture as far as possible towards the south they might encounter negroes either refugees from the banks of the white nile or natives but of the two evils stas preferred to have dealings with the blacks rather than the mahdists he reckoned too that in the event of meeting refugees or natives kali and mia might prove useful it was enough to glance at the young negress to surmise that she belonged to the dinka or shiluk tribe for she had uncommonly long and thin limbs so characteristic of both of those tribes dwelling on the banks of the nile and wading like cranes and storks during its inundation kali on the other hand though under geb's hand he became like a skeleton had an entirely different stature he was short and thick and strongly built he had powerful shoulders and his feet in comparison with mia's feet were relatively small as he did not speak arabian at all and spoke poorly the kiswahili language with which one can converse almost anywhere in africa and which stas had learned fairly well from the natives of zanzibar working on the canal it was evident that he came from some distant region stas determined to sound him upon this point kali what is the name of your people he asked wahima answered the young negro is that a great nation great which is making war upon the bad samburus and takes their cattle is that country like this no there are mountains and great water how is that water called we call it the dark water Stas thought that the boy might come from the neighborhood of the Albert Nyanza, which up to that time had been in the hands of Emin Pasha. So, desiring to confirm this, he asked further, Does not a white chief live there who has black smoking boats and troops? No, the old men with us say that they saw white men. Here Kali parted his fingers. One, two, three. Yes, there were three of them in long white dresses. They were looking for tusks Kali did not see them for he was not in the world But Kali's father received them and gave them many cows What is your father the king of Wahima? Stas was flattered a little by the idea that he had a prince royal for a servant Would you like to see your father? Kali wants to see his mother What would you do if we met the Wahimas and what would they do? The Wahimas would fall on their faces before Kali Lead us to them then you shall remain with them and rule after your father and we will go further to the sea Kali cannot find the way to them and cannot remain 
for Kali loves the great master and the daughter of the moon Stas turned merrily to his companions and said Nell you have become the daughter of the moon But glancing at her he saddened suddenly for it occurred to him that the emaciated girl actually looked with her pale and transparent countenance more like a lunar than an earthly being the young negro became silent for a while then he repeated kali loves buana kubwa for buana kubwa did not kill kali only geba and gives kali a great deal to eat and he began to stroke his breast repeating with evident delight a great deal of meat a great deal of meat Stas wanted to ascertain how Kali became the slave of the dervishes It appeared that from the night when he was caught in a pit dug for zebras He had gone through so many hands that Stas could not tell from his statements what countries he had passed through and by what route he had been conducted to Fashoda Stas was much impressed by what he said about the dark water for if he came from that region of Albert Nyanza Albert Edward Nyanza or even Victoria Nyanza near which lay the kingdoms of the Anyoro and the Uganda He would undoubtedly have heard something about Emin Pasha About his troops and about the steamers which aroused the wonder and fear of the Negroes Tanganyika was too far away There remained only the supposition that Kali's nation had its seat somewhere nearer for this reason their meeting with the Wahimas was not an utter improbability After a few hours ride the Sun began to descend the heat decreased considerably They chanced upon a wide valley in which they found water and a score or more of wild fig trees So they stopped to rest their horses and partake of provisions as The rocky walls at that place were lower Stas ordered Kali to climb to the top and ascertain whether smoke could not be seen in the vicinity Kali complied with the order and in the twinkling of an eye reached the edge of the rocks Peering around carefully in all directions He slid down a thick liana stalk and announced that there was no smoke, but that there were niyama It was easy to surmise that he was speaking not of guinea fowl But of some bulkier game for he pointed at Stas's short rifle and afterwards put his finger on his head to indicate horned game Stas in turn climbed up and leaning his head carefully over the edge began to look ahead Nothing obstructed his view of the expanse as the old high jungle was burnt away and the new which had already sprouted from the blackened ground was barely a few inches high As far as the eye could reach there could be seen sparsely growing great trees with trunks singed by the fire under the shade of one of them grazed a flock of antelopes which from the shape of their bodies resembled horses and from their heads buffaloes The Sun penetrating through the baobab leaves cast quivering bright spots upon their brown backs There were ten of them the distance was not more than 100 paces But the wind blew from the animal towards the ravine So they grazed quietly not suspecting any danger Stas desiring to replenish his supplies with meat shot the nearest one which tumbled to the ground as if struck by lightning The rest of the flock ran away and with them a great buffalo Which he did not perceive before as he lay hidden behind a stone The boy not from necessity, but from a sporting vein choosing the moment when the animal turned his side somewhat sent a bullet after him The buffalo staggered greatly after the shot drew in his haunches but rushed away and before Stas was able to reload Disappeared in the unevenness of the ground Before the smoke blew away Kali sat upon the antelope and cut open its abdomen with Geber's knife Stas walked towards him desiring to inspect more closely the animal and Great was his surprise when after a while the young Negro with blood-stained hands handed to him the reeking liver of the antelope Why are you giving me that he asked? Missouri, Missouri, Buana Kubwa, eat at once. Eat it yourself, replied Stas, indignant at the proposition. Kali did not allow this command to be repeated, but immediately began to tear the liver with his teeth and greedily gulped down the raw pieces. Seeing that Stas gazed at him with loathing, 
he did not cease between one gulp and another to repeat Missouri Missouri in this manner he ate over half of the liver after which he started to dress the antelope He did this with uncommon quickness and skill so that soon the hide was flayed and the haunches were separated from the backbone Then Stas, somewhat surprised that Saba was not present at this work whistled for him to come to a bounteous feast of the four parts of the animal But Saba did not appear at all Instead Kali who was bending over the antelope raised his head and said the big dog ran after the buffalo Did you see him Stas asked Kali saw Saying this he placed the loin of the antelope on his head and the two haunches on his shoulders and started for the ravine Stas whistled a few times more and waited but seeing that he was doing this in vain followed Kali in the ravine Mia was already engaged in cutting the thorns for a zareba while Nell picking with her fingers the last guinea fowl asked did you whistle for Saba he ran after you he ran after a buffalo which I wounded with a shot and I am worried Stas answered those animals are terribly ferocious and so powerful that even a lion fears to attack them Saba may fare badly if he begins a fight with such an adversary Hearing this Nell became alarmed and declared that she would not go to sleep until Saba returned Stas seeing her grief was angry at himself because he had not concealed the danger from her and began to comfort her I would go after them with the rifle he said but they must now be very far away and soon the night will fall and the tracks will be invisible the buffalo is badly wounded and I have a hope that he will fall in any case he will weaken through loss of blood and if he should rush at Saba Saba will be able to run away yes he may return during the night but he surely will return Although he said this he did not greatly believe his own words for he remembered what he had read of the extraordinary revengeful nature of the African Buffalo Which though heavily wounded will run about in a circuit and lie in ambush near a path over which the hunter goes and afterwards attack him unexpectedly pin him on its horns and toss him into the air Something similar might happen to Saba not to speak of other dangers which threatened him on the return to the camp during the night in fact night soon fell Kali and Mia put up a zareba built a fire and prepared supper Saba did not return Nell became more and more worried and finally began to cry Stas with difficulty persuaded her to lie down Promising her that he would wait for Saba and as soon as the day should break he himself would search for the dog and bring him back Nell indeed entered the tent but at intervals she put her little head from under its folds asking whether the dog had not returned Sleep overcame her only at midnight when Mia came out to relieve Kali who watched the fire Why does the daughter of the moon weep the young Negro asked Stas when both lay down on the saddlecloths? Kali does not want that She is sorry for Saba whom the buffalo has surely killed but perhaps he did not kill him replied the black boy After this they became silent and Stas fell into a deep sleep It was still dark however when he awoke for the chill began to incommode him The fire was partly extinct Mia who was to watch the fire dozed and after a time had ceased throwing fuel upon the flames The saddle cloth on which Kali slept was unoccupied Stas himself threw brushwood on the fire after which he shook the negress and asked where is Kali? For a time she stared at him unconsciously Afterwards coming to her senses. She said Kali took Geber's sword and went beyond the zareba I thought he wanted to cut more brushwood, but he did not return at all Did he go long ago long? Stas waited for some time, but as the Negro did not return he involuntarily propounded to himself the question did he run away and his heart was oppressed by the disagreeable feeling which human ingratitude always arouses why he had interceded for this Kali and defended him when Gaber vented his rage upon him for whole days and afterwards he had saved the slave's life Nell was always kind to him and had wept over his unhappy lot 
and both treated him in the best possible manner now he ran away he himself had said that he did not know in which direction the wahima settlements were situated and thought he would be unable to find them he nevertheless ran away Stas again recollected those African travels in Port Said and the narratives of travelers about the stupidity of Negroes who throwing away packages run away although in their escape they are threatened by inevitable death in fact Kali having as his only weapon Gebu's Sudanese sword must die of starvation or if he did not fall again into the captivity of the dervishes would become the prey of wild animals ah <sighs> ingrate and fool Stas then began to meditate over this how far more difficult and vexatious the journey without Kali would be for them and how much heavier the work to water the horses and fetter them for the night to pitch the tent build zaribas watch during the journey that none of the supplies and packets with things were lost to flay and dress the slain animals all this for want of the young negro was to fall upon him and he admitted in his soul that as to some of these employments flaying the hides of animals for instance he did not have the slightest knowledge ha it will be hard he said but necessary in the meantime the sun emerged from beyond the horizon and as usually happens in the tropics in a moment it was day somewhat later the water for bathing which mia had prepared during the night for the little lady began to splash which meant that Nell had risen and was dressing herself in fact she soon appeared already dressed with a comb in her hand and her hair still unkempt and Saba she asked he has not come yet the lips of the little girl at once began to quiver he may yet return said Stas you remember that on the desert sometimes he was not seen for two days and afterwards he always overtook us you said that you would go and search for him i cannot why stas i cannot leave you in the ravine alone with mia and kali kali is not here stas was silent not knowing whether to tell her the whole truth but as the matter could not be concealed he thought it best to divulge it at once kali took geber's sword he said and in the night went away i do not know where who knows whether he has not run away the negroes often do that even to their own destruction i am sorry for him but he may understand that he has acted like a fool and further words were interrupted by saba's joyful barking which filled the whole ravine nell threw the comb on the ground and wanted to rush out to meet him she was prevented however by the thorns of the zareba stas with the greatest haste began to scatter them about but before he had opened a passage saba appeared and after him kali as shiny and wet from the dew as if after the greatest rain immense joy possessed both children and when kali out of breath from fatigue came inside the enclosure nell flung her white hands around his black neck and hugged him with all her strength and he said kali did not want to see the bibi cry so kali found the dog good boy kali answered stas slapping him on the shoulders did you not fear in the night that you would meet a lion or a panther kali feared but kali went answered the boy these words gained still more the hearts of the children stas at nell's request took out from one of the small pieces of luggage a string of glass beads with which they had been provided by the greek calliopoli on their departure from omdurman with it he decorated kali's splendid throat while the latter overjoyed with the gift glanced at once with pride at mia and said mia has no beads and kali has for kali is the great world in this manner was the devotion of the black boy rewarded on the other hand saba received a sharp rebuke from which for the second time in nell's service he learned that he was perfectly horrid and that if once more did anything like that he would be led by a string like a puppy he heard this wagging his tail in, in quite an equivocal manner nell however claimed that it could be seen from his eyes that he was ashamed and that he certainly blushed only this could not be seen because his mouth was covered with hair 
After this followed breakfast consisting of excellent wild figs and a rump of venison During the breakfast Kali related his adventures while Stas interpreted them in English for Nell who did not understand the Kishwahili language The buffalo as it appeared fled far it was difficult for Kali to find the tracks as it was a moonless night Fortunately rain had fallen two days before and the ground was not too hard in consequence of this the heavy animals hoofs left deep imprints upon it Kali sought them with the aid of his toes and walked a long distance The buffalo finally fell and must have dropped dead as there was no sign of a fight between him and Saba When Kali found them Saba had already devoured the greater part of the fore quarter of the buffalo and Although he was fully sated he would not permit the approach of two hyenas and about a dozen of jackals which stood waiting until the more powerful rapacious creature finished his feast and left the boy complained that the dog also growled at him but he then threatened him with the anger of the great master and the bibi after which he grabbed him by the collar and dragged him from the buffalo and he did not let go of him until they reached the ravine with this ended the narrative of Kali's nocturnal adventures after which all in good humor mounted their horses and proceeded on their journey One alone long-limbed Mia though quiet and meek gazed with envy at the young Negro's necklace and Saba's collar and with sorrow in her heart thought Both of them are the great world and I have only a brass ring on one leg End of part two chapter two Part two chapter three of in desert and wilderness this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox dot org recording by Lynn Thompson in desert and wilderness by Henrik Sinkovich translated by Max Antony Dresmar Chapter three During the following three days they rode continuously in the ravine and always upwards The days were as a rule scorching the nights alternately cool or sultry The rainy season was approaching from beyond the horizon here and there emerged clouds white as milk but deep and heavy at the sides could already be seen stripes of rain and distant rainbows Towards the morning of the third day one of these clouds burst above their heads like a barrel from which the hoops had flown off and Sprinkled them with a warm and copious rain which fortunately was of brief duration Afterwards the weather became fine and they could ride farther Guinea fowls again appeared in such numbers that stars shot at them without dismounting from his horse and in this manner got five Which more than sufficed for one meal even counting Saba Travel in the refreshed air was not burdensome and the abundance of game and water removed fears of hunger and thirst On the whole everything passed more easily than they had anticipated so then good humor did not desert Stas, and riding beside the little girl he chattered merrily with her and at times even joked do you know Nell? he said when for a while he stopped the horses under a great breadfruit tree from which kali and mia cut off fruit resembling huge melons at times it seems to me that i am a knight errant and what is a knight errant asked Nell, turning her pretty head towards him Long long ago in the medieval days there were knights who rode over the world looking for adventure They fought with giants and dragons and do you know that each one had his lady whom he protected and defended and Am I such a lady? Stas pondered for a while after which he replied no you are too small all those others were grown up and it never occurred to him that probably no knight-errant had ever performed as much for his lady as he had done for his little sister Plainly it appeared to him that whatever he had done was done as a matter of course But Nell felt aggrieved at his words so with a pout she said and You once said in the desert that I acted like a person of 13 Aha Well that was once 
but you are eight. Then after ten years I shall be eighteen. A great thing, and I shall be twenty-four. At such age a man does not think of any ladies, for he has something else to do. That is self-evident. And what will you do? I shall be an engineer, or a sailor, or if there is a war in Poland I shall go to fight, just as my father did. While she asked uneasily, but you will return to Port Said. We both must return there first. To papa, the little girl replied. And her eyes were dimmed with sorrow and longing. Fortunately, there flew at that moment a small flock of wonderfully fine parrots, grey with rosy heads, and a rosy lining under their wings. The children at once forgot about their previous conversation, and began to follow the flight with their eyes. The little flock circled about a group of euphorbias, and lighted upon sycamores, growing at some distance amidst the branches of which resounded voices, similar to a wordy conference or a quarrel. "'Those are parrots which are very easily taught to talk,' Stas said. "'When we stop at a place for a length of time, I will try to catch one for you.' "'Oh, Stas, thank you,' answered Nell gleefully. "'I will call it Daisy.' In the meantime, Mia and Kali, having cut off fruit from the breadfruit tree, loaded the horses with it, and the little caravan proceeded. In the afternoon it began to cloud, and at times brief showers occurred, filling the crevices and the depressions in the earth. Kali predicted a great downpour, so it occurs to Stas that the ravine, which was becoming narrower and narrower, would not be a safe shelter for the night, for it could change into a torrent. For this reason he determined to pass the night above, and this decision delighted Nell, particularly when Kali, who was sent to reconnoitre, returned and announced that not far away was a small grove, composed of various trees, and in it many monkeys, not as ugly as the baboons which up to that time they had met. Chancing thereafter upon a place at which the rocky walls were low, and sloped gradually, he led the horses out, and before it grew dark they built a barricade for the night. Nell's tent stood on a high and dry spot close to a big white ant hillock, which barred the access from one side, and for that reason lessened the labour of building the zareba. Nearby stood a large tree with widely spread boughs, which, covered by dense foliage, furnished shelter against rain. In front of the zareba grew single clumps of trees, and further a thick forest entangled with climbing plants, beyond which loftily shot out crowns of strange palm trees resembling gigantic fans or outspread peacock tails. Stas learned from Kali that before the second rainy season, that is, in autumn, it was dangerous to pass the night under these palm trees, for the huge fruit, at that time ripe, breaks off unexpectedly and falls from a considerable distance with such force that it can kill a person or even a horse. At present, however, the fruit was in bud, and in the distance before the sun set there could be seen, under the crowns, agile little monkeys which, leaping gaily, chased each other. Stas with Kali prepared a great supply of wood, sufficient for the whole night, and, as at times strong blasts of hot air broke out, they reinforced the zareba with pickets, which the young negro whittled with Geber's sword, and stuck in the ground. This precaution was not at all superfluous, as a powerful whirlwind could scatter the thorny boughs with which the zareba was constructed, and facilitate an attack by beasts of prey. However, immediately after sunset the wind ceased, and instead the air became sultry and heavy. Through the rifts in the clouds the stars glittered here and there, but afterwards the night became so utterly dark that one could not see a step ahead. The little wanderers grouped about the fire, while their ears were assailed by the loud cries and shrieks of monkeys, who in the adjacent forest created a veritable bedlam. This was accompanied by the whining of jackals and by various other voices in which could be recognized uneasiness and fright before something which under the cover of darkness threatened every living being in the wilderness. Suddenly the voices subsided, for in the dusky depths resounded the groans of a lion. The horses, which were pastured at some distance on the young jungle, began to approach the fire, starting up suddenly on their fettered forelegs, 
while the hair on Saba, who usually was so brave, bristled, and with tail curled under him, he nestled close to the people, evidently seeking their protection. The groaning again resounded, as though it came from under the ground, deep, heavy, strained, as if the beast with difficulty drew it from its powerful lungs. It proceeded lowly over the ground, alternately increased and subsided, passing at times into a hollow, prodigiously mournful moan. Carly, throw fuel into the fire, commanded Stas. The negro threw upon the campfire an armful of boughs so hastily that at first whole sheaves of sparks burst out, after which a high flame shot up. Stas, the lion will not attack us, will he? whispered Nell, pulling the boy by the sleeve. No, he will not attack us. See how high the zareba is? And speaking thus, he actually believed that danger did not threaten them. But he was alarmed about the horses, which pressed more and more closely to the fence and might trample it down. In the meantime, the groans changed into a protracted, thunderous roar, by which all living creatures are struck with terror. And the nerves of people, who do not know what fear is, shake, just as the window panes rattle from distant cannonading. Stas cast a fleeting glance at Nell, and seeing her quivering chin and moist eyes, said, Do not fear. Don't cry. And she answered as if with difficulty. I do not want to cry. Only my eyes perspire. Oh. The last ejaculation burst from her lips because at that moment, from the direction of the forest, thundered a second roar, even stronger than the first, for it was nearer. The horses began to push upon the zareba, and were it not for the long and harder steel thorns of the acacia branches, they would have demolished it. Saba growled, and at the same time trembled like a leaf, while Kali began to repeat with a broken voice, Master, two, two, two. And the lions, aware of each other's presence, did not cease roaring, and the horrible concert continued in the darkness incessantly, for when one beast became silent, the other began again. Stars could not distinguish from where the sounds came, as the echoes repeated them in the ravine. Rock sent them back to rock. They ascended and descended, filling the forest and the jungle and the entire darkness with thunder and fear. To the boy one thing seemed certain, and that was that they approached nearer and nearer. Kali perceived likewise that the lions ran about the encampment, making a smaller circle each moment, and that, prevented from making an attack only by the glare of the flames, they were expressing their dissatisfaction, and fear by their roar. Evidently, however, he thought that danger threatened only the horses, as, spreading his fingers, he said, The lions will kill one, two, not all, not all. Throw wood into the fire, repeated Stas. A livelier flame burst forth. The roars suddenly ceased. But Kali, raising his head and gazing upwards, began to listen. What is it? Stas asked. Rain replied the negro stars in turn listened the branches of the tree mantled the tent and the whole zareba so that not a drop of rain fell upon the ground but above could be heard the rustle of leaves as the sultry air was not stirred by the slightest breeze it was easy to surmise that it was the rain which began to murmur in the jungle the rustle increased with each moment and after a time the children saw drops flowing from the leaves similar in the luster of the fire to ruddy pearls as kali had forecast a downpour began the rustle changed into a roar ever increasing drops fell and finally through the dense foliage whole streams of water began to penetrate the camp fire darkened in vain kali threw whole armfuls into it on the surface the wet boughs smoked only and below the burning wood began to hiss, and the flame, however much it was replenished, began to be extinguished. When the downpour quenches the fire, the zareba will defend us, Stas said to pacify Nell. After which he conducted the little girl into the tent and wrapped her in plaids, but he himself went out as quickly as possible as the briefly interrupted roars had broken out again. This time they sounded considerably nearer, and as if they were gleeful. 
the downpour intensified with each moment the rain pattered on the hard leaves and splashed if the campfire had not been under the shelter of the boughs it would have been quenched at once but as it was there hovered over it mainly smoke amid which narrow blue little flames glittered Carly gave up the task and did not add any more deadwood Instead he flung a rope around the tree and with its aid climbed higher and higher on the trunk What are you doing stars asked Carly climbs the tree? What for shouted the boy indignant at the Negro's selfishness? bright dreadful flashes of lightning rent the darkness and Carly's reply was drowned by a peal of thunder which shook heaven and the wilderness Simultaneously a whirlwind broke out tugged the boughs of the tree swept away in the twinkling of an eye the campfire Seized the embers still burning under the ashes and carried them with sheaves of sparks into the jungle Impenetrable darkness temporarily encompassed the camp a terrible tropical storm raged on earth and in the sky thunder followed thunder lightning lightning the gory zigzags of thunderbolts rent the sky black as a pall on the neighboring rocks appeared strange blue balls which sometimes rolled along the ravine and then burst with a blinding light and broke out with a peal so terrible that it seemed as if the rocks would be reduced to powder from the shock afterwards darkness again followed stars became alarmed about nell and went groping in the darkness to the tent the tent protected by the white ant hillock and the giant tree trunk stood yet but the first strong buffet of the whirlwind might pull out the ropes and carry it the lord knows where and the whirlwind subsided then broke out again with a fury carrying waves of rain and clouds of leaves and branches broken off in the adjacent forest stars was beset with despair he did not know whether to leave nell in the tent or lead her out of it in the first case she might get entangled in the rope and be seized with the linen folds and in the other she would get a thorough drenching and also would be carried away as stars though beyond comparison stronger with the greatest difficulty could keep on his feet the problem was solved by the whirlwind which a moment later carried away the top of the tent the linen walls now did not offer any shelter nothing else remained to do but to wait in the darkness in which the lions lurked until the storm passed away Stas conjectured that probably the lions had sought shelter from the tempest in the neighboring forest But he was certain that after the storm they would return The danger of the situation increased because the wind had totally swept away the zareba Everything was threatened with destruction The rifle could not avail for anything nor could his energy in the presence of the storm thunderbolts hurricane rain darkness and the lions which might be concealed but a few paces away he felt disarmed and helpless the linen walls tugged by the wind splashed them with water from all sides so enclosing nell in his arms he led her from the tent after which both nestled close to the trunk of the tree awaiting death or divine mercy at this moment between one blow of the wind and another Carly's voice reached them barely audible amidst the splashing of the rain great master up the tree up the tree and Simultaneously the end of a wet rope lowered from above touched the boy's shoulder Tie the BB and Carly will pull her up the Negro continued to shout Stars did not hesitate a moment Wrapping Nell in a saddle cloth in order that the rope should not cut her body He tied a girdle around her after which he lifted her and shouted pull The first boughs of the tree were quite low so Nell's aerial journey was brief Carly soon seized her with his powerful arms and placed her between the trunk and a giant bough Where there was sufficient room for half a dozen of such diminutive beings No wind could blow her away from there and in addition even though water flowed all over the tree the trunk about 15 feet thick shielded her at least from new waves of rain borne obliquely by the wind having attended to the safety of the little bb the negro again lowered the rope for stars but he like a captain who is the last to leave a sinking ship ordered mia to go ahead of him carly did not at all need to pull her as in a moment she climbed the rope with skill and agility as if she were the full sister of a chimpanzee 
For Stars it was considerably more difficult, but he was too well trained an athlete not to overcome the weight of his own body together with the rifle and a score of cartridges with which he filled his pockets. In this manner all four found themselves in the tree. Stars was so accustomed to think of Nell in every situation that now he was occupied above all in ascertaining whether she was not in danger of falling, whether she had sufficient room, and whether she could lie down comfortably. Satisfied in this respect, he began to rack his brains as to how to protect her from the rain. But for this there was no help. It would have been easy to construct during the daytime some kind of roof over her head, but now they were enveloped in such darkness that they could not see each other at all. If the storm at last passed away, and if they succeeded in starting the fire again, they might dry Nell's dress. Stars, with despair, thought that the little girl, soaked to the skin, would undoubtedly on the following day suffer from the first attack of fever. He feared that towards the morning after the storm it would be as cool as it was on the previous night. Thus far the wind was rather warm, and the rain as though heated. Stars was surprised at its persistence, as he knew that the more strongly a storm raged, the shorter was its duration. After a long time the thunder abated, and the buffets of the wind weakened, but the rain continued to fall, less copious indeed than before, but so heavy and thick that the leaves did not afford any protection against it. From below came the murmur of water, as if the whole jungle were transformed into a lake. Stars thought that in the ravine certain death would have awaited them. Immense sorrow possessed him at the thought of what might have become of Saba, and he did not dare to speak of him to Nell. He nevertheless had a slight hope that the intelligent dog would find a safe haven among the rocks projecting above the ravine. There was not, however, a possibility of going to him with any aid. They sat, therefore, one beside the other amid the expanding boughs, drenched and waiting for the day. After the lapse of a few more hours the air began to cool, and the rain finally ceased. The water, too, flowed down the slope to a lower place, as they could not hear a splash or a murmur. Stas had observed on the previous days that Kali understood how to stir up a fire with wet twigs, so it occurred to him to order the negro to descend and try whether he would not succeed this time but at the moment in which he turned to him something happened which froze the blood in the veins of all four. The deep silence of the night was rent suddenly by the squeaking of horses, horrible, shrill, full of pain, fears, and mortal dismay. Some mischief was afoot in the darkness. There resounded short rattlings in the throat, afterwards hollow groans, a snorting, a second squeak yet more penetrating, after which all was quiet. "'Lions, great master! Lions killing horses!' whispered Kali. There was something so horrible in this night attack, in the superior force of the monsters, and in the sudden slaughter of the defenceless animals, that Stars for a time was struck with consternation, and forgot about the rifle. What, after all, would it have availed him to shoot in such darkness? Unless for this, that those midnight assassins, if the flash and report should frighten them, would abandon the horses already killed and start after those which were scared away and had run from the camp as far as their fettered legs would permit them. Stas's flesh began to creep at the thought of what would have happened if they had remained below. Nell, nestling close to him, shook as if she already were suffering the first attack of fever, but the tree at least protected them from an attack of lions. Kali plainly had saved their lives. It was, however, a horrible night, the most horrible in the entire journey. They sat like drenched birds on a twig, listening to what was happening below, and there for some time a deep silence continued, but soon came a peculiar sound as though of lapping, smacking of torn pieces of flesh, together with the horse's heavy breathing and the groans of the monsters. The odour of the raw meat and blood reached up to the tree as the lions feasted not farther than twenty paces from the zareba. And they feasted so long, anger seized Stars. He seized the rifle and fired in the direction of the sounds. But he was answered only by a broken, irritated roar, 
after which resounded the cracking of bones, rattling in powerful jaws. In the depths glared the blue and red eyes of hyenas and jackals waiting for their turn. And thus the long hours of the night passed away. End of chapter 3part two chapter four of in desert and wilderness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson in desert and wilderness by henry sinkovich translated by max anthony dresmal chapter four the sun finally rose and illuminated the jungle, groups of trees, and the forest. The lions had disappeared before the first ray began to gleam on the horizon. Stas commanded Kali to build a fire. Mia was ordered to take Nell's clothes out of the leather bag in which they were packed, to dry them, and to dress anew the little girl as soon as possible. While Stas himself, taking his rifle, proceeded to visit the camp, and at the same time to view the devastation wrought by the storm and the two midnight assassins immediately beyond the zareba of which only the pickets remained lay the first horse almost half devoured about a hundred paces farther the second barely touched and immediately behind him the third disemboweled and with crushed head all presented a horrible sight their eyes were open full of settled terror and their teeth were bared the ground was trampled upon in the depressions were whole puddles of blood Stas was seized with such rage that at the moment he almost wished that the shaggy head of a marauder sluggish after a nocturnal feast would emerge from some cluster of trees that he might put a bullet in him but he had to postpone his revenge to a later time for at present he had something else to do it was necessary to find and capture the remaining horses the boy assumed that they must have sought shelter in the forest and that the same was true of saba whose body was nowhere to be seen the hope that the faithful companion in misfortune had not fallen a victim to the predaceous beasts pleased stars so much that he gained more courage his happiness was yet augmented by the discovery of the donkey it appeared that the sagacious long-eared creature did not wish to fatigue himself by a too distant flight he had ensconced himself outside of the zareba in a corner formed by the white ant hillock and the tree and there having his head and sides protected had awaited developments prepared in an emergency to repel an attack by kicking heroically with his heels but the lions apparently did not perceive him at all so when the sun rose and danger passed away he deemed it proper to lie down and rest after the dramatic sensations of the night stars strolling about the camp finally discovered upon the softened ground the imprint of horses hoofs the tracks led in the direction of the forest and afterwards turned towards the ravine this was a favourable circumstance for the capture of the horses in the ravine did not present any great difficulties between ten and twenty paces farther he found in the grass the fetters which one of the horses had broken in his escape this one must have run away so far that for the time being he must be regarded as lost on the other hand the two espied by stars were behind a low rock not in the hollow itself but on the brink one of them was rolling about while the other was cropping the new light green grass both looked unusually exhausted as if after a long journey but the daylight had banished fear from their hearts so they greeted stars with a short friendly neigh the horse which was rolling about started to his feet the boy observed that this one also had freed himself from his fetters but fortunately he apparently preferred to remain with his companion instead of running away wherever his eyes should lead him stars left both horses near the rock and went to the brink of the ravine to ascertain whether a farther journey by way of it was feasible and he saw that owing to the great declivity the water had flowed away and the bottom was almost dry 
after a while his attention was attracted to a white object entangled in the climbing plants in the recess of the opposite rocky wall it appeared that it was the top of the tent which the wind had carried as far as that and driven into the thicket so that the water could not carry it away the tent at any rate assured nell of a better protection than a hut hurriedly constructed of boughs so its recovery greatly delighted stas but his joy increased still more when from a lower recess partly hidden by lianas saba sprang out holding in his teeth some kind of animal whose head and tail hung from his jaws the powerful dog in the twinkling of an eye reached the top and laid at stas's feet a striped hyena with broken back and gnawed foot after which he began to wag his tail and, and bark joyfully as if he wanted to say i admit that i behaved like a coward before the lions but to tell the truth you sat perched on the tree like guinea fowls look however i did not waste the night altogether and he was so proud of himself that stas was barely able to induce him to leave the bad smelling animal on the spot and not carry it as a gift to nell when they both returned a good fire was burning in the camp water was bubbling in the utensils in which boiled durrow grain two guinea fowls and smoked strips of venison nell was already attired in a dry dress but looked so wretched and pale that stas became alarmed about her and taking her hand to ascertain whether she had a fever asked nell what ails you nothing stas only i do want to sleep so much i believe you after such a night thank god your hands are cool ah what a night it was no wonder you want to sleep i do also but don't you feel sick my head aches a little stas placed his palm on her head her little head was as cold as her hands this however only proved great exhaustion and weakness so the boy sighed and said eat something warm and immediately afterwards lie down to sleep and you will sleep until the evening today at least the weather is fine and it will not be as it was yesterday and nell glanced at him with fear but we will not pass the night here no not here for there lie the gnawed remains of the horses we will select some other tree or will go to the ravine and there will build a zareba such as the world has not seen you will sleep as peacefully as in port Said. But she folded her little hands and began to beg him with tears that they should ride farther as in that horrible place she would not be able to close her eyes and surely would become ill and in this way she begged him in this way she repeated gazing into his eyes what stas well so that he agreed to everything then we shall ride by way of the ravine he said for there is shade there only promise me that if you feel weak or sick you will tell me i'm strong enough tie me to the saddle and i will sleep easily on the road no i shall place you on my horse and i shall hold you kali and mia will ride on the other and the donkey will carry the tent and things very well very well immediately after breakfast you must take a nap we cannot start anyway before noon it is necessary to catch the horses to fold the tent to rearrange the packs part of the things we shall leave here for now we have but two horses altogether this will require a few hours and in the meantime you will sleep and refresh yourself today will be hot but shade will not be lacking under the tree and you and mia and kali i am so sorry that i alone shall sleep while you will be tiring yourselves on the contrary we shall have time to nap don't worry about me in port side during examination time i often did not sleep whole nights of which my father knew nothing my classmates also did not sleep but a man is not a little fly like you you have no idea how you look today just like glass there remain only eyes and tufts of hair there is no face at all he said this jestingly but in his soul he feared as by the strong daylight nell plainly had a sickly countenance and for the first time he clearly understood that if it continued thus the poor child not only might but must die at this thought his legs trembled for he suddenly felt that, that in case of her death he would not have anything to live for or a reason for returning to port side for what would i then have to do 
he thought. For a while he turned away in order that Nell might not observe the grief and fear in his eyes, and afterwards went to the things deposited under the tree. He threw aside the saddle-cloth the cartridge-box was covered, opened it, and began to search for something. He had hidden there in a small glass bottle the last of the quinine powders, and had guarded it like an eye in the head, for the black hour, that is, for the emergency when Nell should be fever-stricken. But now he was almost certain that after such a night the first attack would come, so he determined to prevent it. He did this with a heavy heart, thinking of what would happen later, and were it not that it did not become a man and the leader of a caravan to weep he would have burst into tears over this last powder. So, desiring to conceal his emotion, he assumed a very stern mien, and, addressing the little girl, said, Nell, before you eat, take the rest of the quinine. She, on the other hand, asked, But if you catch the fever, then I will shiver. Take it, I tell you. She took it without further resistance, for from the time he killed the Sudanese she feared him a little notwithstanding all his efforts for her comfort and the kindness he evinced towards her afterwards they sat down to breakfast and after the fatigue of the night the hot broth of guinea fowl tasted delicious nell fell asleep immediately after the refreshment and slept for several hours stas kali and mia during that time put the caravan in order they brought from the ravine the top of the tent saddled the horses and put the packages on the donkey, and buried under the roots of the tree those things which they could not take with them. Drowsiness terribly assailed them at the work, and Stas, from fear that they should fall asleep, permitted himself and them to take short naps in turn. It was perhaps two o'clock when they started on their further journey. Stas held Nell before him. Kali rode with Mia on the other horse. They did not ride at once down the ravine, but proceeded between its brink and the forest. The young jungle had grown considerably during the rainy night. The soil under it, however, was black and bore traces of fire. It was easy to surmise that Smain had passed that way with his division, or that the fire driven far by a strong gale had swept over the dry jungle. And, finally encountering a damp forest, had passed on by a not very wide track between it and the ravine. Stas wanted to ascertain whether traces of Smain's camp or imprints of hoofs could not be found on this track, and with pleasure he became convinced that nothing resembling them could be seen. Kali, who was well versed in such matters, claimed positively that the fire must have been borne by the wind, and that since that time at least a fortnight must have elapsed. This proves, observed Stas, that Smain, with his Mardists, is already the Lord knows where, and in no case shall we fall into his hands. Afterwards, he and Nell began to gaze curiously at the vegetation, as thus far they had not risen so close to a tropical forest. They rode now along its very edge in order to have the shade over their heads. The soil here was moist and soft, overgrown with dark green grass moss and ferns here and there lay decomposed trunks covered as though with a carpet of most beautiful orchids with flowers brightly colored like butterflies and brightly colored cups in the center of the crown wherever the sun reached the ground was gilded by other odd orchids small and yellow in which two petals protruding on the sides of a third petal created a resemblance to the head of a little animal with big ears ending abruptly in some places the forest was lined with bushes of wild jasmine draped in garlands with thin climbing plants blooming rose-coloured the shallow hollows and depressions were overgrown with ferns compressed into one impenetrable thicket here low and expansive there high entwined with climbing plants as though distaffs reaching up to the first boughs of the trees and spreading under them a delicate green lace in the depths there was a great variety of trees date raffia fan palm sycamore breadfruit euphorbia immense varieties of senna acacia trees with foliage dark and glittering and light or red as blood 
grew side by side trunk by trunk with entangled branches from which shot yellow and purple flowers resembling candlesticks in some groups the tree-tops could not be seen as the climbing plants covered them from top to bottom and leaping from trunk to trunk formed the letters w and m and hung in form of festoons portieres and whole curtains cautuclianas just strangled the trees with thousands of serpentine tendrils and transformed them into pyramids buried with white flowers like snow about the greater lianas the smaller entwined and the medley became so thick that it formed a wall through which neither man nor animal could penetrate only in places where the elephants whose strength nothing can resist forced their way were there beaten down in the thicket deep and winding passageways as it were the song of birds which so pleasantly enlivens the european forest could not be heard at all instead on the tree-tops resounded the strangest calls similar to the sound of a saw to the beating of a drum to the clatter of a stalk to the squeaking of old doors to the clapping of hands to caterwauling or even to the loud excited talk of men from time to time soared above the trees flocks of parrots grey green white or a small bevy of gaudily plumaged toucans in a quiet wavy flight on the snowy background of the rubber climbing plants glimmered like sylvan sprites little monkey mourners entirely black with the exception of white tails a white girdle on the sides and white whiskers enveloping faces of the hue of coal the children gazed with admiration at this virgin forest which the eyes of a white man perhaps had never beheld saba every little while plunged into the thicket from which came his happy barks the quinine breakfast and sleep had revived little nell her face was animated and assumed bright colors her eyes sparkled every moment she asked stas the names of various trees and birds and he answered as well as he could finally she announced that she wanted to dismount from the horse and pluck a bunch of flowers but the boy smiled and said the siafu would eat you at once what is a siafu is it worse than a lion worse and not worse they are ants which bite terribly there are a great many of them on the branches from which they fall on people's backs like a rain of fire but they also walk on the ground dismount from the horse and try merely to walk a little in the forest and at once you will begin to jump and whine like a monkey it is easier to defend oneself against the lion at times they move in immense ranks and then everything gives way to them and would you be able to cope with them i of course with the help of fire or boiling water you always know how to take care of yourself she said with deep conviction these words flattered stas greatly so he replied conceitedly and at the same time merrily if you were only well then as to the rest depend upon me my head does not even ache now thank god thank god speaking thus they passed the forest but one flank of which reached the hollow way the sun was still high in the heaven and broiled intensely as the weather cleared and in the sky not a cloud could be seen the horses were covered with sweat and nell began to complain of the heat for this reason stas having selected a suitable place turned to the ravine in which the western wall cast a deep shadow it was cool there and the water remaining in the depressions after the downpour was also comparatively cool over the little traveller's heads continually flew from one brink of the ravine to the other toucans with purple heads blue breasts and yellow wings so the boy began to tell nell what he knew from books about their habits do you know he said there are certain toucans which during the breeding season seek hollows in trees there the female lays eggs and sits upon them while the male pastes the opening with clay so that only her head is visible and not until the young are hatched does the male begin to peck with his long beak and free the mother and what does she eat during that time the male feeds her he continually flies about and brings her all kinds of berries and does he permit her to sleep she asked in a sleepy voice stas smiled if mrs toucan has the same desire that you have at this moment 
then he permits her in fact in the cold ravine an unconquerable drowsiness oppressed the little girl as from morning until early in the afternoon she had rested but little stas had a sincere desire to follow her example but could not as he had to hold her fearing that she might fall besides it was immensely uncomfortable for him to sit man fashion on the flat and wide saddle which hatim and seki tamala had provided for the little one in fashoda he did not dare to move and rode the horse as slowly as possible in order not to awaken her she in the meantime leaning backwards supported her little head upon his shoulder and slept soundly but she breathed so regularly and calmly ceased to regret the last quinine powder he felt that danger of fever was removed and commenced to reason thus the ravine continually leads upwards and even now is quite steep we are higher and the country is drier and drier it is necessary only to find some sort of elevation well shaded near some swift stream and there establish quarters and give the little one a few weeks rest and perhaps wait through the whole masika the spring rainy season not every girl could endure even one-tenth of these hardships but it is necessary that she should rest after such a night another girl would have been stricken with fever and she how soundly she sleeps thank god and these thoughts brought him into a good humour so looking down at nell's little head resting on his bosom he said to himself merrily and at the same time with certain surprise it is odd however how fond i am of this little fly to tell the truth i always liked her but now more and more and not knowing how to explain such a strange symptom he came to the following conclusion it is because we have passed together through so much and because she is under my protection in the meantime he held that fly very carefully with his right hand around her waist in order that she should not slip from the saddle and bruise her little nose they advanced slowly in silence only kali hummed under his nose a song in praise of stars great master kills gaber kills a lion and a buffalo ya ya much meat much meat ya ya kali stars asked do the wahimas hunt lions the wahimas fear lions but the wahimas dig pits and if in the night time the lion falls in then the wahimas laugh what do you then do the wahimas hurl a lot of spears until lion is like a hedgehog then they pull him out of the pit and eat him lion is good and according to his habit he stroked his stomach stas did not like this method of hunting so he began to ask what other game there was in the wahima country and they conversed further about antelopes ostriches giraffes and rhinoceroses until the roar of a waterfall reached them what is that stas exclaimed are there a river and waterfall ahead of us kali nodded his head in sign that obviously such was the fact and for some time they rode more quickly listening to the roar which each moment became more and more distinct a waterfall repeated stas whose curiosity was aroused but they had barely passed one or two bends when their way was barred by an impassable obstruction nell whom the motion of the horse had lulled to sleep awoke at once are we already stopping for the night she asked no but look a rock closes the ravine then what shall we do it is impossible to slip beside it for it is too close there so it will be necessary that we turn back a little get on top and ride around the obstruction but it is yet two hours to night therefore we have plenty of time let us rest the horses a little do you hear the waterfall i do we will stop near it for the night after which he turned to kali ordered him to climb to the brink of the ridge and see whether beyond the ravine was not filled with similar obstructions he himself began to examine the rock carefully and after a while he exclaimed it broke off and tumbled down not long ago nell do you see that fragment look how fresh it is there is no moss on it nor vegetation i already understand i understand and with his hand he pointed at the baobab tree growing on the brink of the ravine whose huge roots hung over the wall and were parallel with the fragment 
that root grew in a crevice between the wall and the rock and growing stronger it finally split the rock that is a singular matter for stone is harder than wood i know however that in mountains this often happens after that anything can shake such a stone which barely keeps its place and the stone falls off but what could shake it it's hard to say maybe some former storm perhaps yesterday's at this moment saba who previously had remained behind the caravan came running up he suddenly stood still as if pulled from behind by the tail scented afterwards squeezed into the narrow passage between the wall and the detached rock but immediately began to retreat with bristling hair stas dismounted from the horse to see what could have scared the dog stas don't go there nell begged a lion might be there the boy who was something of a swashbuckler and who from the previous day had taken extraordinary offence at lions replied a great thing a lion in daylight however before he approached the passageway kali's voice resounded from above buana kubwa buana kubwa what is it stas asked the negro slid down the stalk of a climbing plant in the twinkling of an eye from his face it was easy to perceive that he brought some important news an elephant he shouted an elephant yes answered the young negro waving his hands there thundering water here a rock the elephant cannot get out great master kill the elephant and kali will eat him oh eat eat and at this thought he was possessed by such joy that he began to leap slapping his knees with his palms and laughing as if insane in addition rolling his eyes and displaying his white teeth stas at first did not understand why kali said that the elephant could not get out of the ravine so desiring to see what had happened he mounted his horse and entrusting nell to mia in order to have his hands free in an emergency he ordered kali to sit behind him after which they all turned back and began to seek a place by which they could reach the top on the way stas questioned him how the elephant got into such a place and from kali's replies he ascertained more or less what had happened the elephant evidently ran before the fire by way of the ravine during the burning of the jungle on the way he forcibly bumped against a loosened rock which tumbled down and cut off his retreat after that having reached the end of the hollow he found himself on the edge of a precipice below which a river ran and in this manner was imprisoned after a while they discovered an outlet but so steep that it was necessary to dismount from the horses and lead them after as the negro assured them that the river was very near they proceeded on foot they finally reached a promontory bounded on one side by a river on the other by the hollow and glancing downward they beheld on the bottom of a dell an elephant the huge beast was lying on its stomach and to stas's great surprise did not start up at the sight of them only when saba came running to the brink of the dell and began to bark furiously did he for a moment move his enormous ears and raise his trunk but he dropped it at once the children holding hands gazed long at him in silence which finally was broken by kali he is dying of hunger he exclaimed the elephant was really so emaciated that his spine protruded his sides were shrunken his ribs were distinctly outlined notwithstanding the thickness of his hide and it was easy to conjecture that he did not rise because he did not now have sufficient strength the ravine which was quite wide at its opening changed into a dell locked in on two sides by perpendicular rocks and on its bottom a few trees grew but these trees were broken their bark was peeled and on the branches there was not a leaf the climbing plants hanging from the rocks were torn to pieces and gnawed and the grass in the dell was cropped to the last blade stas examining the situation thoroughly began to share his observations with nell but being impressed with the inevitable death of the huge beast he spoke in a low tone as if he feared to disturb the last moments of its life yes he really is dying of starvation he certainly has been confined here at least two weeks that is from the time when the old jungle was burnt he ate everything that there was to eat and now is enduring torments particularly as here above 
breadfruit trees and acacias with great pods are growing and he sees them but cannot reach them and for a while they again gazed in silence the elephant from time to time turned towards them his small languid eyes and something of the nature of a gurgle escaped from his throat indeed the boy declared it is best to cut short his pangs saying this he raised the rifle to his face but nell clutched his jacket and braced upon both of her little feet began to pull him with all her strength away from the brink of the hollow stars don't do that stars let us give him something to eat he is so wretched i don't want you to kill him i don't want it i don't and stamping with her little feet she did not cease pulling and he looked at her with great astonishment and seeing her eyes filled with tears said but nell i don't want it i won't let him be killed i shall get the fever if you kill him for stas this threat was sufficient to make him forego his murderous design in regard to the elephant before them and in regard to anything else in the world for a time he was silent not knowing what reply to make to the little one after which he said very well very well i tell you it is all right nell let go of me and nell at once hugged him and through her tear-dimmed eyes a smile gleamed now she was concerned only about giving the elephant something to eat as quickly as possible kali and mia were greatly astonished when they learned that the buana kubwa not only would not kill the elephant but they were to pluck at once as many melons from the breadfruit trees as many acacia pods and as much of all kinds of weeds as they were able Geber's two -ed Sudanese sword was of great use to Kali at this labour, and were it not for that, the work would not have proceeded so easily. Nell, however, did not want to wait for its completion, and when the first melon fell from the tree, she seized it with both her hands, and, carrying it to the ravine, she repeated rapidly, as if from fear that someone else might want to supplant her, I, I, I! But Stas did not in the least think of depriving her of this pleasure, but from fear that through too much zeal she might fall over with the melon, he seized her by the belt and shouted, Throw! The huge fruit rolled over the steep declivity and fell close to the elephant's feet, while the latter, in the twinkling of an eye, stretched out his trunk and seized it. Afterwards he bent his trunk as if he wanted to place the melon under his throat, and this much the children saw of him he ate it exclaimed the happy girl i suppose so answered stas laughing and the elephant stretched out his trunk towards them as if he wanted to beg for more and emitted in a powerful tone Hrumph! he wants more i suppose so repeated stas a second melon followed in the track of the first and in the same manner afterwards disappeared in a moment a third fourth tenth later acacia pods and whole bundles of grass and great leaves began to fly down nell did not allow any one to take her place and when her little hands grew tired from the work she shoved new supplies with her little feet while the elephant ate and raising his trunk from time to time trumpeted his thunderous hrumph as a sign that he wanted to eat still more but nell claimed that it was a sign of gratitude but kali and mia finally were fatigued with the work which they performed with great alacrity under the impression that buana wanted first to fatten the elephant and afterwards to kill it at last however buana ordered them to stop as the sun was setting and it was time to start the construction of the zareba fortunately this was not a difficult matter for two sides of the triangular promontory were utterly inaccessible so that it was necessary only to fence in the third acacias with big thorns also were not lacking nell did not retire a step from the ravine and squatting upon its brink announced from a distance to stars what the elephant was doing at frequent intervals her thin little voice resounded he is searching about with his trunk or he is moving his ears what big ears he has stas stas he is getting up oh stas approached hurriedly and seized nell's hand the elephant actually rose and now the children could observe his immense size 
they had previously seen huge elephants which were carried on vessels through the suez canal bound from india to europe but not one of them could compare with this colossus who actually looked like a huge slate-coloured rock walking on four feet he differed from the others in the size of his tusks which reached five or more feet and as nell already observed his ears which were of fabulous proportions his forelegs were high but comparatively thin which was undoubtedly due to the fast of many days oh that is a lilliputian laughed stas if he should rear himself and stretch out his trunk he might catch you by the feet but the colossus did not think of rearing or catching any one by the feet with an unsteady gait he approached the egress of the ravine gazed for a while over the precipice at the bottom of which water was seething afterwards he turned to the wall close to the waterfall directed his trunk towards it and having immersed it as best he could began to drink it is his good fortune stas said that he can reach the water with his trunk otherwise he would have died the elephant drank so long that finally the little girl became alarmed stas won't he harm himself she asked i don't know he replied laughing but since you have taken him under your care warn him now so nell leaned over the edge and cried enough dear elephant enough and the dear elephant as if he understood what was the matter stopped drinking at once and instead began to splash water over himself first he splashed water on his feet then on his back and afterwards on both sides but in the meantime it grew dark so stas conducted the little girl to the zareba where supper already awaited them both were in excellent humor now because she had saved the elephant's life and stas because he saw her eyes sparkling like two stars and her gladdened face which was ruddier and healthier than it had been at any time since their departure from khartoum a promise of a quiet and perfect night also conduced to the boy's contentment the two inaccessible sides of the promontory absolutely secured them from attacks from those directions and on the third side kali and mia reared so high a wall of thorny branches of acacias and of passion flowers that there could be no thought of any predaceous beast being able to surmount such a barrier in addition the weather was fine and the heavens immediately after sunset were studded with countless stars the air which was cool owing to the proximity of the waterfall and which was saturated with the odour of the jungle and newly broken branches was agreeable to breathe this fly will not get the fever here stas thought joyfully afterwards they commenced to converse about the elephant as nell was incapable of talking of anything else and did not cease going into transports over his stature trunk and tusks which in reality were prodigious finally she asked honestly stas isn't he wise as solomon answered stas but what makes you think so because when i asked him not to drink any more he obeyed me at once if before that time he had not taken any lessons in english and nevertheless understands it that really is miraculous nell perceived that stas was making merry with her so she gave him a scolding after which she said say what you wish but i am sure that he is very intelligent and will become tame at once whether at once i don't know but he may be tamed the african elephants are indeed more savage than the asiatic nevertheless i think that hannibal for instance used african elephants and who was hannibal stas glanced at her indulgently and with pity really he said at your age you are not supposed to know such things hannibal was a great carthaginian commander who used elephants in his war with the romans and as carthage was in africa he must have used african further conversation was interrupted by the resounding roar of the elephant who having eaten and drunk his fill began to trumpet it could not be known whether from joy or from longing for complete freedom saba started up and began to bark while stas said there you have it now he is calling companions we will be in a nice predicament if he attracts a whole herd here he will tell them that we were kind to him nell responded hastily 
but Stas, who indeed was not alarmed, as he reckoned that even if a herd should rush towards them, the glare of the fire would frighten them away, smiled spitefully and said, "'Very well, very well, but if the elephants appear, you won't cry, oh no, your eyes will only perspire as they did twice before.' And he began to tease her. "'I do not cry, only my eyes perspire.' Nell, however, seeing his happy mien, conjectured that no immediate danger threatened them. "'When he gets tame,' she said, "'my eyes will not perspire, though ten lions should roar. "'Why? "'For he will defend us.' Stas quieted Saba, who would not stop replying to the elephant, after which he deliberated somewhat and spoke thus. "'You did not think of one thing, now. Of course, we will not stay here for ages, but will proceed further. I do not say at once. On the contrary, the place is good and healthy. I have decided to stop here, a week perhaps, perhaps two, for you and all of us are entitled to a rest. Well, very good. As long as we stay here, we will feed the elephant, though that will be a big task for us all. But he is locked up, and we cannot take him with us. Well, then, what later? We shall go, and he will remain here, and again will endure the pangs of hunger until he dies. Then we shall be the more sorry for him. Nell saddened very much, and for some time sat in silence, evidently not knowing what reply to make to these just remarks. But after a while she raised her head, and, brushing aside the tufts of hair which fell over her eyes, turned her gaze, full of confidence, on the boy. I know, she said, that if you want to, you will get him out of the ravine. I? And she stretched out her little finger, touched Stas's hand with it, and repeated, You. The sly little woman understood that her confidence would flatter the boy, and from that moment he would ponder on how to free the elephant. End of chapter 4